Chapter 61 How a Gardener May Get Rid of the Dormice That Eat His Peaches Not on the same night as he had intended, but the next morning the Count of Monte Cristo went out by the Barriere d'Enfer, taking the road to Orléans. Leaving the village of Lina, without stopping at the telegraph, which flourished its great bony arms as he passed, the Count reached the tower of Montlerey, situated, as everyone knows, upon the highest point of the plain of that name. At the foot of the hill, the Count dismounted and began to ascend by a little winding path, about eighteen inches wide. When he reached the summit, he found himself stopped by a hedge, upon which green fruit had succeeded to red and white flowers. Monte Cristo looked for the entrance to the enclosure, and was not long in finding a little wooden gate, working on willow hinges and fastened with a nail and string. The Count soon mastered the mechanism, the gate opened, and he then found himself in a little garden, about twenty feet long by twelve feet wide, bounded on one side by part of the hedge, which contained the ingenious contrivance we have called a gate, and on the other by the old tower, covered with ivy and studded with wallflowers. No one would have thought, in looking at this old, weather-beaten, floral-decked tower, which might be likened to an elderly dame dressed up to receive her grandchildren at a birthday feast, that it would have been capable of telling strange things, if, in addition to the menacing ears which the proverb says all walls are provided with, it had also a voice. The garden was crossed by a path of red gravel, edged by a border of thick box of many years' growth, and of a tone and colour that would have delighted the heart of Delacroix, our modern Rubens. This path was formed in the shape of the figure of eight, thus in its windings, making a walk of sixty feet in a garden of only twenty. Never had Flora, the fresh and smiling goddess of gardeners, been honoured with a purer or more scrupulous worship than that which was paid to her in this little enclosure. In fact, of the twenty rose-trees which formed the parterre, not one bore the mark of the slug, nor were there evidences anywhere of the clustering aphis which is so destructive to plants growing in a damp soil. And yet, it was not because the damp had been excluded from the garden. The earth, black as soot, the thick foliage of the trees betrayed its presence. Besides, had natural humidity been wanting, it could have been immediately supplied by artificial means thanks to a tank of water sunk in one of the corners of the garden, and upon which were stationed a frog and a toad, who from antipathy, no doubt, always remained on the two opposite sides of the basin. There was not a blade of grass to be seen in the paths or a weed in the flower-beds. No fine lady ever trained and watered her geraniums, her cacti, and her rhododendrons with more pains than the hitherto unseen gardener bestowed upon his little enclosure. Monte Cristo stopped after having closed the gate, and fastened a string to the nail, and cast a look around. "'The man at the telegraph,' said he, "'must either engage a gardener, or devote himself passionately to agriculture.' Suddenly he struck against something crouching behind a wheelbarrow filled with leaves. The something rose, uttering an exclamation of astonishment and Monte Cristo found himself facing a man about fifty years old, who was plucking strawberries which he was placing upon grape leaves. He had twelve leaves and about as many strawberries, which on rising suddenly he let fall from his hand. "'You are gathering your crop, sir,' said Monte Cristo, smiling. "'Excuse me, sir,' replied the man, raising his hand to his cap. "'I am not up there, I know, but I have only just come down.' "'Do not let me interfere with you in anything, my friend,' said the Count. "'Gather your strawberries, if indeed there are any left.' "'I have ten left,' said the man. "'For here are eleven, and I had twenty-one, five more than last year. "'But I am not surprised. The spring has been warm this year, "'and strawberries require heat, sir. "'This is the reason that instead of the sixteen I had last year, I have this year, you see, eleven, already plucked twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Ah, I miss three. 
They were here last night, sir. I'm sure they were here. I counted them. It must be the mere Sir Simon's son who has stolen them. I saw him strolling about here this morning. Ah, the young rascal, stealing in a garden. He does not know where that may lead him to. Certainly it is wrong, said Monte Cristo. But you should take into consideration the youth and greediness of the delinquent. Of course, said the gardener. But that does not make it the less unpleasant. But, sir, once more I beg pardon, because you are an officer that I am detaining here. And he glanced timidly at the Count's blue coat. Calm yourself, my friend, said the Count, with the smile which he made at will, either terrible or benevolent, and which now expressed only the kindliest feeling. I am not an inspector, but a traveller brought here by a curiosity he half repents of, since he causes you to lose your time. Ah, my time is not valuable, replied the man with a melancholy smile. Still it belongs to government, and I ought not to waste it. But having received the signal that I might rest for an hour, here he glanced at the sundial, for there was everything in the enclosure of Montlaret, even a sundial, and having ten minutes before me, and my strawberries being ripe, when a day longer, by the by, sir, do you think dormice eat them? Indeed, I think not, replied Monte Cristo. Dormice are bad neighbors for us who do not eat them preserved, as the Romans did. What? Did the Romans eat them? said the gardener. Eat dormice? I have read so in Petronius, said the Count. Really? They can't be nice, though they do say, as fat as a dormouse. It is not a wonder they are fat, sleeping all day and only waking to eat all night. Listen, last year I had four apricots. They stole one. I had one nectarine, only one. Well, sir, they ate half of it on the wall. A splendid nectarine and never ate a better. You ate it? That is to say, the earth that was left, you understand. It was exquisite, sir. Ah, those gentlemen never choose the worst mussels, like Mir Simon's son, who has not chosen the worst strawberries. But this year, continued the horticulturist, I'll take care of it. It shall not happen, even if I shall be forced to sit by the whole night to watch when the strawberries are ripe. Monte Cristo had seen enough. Every man has a devouring passion in his heart, as every fruit has its worm. That of the telegraph man was horticulture. He began gathering the grape leaves which screened the sun from the grapes, and won the heart of the gardener. "'Did you come here, sir, to see the telegraph?' he said. "'Yes, if it is not contrary to the rules.' "'Oh, no,' said the gardener. "'Not in the least, since there is no danger.' that any one can possibly understand what we are saying. I have been told, said the Count, that you do not always yourselves understand the signals you repeat. That is true, sir, and that is what I like best, said the man, smiling. Why do you like that best? Because then I have no responsibility. I am a machine here and nothing else. And so long as I work, nothing more is required of me. Is it possible, said Monte Cristo to himself, that I can have met with a man that has no ambition, that would spoil my plans? Sir, said the gardener, glancing at the sundial, the ten minutes are almost up. I must return to my post. Will you go up with me? I will follow you. Monte Cristo entered the tower, which was divided into three stories. The tower contained implements, such as spades, rakes, watering pots, hung against the wall. This was all the furniture. The second was the man's conventional abode, or rather, sleeping place. It contained a few poor articles of household furniture, a bed, a table, two chairs, a stone pitcher, and some dry herbs hung up to the ceiling which the Count recognized as sweet peas, 
and of which the good man was preserving the seeds. He had labelled them with as much care as if he had been master botanist in the Jardin des Plantes. "'Does it require much study to learn the art of telegraphing?' asked Monte Cristo. "'The study does not take long. It was acting as a supernumerary that was so tedious. And what is the pay?' "'A thousand francs, sir.' "'It is nothing.' "'No, but when we are lodged, as you perceive—' Monte Cristo looked at the room. They passed to the third story. It was the telegraph room. Monte Cristo looked in turn at the two iron handles by which the machine was worked. "'It is very interesting,' he said. "'But it must be very tedious for a lifetime.' "'Yes. At first my neck was cramped with looking at it. But at the end of a year—' I became used to it, and then we have our hours of recreation and our holidays. Holidays? Yes. When? When we have a fog. Ah, to be sure. Those are indeed holidays to me. I go into the garden, I plant, I prune, I trim, I kill the insects all day long. How long have you been here? Ten years and five as a supernumerary make fifteen. You are fifty-five years old. How long must you have served to claim the pension? Oh, sir, twenty-five years. And how much is the pension? A hundred crowns. Poor humanity, murmured Monte Cristo. What did you say, sir? asked the man. I was saying it was very interesting. What was? All you were showing me, and you really understand none of these signals. None at all. And have you never tried to understand them? Never. Why should I? But still there are some signals only addressed to you. Certainly. And do you understand them? They are always the same. And do they mean? Nothing new. You have an hour, or tomorrow. This is simple enough, said the Count. But look, is not your correspondent putting itself in motion? Ah, uh, yes, thank you, sir. And what is it saying? Anything you understand? Yes, it asks if I'm ready. And you reply? By the same sign, which at the same time tells my right-hand correspondent that I am ready, while it gives notice to my left-hand correspondent to prepare in his turn. It is very ingenious, said the Count. You will see, said the man proudly. In five minutes he will speak. I have then five minutes, said Monte Cristo to himself. It is more time than I require. My dear sir, will you allow me to ask you a question? What is it, sir? You are fond of gardening. Passionately. And you would be pleased to have, instead of this terrace of twenty feet, an enclosure of two acres. Sir, I should make a terrestrial paradise of it. You live badly on your thousand francs. Badly enough, but yet I do live. Yes, but you have a wretchedly small garden. True, the garden is not large. And then, such as it is, it is filled with dormice who eat everything. Ah, they are my scourges. Tell me, should you have the misfortune to turn your head while your right-hand correspondent was telegraphing? I should not see him. Then what would happen? I could not repeat the signals. And then? Not having repeated them through negligence, I should be fined. How much? A hundred francs. The tenth of your income? That would be fine work. Ah, said the man. Has it ever happened to you? said Monte Cristo. Once, sir, when I was grafting a rose tree... Well, suppose you were to alter a signal and substitute another. 
Ah, that is another case. I shall be turned off and lose my pension. Three hundred francs. A hundred crowns, yes, sir. So you see that I am not likely to do any of these things. Not even for fifteen years' wages. Come, it is worth thinking about. For fifteen thousand francs? Yes. Sir, you alarm me. Nonsense. Sir, you are tempting me? Just so. Fifteen thousand francs. Do you understand? Sir, let me see my right-hand correspondent. On the contrary, do not look at him, but at this. What is it? What, you do not know these bits of paper? Banknotes? Exactly. There are fifteen of them. And whose are they? Yours, if you like. Mine? exclaimed the man, half suffocated. Yes, yours, your own property. Sir, my right-hand correspondent is signalling. Let him signal. Sir, you have distracted me. I shall be fined. That will cost you a hundred francs. You see, it is your interest to take my banknotes. Sir, my right-hand correspondent redoubles his signals. He is impatient. Never mind. Take these. And the Count placed the packet in the man's hands. Now this is not all, he said. You cannot live upon your fifteen thousand francs. I shall still have my place. No, you will lose it, for you are going to alter your correspondent's message. Oh, sir, what are you proposing? A jest. Sir, unless you force me, I think I can effectually force you. And Monte Cristo drew another packet from his pocket. Here are ten thousand more francs, he said. With the fifteen thousand already in your pocket, they will make twenty-five thousand. With five thousand you can buy a pretty little house with two acres of land. The remaining twenty thousand will bring you in a thousand francs a year. A garden with two acres of land? And a thousand francs a year. Oh, heavens! Come, take them, said Monte Cristo, forcing the banknotes into his hand. What am I to do? Nothing very difficult. But what is it? To repeat these signs. Monte Cristo took a paper from his pocket, upon which were drawn three signs with numbers to indicate the order in which they were to be worked. There, you see, it will not take long. Yes, but uh, do this, and you will have nectarines and all the rest. The shot told. Red with fever, while the large drops fell from his brow, the man executed, one after the other, the three signs given by the Count. In spite of the frightful contortions of the right-hand correspondent, who, not understanding the change, began to think the gardener had gone mad, as to the left one, he conscientiously repeated the same signals which were finally transmitted to the Minister of the Interior. Now you are rich, said Monte Cristo. Yes, replied the man, but at what price? Listen, friend, said Monte Cristo, I do not wish to cause you any remorse. Believe me, then, when I swear to you that you have wronged no man, but on the contrary, have benefited mankind. The man looked at the banknotes, felt them, counted them, turned pale, then red, then rushed into his room to drink a glass of water, but he had no time to reach the water jug, and fainted in the midst of his dried herbs. Five minutes after the new telegram reached the minister, de Bray had the horses put to his carriage, and drove to the Donglars' house. "'Has your husband any Spanish bonds?' he asked of the baroness. "'I think so. Indeed. He has six million worth. "'He must sell them at whatever price. "'Why?' "'Because Don Carlos has fled from Bourges and has returned to Spain.' "'How do you know?' "'Debray shrugged his shoulders. 
The idea of asking how I hear the news, he said. The Baroness did not wait for a repetition. She ran to her husband, who immediately hastened to his agent, and ordered him to sell at any price. When it was seen that Donglars sold, the Spanish funds fell directly. Donglars lost 500,000 francs, but he rid himself of all his Spanish shares. The same evening, the following was read in Le Messager. By telegraph. The king, Don Carlos, has escaped the vigilance of his guardians at Bourges, and has returned to Spain by the Catalonian frontier. Barcelona has risen in his favour. All that evening, nothing was spoken of but the foresight of Donglars, who had sold his shares, and of the luck of the stock jobber, who had only lost 500,000 francs by such a blow. Those who had kept their shares, or bought those of Donglars, looked upon themselves as ruined, and passed a very bad night. Next morning, Le Moniteur contained the following. It was without any foundation that Le Messager yesterday announced the flight of Don Carlos and the revolt of Barcelona. The king, Don Carlos, has not left Bourges, and the peninsula is in the enjoyment of profound peace. A telegraphic signal, improperly interpreted, owing to the fog, was the cause of this error. The funds rose one per cent higher than before they had fallen. This, reckoning his loss and what he had missed gaining, made the difference of a million to Donglars. Good, said Monte Cristo to Morel, who was at his house when the news arrived of the strange reverse of fortune of which Donglars had been the victim. I have just made a discovery for twenty five thousand francs, for which I would have paid a hundred thousand. What have you discovered? asked Morel. I have just discovered how a gardener may get rid of the dormice that eat his peaches. End of chapter 61 Chapter 62 Ghosts At first sight, the exterior of the house at Auteuil gave no indications of splendour, nothing one would expect from the destined residence of the magnificent Count of Monte Cristo. But this simplicity was according to the will of its master, who positively ordered nothing to be altered outside. The splendour was within. Indeed, almost before the door opened, the scene changed. Monsieur Bertuccio had outdone himself in the taste displayed in furnishing, and in the rapidity with which it was executed. It is told that the Duc d'Antin removed in a single night a whole avenue of trees that annoyed Louis XIV. In three days, M. Bertuccio planted an entirely bare court with poplars, large spreading sycamores to shade the different parts of the house, and in the foreground, instead of the usual paving stones, half hidden by the grass, there extended a lawn, but that morning lay down and upon which the water was yet glistening. For the rest, the orders had been issued by the Count. He himself had given a plan to Bertuccio, marking the spot where each tree was to be planted, and the shape and extent of the lawn which was to take the place of the paving-stones. Thus the house had become unrecognizable, and Bertuccio himself declared that he scarcely knew it, encircled as it was by a framework of trees. The overseer would not have objected, while he was about it, to have made some improvements in the garden, but the Count had positively forbidden it to be touched. Bertuccio made amends, however, by loading the antechambers, staircases, and mantelpieces with flowers. What, above all, manifested the shrewdness of the steward, and the profound science of the master, the one in carrying out the ideas of the other, was that this house which appeared only the night before so sad and gloomy, impregnated with that sickly smell one can almost fancy to be the smell of time, had in a single day acquired the aspect of life was scented with its master's favourite perfumes, and had the very light regulated according to his wish. When the Count arrived, he had under his touch, his books and arms, his eyes rested upon his favourite pictures. His dogs, whose caresses he loved, welcomed him in the antechamber. The birds, whose songs delighted him, cheered him with their music and the house, awakened from its long sleep, like the sleeping beauty in the wood, lived, sang, and bloomed like the houses we have long cherished, 
and in which when we are forced to leave them we leave a part of our souls the servants passed gaily along the fine courtyard some belonging to the kitchens gliding down the stairs restored but the previous day as if they had always inhabited the house others filling the coach houses where the equipage encased and numbered appear to have been installed for the last fifty years and in the stables the horses replied with neighs to the grooms who spoke to them with much more respect than many servants pay their masters the library was divided into two parts on either side of the wall and contained upwards of two thousand volumes one division was entirely devoted to novels and even the volume which had been published but the day before was to be seen in its place in all the dignity of its red and gold binding on the other side of the house to match with the library was the conservatory ornamented with rare flowers that bloomed in china jars and in the midst of the greenhouse marvellous alike to sight and smell was a billiard table which looked as if it had been abandoned during the past hour by players who had left the balls on the cloth one chamber alone had been respected by the magnificent bertuccio before this room to which you could ascend by the grand and go out by the back staircase the servants passed with curiosity and bertuccio with terror at five o'clock precisely the count arrived before the house at Adeuil, followed by ali bertuccio was awaiting his arrival with impatience mingled with uneasiness he hoped for some compliments while at the same time he feared to have frowns monte cristo descended into the courtyard walked all over the house without giving any sign of approbation or pleasure until he entered his bedroom situated on the opposite side to the closed room then he approached a little piece of furniture made of rosewood which he had noticed at a previous visit that can only be to hold gloves he said will your excellency deign to open it said the delighted bertuccio and you will find gloves in it elsewhere the count found everything he required smelling bottles cigars knick-knacks good he said and monsieur bertuccio left enraptured so great so powerful and real was the influence exercised by this man over all who surrounded him at precisely six o'clock the clatter of horses hoofs was heard at the entrance door it was our captain of spahi who had arrived on medea i am sure i am the first cried morel i did it on purpose to have you a minute to myself before everyone came julie and emmanuel have a thousand things to tell you ah oh, really this is magnificent but tell me count will your people take care of my horse do not alarm yourself my dear maximilian they understand i mean because he wants petting if you had seen of what a pace he came like the wind i should think so a horse that cost five thousand francs said monte cristo in the tone which a father would use towards the son do you regret them asked morel with his open laugh i certainly not replied the count no i should only regret if the horse had not proved good it is so good that i have distanced monsieur de chateau renaud one of the best riders in france and monsieur de bray who both mount the minister's arabians and close on their heels are the horses of madame danglars who always go at six leagues an hour then they would follow you asked monte cristo see si, they are here and at the same minute a carriage with smoking horses accompanied by two mounted gentlemen arrived at the gate which opened before them the carriage drove round and stopped at the steps followed by the horsemen the instant de bray had touched the ground he was at the carriage door he offered his hand to the baroness who descending it took it with a peculiarity of manner imperceptible to every one but monte cristo but nothing escaped the count's notice and he observed a little note passed with the facility that indicates frequent practice from the hand of madame danglars 
to that of the minister's secretary after his wife the banker descended as pale as though he had issued from his tomb instead of his carriage madame danglars threw a rapid and inquiring glance which could only be interpreted by monte cristo around the courtyard over the peristyle and across the front of the house then repressing a slight emotion which must have been seen on her countenance if she had not kept her colour she ascended the steps saying to morel sir if you were a friend of mine i should ask if you would sell your horse morel smiled with an expression very like a grimace and then turned round to monte cristo as if to ask him to extricate him from this embarrassment the count understood him ah madame he said why did you not make that request of me with you sir replied the baroness one can wish for nothing one is so sure to obtain it if it were so with monsieur morel unfortunately replied the count i am a witness that monsieur morel cannot give up his horse his honour being engaged in keeping it how so he laid a wager he would tame medea in the space of six months you understand now that if he were to get rid of the animal before the time named he would not only lose his bet but people would say he was afraid and a brave captain of spahis cannot risk this even to gratify a pretty woman which is in my opinion one of the most sacred obligations in the world you see my position madame said morel bestowing a grateful smile on monte cristo it seems to me said danglars in his coarse tone ill concealed by a forced smile that you have already got horses enough madame danglars seldom allowed remarks of this kind to pass unnoticed but to the surprise of the young people she pretended not to hear it and said nothing monte cristo smiled at her unusual humility and showed her two immense porcelain jars over which wound marine plants of a size and delicacy that nature alone could produce the baroness was astonished why said she you could plant one of the chestnut trees in the tuileries inside how can such enormous jars have been manufactured ah madame replied monte cristo you must not ask of us the manufacturers of fine porcelain such a question it is the work of another age constructed by the genii of earth and water how so at what period can that have been i do not know i have only heard that an emperor of china had an oven built expressly and that in this oven twelve jars like this were successfully baked two broke from the heat of the fire the other ten were sunk three hundred fathoms deep into the sea the sea knowing what was required of her threw over her weeds encircled them with coral and encrusted them with shells the whole was cemented by two hundred years beneath these almost impervious depths for a revolution carried away the emperor who wished to make the trial and only left the documents proving the manufacture of the jars and their descent into the sea at the end of two hundred years the documents were found and they thought of bringing up the jars divers descended in machines made expressly on the discovery into the bay where they were thrown but of ten three only remained the rest having been broken by the waves i am fond of these jars upon which perhaps misshapen and frightful monsters have fixed their cold dull eyes and in which myriads of small fish have slept seeking a refuge from the pursuit of their enemies meanwhile danglars who had cared little for curiosities was mechanically tearing off the blossoms of a splendid orange tree one after another when he had finished with the orange tree he began at the cactus but this not being so easily plucked as the orange tree pricked him dreadfully he shuddered and rubbed his eyes as though awaking from a dream sir 
said monte cristo to him i do not recommend my pictures to you who possess such splendid paintings but nevertheless uh, here are two hobema a paul potter a miris two by gerard dow a raphael a van dyck a zuberan and two or three by morillo worth looking at stay said debray i recognize this hobema ah indeed yes it was proposed for the museum which i believe does not contain one said monte cristo no and yet they refuse to buy it why said chateau renaud you pretend not to know because government was not rich enough ah pardon me said chateau renaud i have heard of these things every day during the last eight years and i cannot understand them yet you will by and by said debray i think not replied chateau renaud major bartolomeo cavalcanti and count andrea cavalcanti announced baptistin a black satin stock fresh from the maker's hands gray moustaches a bold eye a major's uniform ornamented with three medals and five crosses in fact the thorough bearing of an old soldier such was the appearance of major bartolomeo cavalcanti that tender father with whom we are already acquainted close to him dressed in entirely new clothes advanced smilingly count andrea cavalcanti the dutiful son whom we also know the three young people were talking together on the entrance of the newcomers their eyes glanced from father to son and then naturally enough rested on the latter whom they began criticizing cavalcanti said debray a fine name said morel yes said chateau renaud these italians are well named and badly dressed you are fastidious chateau renaud replied debray those clothes are well cut and quite new that is just what i find fault with that gentleman appears to be well dressed for the first time in his life who are these gentlemen asked danglars of monte cristo you heard cavalcanti that tells me their name and nothing else ah true you do not know the italian nobility the cavalcanti are all descended from princes have they any fortune an enormous one what do they do try to spend it all they have some business with you i think from what they told me the day before yesterday i indeed invited them here to-day on your account i will introduce you to them but they appear to speak french with very pure accent said danglars the son has been educated in a college in the south i believe near marseilles you will find him quite enthusiastic upon what subject asked madame danglars the french ladies madame he has made up his mind to take a wife from paris a fine idea that of his said danglars shrugging his shoulders madame danglars looked at her husband with an expression which at any other time would have indicated a storm but for the second time she controlled herself the baron appears thoughtful to-day said monte cristo to her are they going to put him in the ministry not yet i think more likely he has been speculating on the bourse and has lost money monsieur and madame de villefort cried baptistin they entered monsieur de villefort notwithstanding his self-control was visibly affected and when monte cristo touched his hand he felt it tremble certainly women alone know how to dissimulate said monte cristo to himself glancing at madame danglars who was smiling on the procureur and embracing his wife after a short time the count saw bertuccio who until then had been occupied on the other side of the house glide into an adjoining room he went to him what do you want monsieur bertuccio 
said he your excellency has not stated the number of guests ah true how many covers count for yourself is everyone here your excellency yes bertuccio glanced through the door which was ajar the count watched him good heavens he exclaimed what is the matter said the count that woman that woman which the one with a white dress and so many diamonds the fair one madame d'anglar i do not know her name but it is she sir it is she whom do you mean the woman of the garden she that was enchante she who was walking while she waited for bertuccio stood at the open door with his eyes starting and his hair on end waiting for whom bertuccio without answering pointed to villefort with something of the gesture macbeth used to point out banquo oh oh he at length muttered do you see what who him him monsieur de villefort the king's attorney certainly i see him then i did not kill him really i think you are going mad good bertuccio said the count then he is not dead no you see plainly he is not dead instead of striking between the sixth and seventh left ribs as your countrymen do you must have struck higher or lower and life is very tenacious in these lawyers or rather there is no truth in anything you have told me it was a fright of the imagination a dream of your fancy you went to sleep full of thoughts of vengeance they weighed heavily upon your stomach you had the nightmare that's all come calm yourself and reckon them up monsieur and madame de villefort two monsieur and madame d'anglar four monsieur de chateau renaud monsieur de bray monsieur morel seven major bartolomeo cavalcanti eight eight repeated bertuccio stop you are in a shocking hurry to be off you forget one of my guests lean a little to the left stay look at monsieur andrea cavalcanti the young man in a black coat looking at murillo's madonna now he is turning this time bertuccio would have uttered an exclamation had not a look from monte cristo silenced him benedetto he muttered fatality half-past six o'clock has just struck monsieur bertuccio said the count severely i ordered dinner at that hour and i do not like to wait and he returned to his guests while bertuccio leaning against the wall succeeded in reaching the dining-room five minutes afterwards the doors of the drawing-room were thrown open and bertuccio appearing said with a violent effort the dinner awaits the count of monte cristo offered his arm to madame de villefort monsieur de villefort he said will you conduct the baroness d'anglar villefort complied and they passed on to the dining-room end of chapter sixty two chapter sixty three the dinner it was evident that one sentiment affected all the guests on entering the dining-room each one asked what strange influence had brought them to this house and yet astonished even uneasy though they were they still felt that they would not like to be absent the recent events the solitary and eccentric position of the count his enormous nay almost incredible fortune should have made men cautious and have altogether prevented ladies visiting a house where there was no one of their own sex to receive them and yet curiosity had been enough to lead them to overleap the bounds of prudence and decorum and all present even including cavalcanti and his son notwithstanding the stiffness of the one and the carelessness of the other were thoughtful on finding themselves assembled at the house of this incomprehensible man madame d'anglars 
had started when Villefort, on the Count's invitation, offered his arm, and Villefort felt that his glance was uneasy beneath his gold spectacles when he felt the arm of the Baroness press upon his own. None of this had escaped the Count, and even by this mere contact of individuals the scene had already acquired considerable interest for an observer. Monsieur de Villefort had on the right hand Madame d'Anglars, on his left Morel. The Count was seated between Madame de Villefort and d'Anglars. The other seats were filled by de Bray, who was placed between the two Cavalcanti, and by Chateau Renaud, seated between Madame de Villefort and Morel. The repast was magnificent. Monte Cristo had endeavoured completely to overturn the Parisian ideas and to feed the curiosity as much as the appetite of his guests. It was an oriental feast that he offered to them, but of such a kind as the Arabian fairies might be supposed to prepare. Every delicious fruit that the four quarters of the globe could provide was heaped in vases from China and jars from Japan. Rare birds retaining their most brilliant plumage, enormous fish spread upon massive silver dishes, together with every wine produced in the archipelago, Asia Minor, or the Cape, sparkling in bottles, whose grotesque shape seemed to give an additional flavour to the draught. All these, like one of the displays with which Apicius of old gratified his guests, passed in view before the eyes of the astonished Parisians, who understood that it was possible to expend a thousand louis upon a dinner for ten persons, but only on the condition of eating pearls like Cleopatra, or drinking refined gold like Lorenzo de' Medici. Monte Cristo noticed the general astonishment, and began laughing and joking about it. Gentlemen, he said, you will admit that when arrived at a certain degree of fortune, the superfluities of life are all that can be desired, and the ladies will allow that, after having risen to a certain eminence of position, the ideal alone can be more exalted. Now, to follow out this reasoning, what is the marvellous? That which we do not understand. What is it that we really desire? That which we cannot obtain. Now, to see things which I cannot understand, to procure impossibilities, these are the study of my life. I gratify my wishes by two means, my will and my money. I take as much interest in the pursuit of some whim as you do, Monsieur Donglar, in promoting a new railway line. You, Monsieur de Villefort, in condemning a culprit to death. You, Monsieur de Bray, in pacifying a kingdom. You, Monsieur de Chateaurenaud, in pleasing a woman. And you, Morel, in breaking a horse that no one can ride. For example, you see these two fish, one brought from fifty leagues beyond St. Petersburg, the other five leagues from Naples. Is it not amusing to see them both on the same table? What are the two fish? asked Donglar. Monsieur Chateau Renaud, who has lived in Russia, will tell you the name of one, and Major Cavalcanti, who is in Italian, will tell you the name of the other. This one is, I think, a sterlet, said Chateau Renaud. And that one, if I mistake not, a lamprey. Just so. Now, Monsieur Donglar, ask these gentlemen where they are caught. Sterlet, said Chateau Renaud, are only found in the Volga. And, said Cavalcanti, I know that Lake Fusaro alone supplies lampreys of that size. Exactly. One comes from the Volga, and the other from Lake Fusaro. Impossible, cried all the guests simultaneously. Well, this is just what amuses me, said Monte Cristo. I am like Nero, Cupidor, Impossibilium, and that is what is amusing you at this moment. This fish, which seems so exquisite to you, is very likely no better than perch or salmon, but it seemed impossible to procure it, and here it is. 
But how could you have these fish brought to France? Oh, nothing more easy. Each fish was brought over in a cask, one filled with river, herbs and weeds, the other with rushes and lake plants. They were placed in a wagon built on purpose, and thus the sterlet lived twelve days, the lamprey ate, and both were alive when my cook seized them, killing one with milk and the other with wine. You do not believe me, Monsieur Donglar. I cannot help doubting, answered Donglar with his stupid smile. Baptistine, said the Count, have the other fish brought in, the sterlet and the lamprey which came in the other casks, and which are yet alive. Donglar opened his bewildered eyes. The company clapped their hands. Four servants carried in two casks covered with aquatic plants, and in each of which was breathing a fish similar to those on the table. But why have two of each sort? asked Donglar. Merely because one might have died, carelessly answered Monte Cristo. You are certainly an extraordinary man, said Donglar. And philosophers may well say it is a fine thing to be rich. And to have ideas, added Madame Donglar. Oh, do not give me credit for this, madame. It was done by the Romans, who much esteemed them, and Pliny relates that they sent slaves from Ostia to Rome, who carried on their heads fish which he calls the mules, and which from description must probably be the goldfish. It was also considered a luxury to have them alive, it being an amusing sight to see them die, for when dying they change colour three or four times, and like the rainbow when it disappears, pass through all the prismatic shades, after which they were sent to the kitchen. Their agony formed part of their merit. If they were not seen alive, they were despised when dead. Yes, said Debray, but then Ostia is only a few leagues from Rome. True, said Monte Cristo. But what would be the use of living eighteen hundred years after Lucullus, if we can do no better than he could? The two Cavalcanti opened their enormous eyes, but had the good sense not to say anything. All this is very extraordinary, said Chateau Renaud. Still, what I admire the most, I confess, is the marvellous promptitude with which your orders are executed. Is it not true that you only brought this house five or six days ago? Certainly not longer. Well, I am sure it is quite transformed since last week. If I remember rightly, it had another entrance, and the courtyard was paved and empty. While today we have a splendid lawn, bordered by trees which appear to be a hundred years old. Why not? I am fond of grass and shade said Monte Cristo. Yes, said Madame de Villefort. The door was toward the road before, and on the day of my miraculous escape, you brought me into the house from the road. I remember. Yes, Madame, said Monte Cristo, but I preferred having an entrance which would allow me to see the Bois de Boulogne over my gate. In four days, said Morel, it is extraordinary. Indeed, said Chateau Renaud, it seems quite miraculous to make a new house out of an old one, for it was very old and dull too. I recollect coming from my mother to look at it when Monsieur de saint Meron advertised it for sale two or three years ago. Monsieur de saint Meron, said Madame de Villefort, then this house belonged to Monsieur de saint Meron before you bought it? It appears so, replied Monte Cristo. Is it possible that you do not know of whom you purchased it? Quite so. My steward transacts all this business for me. It is certainly ten years since the house had been occupied, said Chateau Renaud, and it was quite melancholy to look at it, with the blinds closed, 
the doors locked and the weeds in the court. Really, if the house had not belonged to the father-in-law of the procureur, one might have thought it some accursed place where a horrible crime had been committed. Villefort, who had hitherto not tasted the three of four glasses of rare wine which were placed before him, here took one and drank it off. Monte Cristo allowed a short time to elapse, and then said, "'It is singular, Baron, but the same idea came across me the first time I came here. It looked so gloomy I should never have bought it if my steward had not taken the matter into his own hands. Perhaps the fellow had been bribed by the notary.' "'It is probable,' stammered out Villefort, trying to smile. "'But I can assure you that I had nothing to do with any such proceeding. This house is part of Valentine's marriage portion, and Monsieur de saint Maron wished to sell it, for if it had remained another year or two uninhabited, it would have fallen to ruin.' It was Morel's turn to become pale. "'There was, above all, one room,' continued Monte Cristo, "'very plain in appearance, hung with red damask, which, I know not why, appeared to me quite dramatic.' "'Why so?' said Danglars. "'Why dramatique?' "'Can we account for instinct?' said Monte Cristo. "'Are there not some places where we seem to breathe sadness?' why we cannot tell it is a chain of recollections an idea which carries you back to other times to other places which very likely have no connection with the present time and place and there is something in this room which reminds me forcibly of the chamber of the marquise de ganges or desdemona stay since we have finished dinner i will show it to you and then we will take coffee in the garden after dinner the play monte cristo looked inquiringly at his guests madame de villefort rose monte cristo did the same and the rest followed their example villefort and madame danglars remained for a moment as if rooted to their seats they questioned each other with vague and stupid glances did you hear said madame danglars we must go replied villefort offering his arm the others attracted by curiosity were already scattered in different parts of the house for they thought the visit would not be limited to the one room and that at the same time they would obtain a view of the rest of the building of which monte cristo had created a palace each one went out by the open doors monte cristo waited for the two who remained then when they had passed he brought up the rear and on his face was a smile, which, if they could have understood it, would have alarmed them much more than a visit to the room they were about to enter. They began by walking through the apartments, many of which were fitted up in the eastern style, with cushions and divans instead of beds, and pipes instead of furniture. The drawing-rooms were decorated with the rarest pictures by the old masters, the boudoir hung with the draperies from china of fanciful colours fantastic design and wonderful texture at length they arrived at the famous room there was nothing particular about it excepting that although daylight had disappeared it was not lighted and everything in it was old-fashioned while the rest of the rooms had been redecorated these two causes were enough to give it a gloomy aspect Oh, cried Madame de Villefort, it is really frightful. Madame Danglars tried to utter a few words, but was not heard. Many observations were made, the import of which was a unanimous opinion that there was something sinister about the room. Is it not so? asked Monte Cristo. Look at that large, clumsy bed, hung with such gloomy, blood-coloured drapery, and those two crayon portraits that have faded from the dampness do not they not seem to say with their pale lips and staring eyes we have seen villefort became livid madame danglars fell into a long seat placed near the chimney oh 
said Madame de Villefort, smiling. Are you courageous enough to sit down upon the very seat, perhaps, upon which the crime was committed? Madame Danglars rose suddenly. And then, said Monte Cristo, this is not all. What is there more? said de Bray, who had not failed to notice the agitation of Madame Danglars. Or oh, what else is there? said Danglars. For at present I cannot say that I have seen anything extraordinary. What do you say, Monsieur Cavalcanti? Ah, said he, we have at Pisa Ugiolino's tower, at Ferrara Tasso's prison, at Rimini the room of Francesca and Paolo. Yes, but you have not this little staircase, said Monte Cristo, opening a door concealed by the drapery. Look at it, and tell me what you think of it. What a wicked-looking crooked staircase, said Chateau Renaud with a smile. I do not know whether the wine of Chios produces melancholy, but certainly everything appears to me black in this house, said de Bray. Ever since Valentine's dowry had been mentioned, Morel had been silent and sad. Can you imagine, said Monte Cristo, some Othello or Abbe de Gange, one stormy dark night, descending these stairs step by step, carrying a load which he wishes to hide from the sight of man, if not from God? Madame Danglars half fainted on the arm of Villefort, who was obliged to support himself against the wall. Ah, madame, cried Debray, what is the matter with you? How pale you look! It is very evident what is the matter with her, said Madame de Villefort. Monsieur de Monte Cristo is relating horrible stories to us, doubtless intending to frighten us to death. Yes, said Villefort. Really, Count, you frighten the ladies. What is the matter? asked de Bray in a whisper of Madame Danglars. Nothing, she replied with a violent effort. I, I want air. That is all. Will you come into the garden? said de Bray, advancing towards the back staircase. No, no, she answered. I would rather remain here. Are you really frightened, madame? said Monte Cristo. Oh, no, sir, said Madame Danglars. But you suppose scenes in a manner which gives them the appearance of reality. Ah, yes, said Monte Cristo, smiling. It is all a matter of imagination. Why should we not imagine this the apartment of an honest mother? And this bed with red hangings, a bed visited by the goddess Lucina, and that mysterious staircase the passage through which not to disturb their sleep the doctor and nurse pass or even the father carrying the sleeping child here madame danglars instead of being calmed by the soft picture uttered a groan and fainted madame danglars is ill said villefort it would be better to take her to her carriage oh mon dieu said monte cristo and I have forgotten my smelling bottle. I have mine, said Madame de Villefort, and she passed over to Monte Cristo a bottle full of the same kind of red liquid whose good properties the Count had tested on Edward. Ah, said Monte Cristo, taking it from her hand. Yes, she said, at your advice I have made the trial. And have you succeeded? I think so. Madame Danglars was carried into the adjoining room. Monte Cristo dropped a very small portion of the red liquid upon her lips. She returned to consciousness. Ah! she cried. What a frightful dream! Villefort pressed her hand to let her know it was not a dream. They looked for Monsieur Danglars, but as he was not especially interested in poetical ideas, he had gone into the garden and was talking with Major Cavalcanti on the projected railway from Leghorn to Florence. Monte Cristo seemed in despair. He took the arm of Madame Danglars and conducted her into the garden, where they found Danglars taking coffee between the Cavalcanti. Really, madame, he said, 
Did I alarm you much? Oh, no, sir, she answered. But, you know, things impress us differently according to the mood of our minds. Villefort forced a laugh. And then you know, he said, an idea, a supposition, is sufficient. Well, said Monte Cristo, you may believe me if you like, but it is my opinion that a crime has been committed in this house. Take care, said Madame de Villefort. The king's attorney is here. Ah, replied Monte Cristo, since that is the case, I will take advantage of his presence to make my declaration. Your declaration? said Villefort. Yes, before witnesses. Oh, this is very interesting, said Debray. If there really has been a crime, we will investigate it. There has been a crime, said Monte Cristo. Come this way, gentlemen. Come, Monsieur Villefort, for a declaration to be available should be made before the competent authorities. He then took Villefort's arm, and at the same time holding that of Madame Danglars under his own, he dragged the procureur to the plantain tree where the shade was thickest. All the other guests followed. Stay, said Monte Cristo, here in this very spot, and he stamped upon the ground. I had the earth dug up and fresh mould put in to refresh these old trees. Well, my man digging found a box, or rather the ironwork of a box, in the midst of which was the skeleton of a newly-born infant. Monte Cristo felt the arm of Madame Danglars stiffen, while that of Villefort trembled. A newly-born infant? repeated Debray. This affair becomes serious. Well, said Chateau Renaud, I was not wrong just now, then, when I said that houses had souls and faces like men, and that their exteriors carried the impress of their characters. This house was gloomy because it was remorseful. It was remorseful because it concealed a crime. Who said it was a crime? asked Villefort with a last effort. How? Is it not a crime to bury a living child in a garden? cried Monte Cristo. And pray, what do you call such an action? But who said it was buried alive? Why bury it there if it were dead? This garden has never been a cemetery. What is done to infanticides in this country? asked Major Cavalcanti innocently. Oh, their heads are soon cut off, said Danglars. Ah, indeed, said Cavalcanti. I think so. Am I not right, Monsieur de Villefort? asked Monte Cristo. Yes, Count, replied Villefort, in a voice now scarcely human. Monte Cristo, seeing that the two persons for whom he had prepared this scene could scarcely endure it, and not wishing to carry it too far, said, Come, gentlemen, some coffee. We seem to have forgotten it. And he conducted the guests back to the table on the lawn. Indeed, Count, said Madame Danglars, I am ashamed to own it, but all your frightful stories have so upset me that I must beg you to let me sit down. And she fell into a chair. Monte Cristo bowed and went to Madame de Villefort. I think Madame Danglars again requires your bottle, he said. But before Madame de Villefort could reach her friend, the procureur had found time to whisper to Madame Danglars, I must speak to you. When? Tomorrow. Where? In my office, or in the court, if you like. That is the surest place. I will be there. At this moment, Madame de Villefort approached. Thanks, my dear friend, said Madame Danglars, trying to smile. It is over now, and I am much better. End of chapter 63 Chapter 64 The Beggar The evening passed on. Madame de Villefort expressed a desire to return to Paris, which Madame Danglars had not dared to do, 
notwithstanding the uneasiness she experienced. On his wife's request, Monsieur de Villefort was the first to give the signal of departure. He offered a seat in his landau to Madame Donglard that she might be under the care of his wife. As for Monsieur Donglard, absorbed in an interesting conversation with Monsieur Cavalcanti, he paid no attention to anything that was passing. While Monte Cristo had begged the smelling bottle of Madame de Villefort, he had noticed the approach of Villefort to Madame Danglars, and he soon guessed all that had passed between them, though the words had been uttered in so low a voice as hardly to be heard by Madame Danglars. Without opposing their arrangements, he allowed Morel, Chateau Renaud, and Debray to leave on horseback, and the ladies in Monsieur de Villefort's carriage. Danglars, more and more delighted with Major Cavalcanti, had offered him a seat in his carriage. Andrea Cavalcanti found his tilbury waiting at the door. The groom, in every respect a caricature of the English fashion, was standing on tiptoe to hold a large iron-grey horse. Andrea had spoken very little during the dinner. He was an intelligent lad, and he feared to utter some absurdity before so many grand people, amongst whom, with dilating eyes, he saw the king's attorney. Then he had been seized upon by Danglars, who, with a rapid glance at the stiff-necked old major and his modest son, and taking into consideration the hospitality of the count, made up his mind that he was in the society of some nabob come to Paris to finish the worldly education of his heir. He contemplated with unspeakable delight the large diamond which shone on the major's little finger. For the major, like a prudent man, in case of any accident happening to his banknotes, had immediately converted them into an available asset. Then, after dinner, on the pretext of business, he questioned the father and son upon their mode of living, and the father and son previously informed that it was through Donglar, the one was to receive his 48,000 francs, and the other 50,000 livres annually, were so full of affability that they would have shaken hands even with the banker's servants. So much did their gratitude need an object to expend itself upon. One thing, above all the rest, heightened the respect, nay, almost the veneration of Danglars for Cavalcanti. The latter, faithful to the principle of Horace, nil admirari, had contented himself with showing his knowledge by declaring in what lake the best lampreys were caught. Then he had eaten some without saying a word more. Danglars, therefore, concluded that such luxuries were common at the table of the illustrious descendant of the Cavalcanti, who most likely in Lucca fed upon trout brought from Switzerland, and lobsters sent from England by the same means used by the Count to bring the lampreys from Lake Fusaro and the sterlet from the Volga. Thus it was with much politeness of manner that he heard Cavalcanti pronounce these words, "'Tomorrow, sir,' I shall have the honour of waiting upon you on business. And I, sir, said Danglars, shall be most happy to receive you. Upon which he offered to take Cavalcanti in his carriage to the Hôtel des Princes, if it would not be depriving him of the company of his son. To this Cavalcanti replied by saying that for some time past his son had lived independently of him, that he had his own horses and carriages, and that not having come together, it would not be difficult for them to leave separately. The Major seated himself, therefore, by the side of Danglars, who was more and more charmed with the ideas of order and economy which ruled this man, and yet who, being able to allow his son sixty thousand francs a year, might be supposed to possess a fortune of five hundred thousand or six hundred thousand livres. As for Andrea, he began by way of showing off to scold his groom, who, instead of bringing the tilbury to the steps of the house, had taken it to the outer door, thus giving him the trouble of walking thirty steps to reach it. The groom heard him with humility, took the bit of the impatient animal with his left hand, and with the right held out the reins to Andrea, who, taking them from him, rested his polished boot lightly on the step. At that moment, a hand touched his shoulder. The young man turned round, thinking that Danglars or Monte Cristo 
had forgotten something they wished to tell him, and had returned just as they were starting. But instead of either of these, he saw nothing but a strange face, sunburnt and encircled by a beard, with eyes brilliant as carbuncles, and a smile upon the mouth which displayed a perfect set of white teeth, pointed and sharp as the wolf's or jackal's. A red handkerchief encircled his grey head, torn and filthy garments covered his large bony limbs, which seemed as though, like those of a skeleton, they would rattle as he walked. And the hand with which he leaned upon the young man's shoulder, and which was the first thing Andrea saw, seemed of gigantic size. Did the young man recognise that face by the light of the lantern in his tilbury? Or was he merely struck with the horrible appearance of his interrogator? We cannot say, but only relate the fact that he shuddered and stepped back suddenly. What do you want of me? he asked. Pardon me, my friend, if I disturb you, said the man with the red handkerchief. But I want to speak to you. You have no right to beg at night, said the groom, endeavouring to rid his master of the troublesome intruder. I am not begging, my fine fellow, said the unknown to the servant, with so ironical an expression of the eye, and so frightful a smile that he withdrew. I only wish to say two or three words to your master, who gave me a commission to execute about a fortnight ago. Come, said Andrea, with sufficient nerve for his servant not to perceive his agitation. What do you want? Speak quickly, friend. The man said in a low voice, I wish... I wish you to spare me the walk back to Paris. I am very tired, and as I have not eaten so good a dinner as you, I can scarcely stand. The young man shuddered at this strange familiarity. Tell me, he said, tell me what you want. Well then, I want you to take me up in your fine carriage and carry me back. Andrea turned pale but said nothing. Yes said the man, thrusting his hands into his pockets, and looking impudently at the youth. I have taken the whim into my head. Do you understand, Master Benedetto? At this name, no doubt, the young man reflected a little, for he went towards his groom, saying, This man is right. I did indeed charge him with a commission, the result of which he must tell me. Walk to the barrier there, take a cab, that you may not be too late. The surprised groom retired. "'Let me at least reach a shady spot,' said Andrea. "'Oh, as for that, I'll take you to a splendid place,' said the man with the handkerchief, and taking the horse's bit, he led the tilbury where it was certainly impossible for anyone to witness the honour that Andrea conferred upon him. "'Don't think I want the glory of riding in your fine carriage,' said he. Oh, no, it's only because I am tired, and also because I have a little business to talk over with you. Come, step in, said the young man. It was a pity this scene had not occurred in daylight, for it was curious to see this rascal throwing himself heavily down on the cushion beside the young and elegant driver of the Tilbury. Andrea drove past the last house in the village without saying a word to his companion, who smiled complacently as though well pleased to find himself travelling in so comfortable a vehicle. Once out of Auteuil, Andrea looked around in order to assure himself that he could neither be seen nor heard, and then, stopping the horse and crossing his arms before the man, he asked, Now, tell me why you come to disturb my tranquillity. Let me ask you why you deceived me. How have I deceived you? How, do you ask, when we parted at the Pont du Var, you told me you were going to travel through Piedmont and Tuscany, but instead of that, you come to Paris. How does that annoy you? It does not. On the contrary, I think it will answer my purpose. So, said Andrea, you are speculating upon me? What fine words he uses! I warn you, Master Caderousse, that you are mistaken. 
Well, well, don't be angry, my boy. You know well enough what it is to be unfortunate, and misfortunes make us jealous. I thought you were earning a living in Tuscany or Piedmont by acting as Facino or Cicerone, and I pitied you sincerely as I would a child of my own. You know I always did call you my child. Come, come, what then? Patience, patience. I am patient, but go on. All at once, I see you pass through the barrier with a groom, a tilbury, and fine new clothes. You must have discovered a mine, or else become a stockbroker. So that, as you confess, you are jealous. No, I am pleased. So pleased that I wished to congratulate you. But as I am not quite properly dressed, I chose my opportunity that I might not compromise you. Yes, and a fine opportunity you have chosen, exclaimed Andrea. You speak to me before my servant. How can I help that, my boy? I speak to you when I can catch you. You have a quick horse, a light tilbury. You are naturally as slippery as an eel. If I had missed you tonight, I might not have had another chance. You see, I do not conceal myself. You are lucky. I wish I could say as much, for I do conceal myself. And then I was afraid you would not recognize me, but you did, added Caderousse with his unpleasant smile. It was very polite of you. Come, said Andrea, what do you want? You do not speak affectionately to me, Benedetto, my old friend. That is not right. Take care, or I may become troublesome. This menace smothered the young man's passion. He urged the horse again into a trot. You should not speak so to an old friend like me, Caderousse. As you said just now, you are a native of Marseille. I am... Do you know, then? now what you are no but i was brought up in corsica you are old and obstinate i am young and wilful between people like us threats are out of place everything should be amicably arranged is it my fault if fortune which has frowned on you has been kind to me fortune has been kind to you then your tilbury your groom your clothes are not then hired Good. So much the better, said Caderousse, his eyes sparkling with avarice. Oh, you well know that well enough before speaking to me, said Andrea, becoming more and more excited. If I had been wearing a handkerchief like yours on my head, rags on my back and worn-out shoes on my feet, you would not have known me. You wrong me, my boy. Now I have found you. Nothing prevents my being as well dressed as any one, knowing as I do the goodness of your heart. If you have two coats, you will give me one of them. I used to divide my soup and beans with you when you were hungry. True, said Andrea. What an appetite you used to have. Is it as good now? Oh, yes, replied Andrea, laughing. How did you come to be dining with that prince whose house you have just left? He is not a prince, simply a count. A count, and a rich one too, eh? Yes, but you had better not have anything to say to him, for he is not a very good-tempered gentleman. Oh, be easy. I have no design upon your count, and you shall have him all to yourself, but said Caderousse, again smiling, with a disagreeable expression he had before assumed. You must pay for it, you understand? Well, what do you want? I think that with uh, a hundred francs a month. Well, I could live. Upon a hundred francs? Come, you understand me, but that with... With? With a hundred and fifty francs, I could be quite happy. Here are two hundred, said Andrea, and he placed ten gold louis in the hand of Caderousse. 
Good, said Caderousse. Apply to the steward on the first day of every month, and you will receive the same sum. There, now, again you degrade me. How so? By making me apply to your servants, when I want to transact business with you alone. Well, be it so, then. Take it from me, then. And so long, at least, as I receive my income, you shall be paid yours. Come, come. I always said you were a fine fellow, and it is a blessing when good fortune happens to such as you. But tell me all about it. Why do you wish to know? asked Cavalcanti. What? Do you again defy me? No, the fact is I have found my father. What? A real father? Yes, so long as he pays me. You'll honor and believe him? That's right. What is his name? Major Cavalcanti. Is he pleased with you? So far I have appeared to answer his purpose. And who found his father for you? The Count of Monte Cristo. The man whose house you have just left? Yes. I wish you would try and find me a situation with him as grandfather, since he holds the money chest. Well, I will mention you to him. Meanwhile, what are you going to do? I? Yes, you. It is very kind of you to trouble yourself about me. Since you interest yourself in my affairs, I think it is now my turn to ask you some questions. Ah, true. Well, I shall rent a room in some respectable house, wear a decent coat, shave every day, and go and read the papers in a café. Then in the evening I shall go to the theatre. I shall look like uh, some retired baker. That is what I want. Come, if you will only put the scheme into execution, and be steady, nothing could be better. And do you think so, Monsieur Boussouet? And you, what will you become? A peer of France? Ah, said Andrea, who knows? Major Cavalcanti is already one, perhaps, but then hereditary rank is abolished. No politics, Caderousse. And now that you have all you want, and that we understand each other, jump down from the Tilbury and disappear. Not at all, my good friend. How? Not at all? Why, just think for a moment. With this red handkerchief on my head, with scarcely any shoes, no papers, and ten gold Napoleons in my pocket, without reckoning what was there before, making in all about two hundred francs, why, I should certainly be arrested at the barrier. Then, to justify myself, I should say that you gave me the money. This would cause inquiries. It would be found out that I left too long without giving due notice, and I should then be escorted back to the shores of the Mediterranean. Then I should become simply numero 106, and goodbye to my dream of resembling the retired baker. No, no, my boy. I prefer remaining honorably in the capital. Andrea scowled. Certainly, as he had himself owned, the reputed son of Major Cavalcanti was a willful fellow. He drew up for a minute, threw a rapid glance around him, and then his hand fell instantly into his pocket, where it began playing with a pistol. But, meanwhile, Caderousse, who had never taken his eyes off his companion, passed his hand behind his back and opened a long Spanish knife, which he always carried with him, to be ready in case of need. The two friends, as we see, were worthy of and understood each other. Andrea's hand left his pocket inoffensively and was carried up to the red moustache, which it played with for some time. "'Good Calarus, he said. "'How happy you will be!' "'I will do my best.' said the innkeeper of the Pont du Gard, shutting up his knife. Well, then, we will go into Paris. But how will you pass through the barrier without exciting suspicion? It seems to me that you are in more danger riding than on foot. Wait, said Caderousse. We shall see. 
He then took the great coat with the large collar which the groom had left behind in the tilbury and put it on his back. Then he took off Calvacanti's hat, which he placed upon his own head, and finally he assumed the careless attitude of a servant whose master drives himself. But tell me, said Andrea, am I to remain bareheaded? Poor, said Calarus, it is so windy that your hat can easily appear to have blown off. Come, come, enough of this, said Cavalcanti. What are you waiting for? said Caderousse. I hope I am not the cause. Hush, said Andrea. They passed the barrier without accident. At the first cross street, Andrea stopped his horse, and Caderousse leapt out. Well, said Andrea, my servant's coat and my hat. Ah, uh, said Caderousse, you would not like me to risk taking cold. But what am I to do? You? Oh, you are young. Well, I am beginning to get old. Au revoir, Benedetto. And running into a court, he disappeared. Alas, said Andrea, sighing, one cannot be completely happy in this world. End of chapter 64 Chapter 65 A Conjugal Scene At the Place Louis XV, the three young people separated. That is to say, Morel went to the boulevard, Chateau Renaud to the Pont de la Révolution, and Debray to the Quai. Most probably Morel and Chateau Renaud returned to their domestic hearths, as they say in the gallery of the chamber, in well-turned speeches, and in the theatre of the Rue Richelieu, in well-written pieces. But it was not the case with Debray. When he reached the wicket of the Louvre, he turned to the left, galloped across the carousel, passed through the Rue Saint-Roche, and, issuing from the Rue de la Michaudière, he arrived at Monsieur Danglars's door, just at the same time that Villefort's Landau, after having deposited him and his wife at the Faubourg Saint-Honoré, stopped to leave the Baroness at her own house. Debray, with the air of a man familiar with the house, entered first into the court, threw his bridle into the hands of a footman, and returned to the door to receive Madame Danglars, to whom he offered his arm to conduct her to her apartments. The gate once closed, and Debray and the Baroness alone in the court, he asked, What was the matter with you, Hermine? And why were you so affected at that story, or rather fable, which the Count related? Because I have been in such shocking spirits all the evening, my friend, said the Baroness. No, Hermine, replied Debray, you cannot make me believe that. On the contrary, you were in excellent spirits when you arrived at the Count's. Monsieur Danglars was disagreeable, certainly. But I know how much you care for this ill humour. Someone has vexed you. I will allow no one to annoy you. You are deceived, Lucien, I assure you, replied Madame Danglars. And what I have told you is really the case, added to the ill humour you remarked, but which I did not think it worth while to allude to. It was evident that Madame Danglars was suffering from that nervous irritability which women frequently cannot account for, even to themselves, or that, as Debray had guessed, she had experienced some secret agitation that she would not acknowledge to any one. Being a man who knew that the former of these symptoms was one of the inherent penalties of womanhood, he did not then press his inquiries, but waited for a more appropriate opportunity, when he should again interrogate her or receive an avowal proprio motu. At the door of her apartment, the Baroness met Mademoiselle Cornelie, her confidential maid. "'What is my daughter doing?' asked Madame Danglars. "'She practised all the evening, and then went to bed,' replied Mademoiselle Cornelie. "'Yet I think I hear her piano. "'It is Mademoiselle Louise d'Armilly who is playing, while Mademoiselle Danglars is in bed.' Well, said Madame Danglars, come and undress me. They entered the bedroom, Debray stretched himself upon a large couch, and Madame Danglars passed her into her dressing room with Mademoiselle Cornerly. My dear Monsieur Lucien, said Madame Danglars through the door, you are always complaining that Eugenie will not address a word to you. Madame, 
said Lucien, playing with a little dog, who recognized him as a friend of the house, expected to be caressed. I am not the only one who makes similar complaints. I think I heard Morcerf say that he could not extract a word from his betrothed. True, said Madame Donglard, yet I think this will all pass off, and that you will one day see her enter your study. My study? At least that of the minister. Why so? To ask for an engagement at the opera. Really, I never saw such an infatuation for music. It is quite ridiculous for a young lady of fashion. De Bray smiled. Well, said he, let her come with your consent and that of the baron, and we will try and give her an engagement, though we are very poor to pay such talent as hers. Go, Cornelie, said Madame Donglard. I do not require you any longer. Cornelie obeyed, and the next minute Madame Donglard left her room in a charming loose dress, and came and sat down close to Dubray. Then she began thoughtfully to caress the little spaniel. Lucien looked at her for a moment in silence. Come, Hermine, he said. After a short time, answer candidly. Something vexes you. Is it not so? Nothing, answered the baroness. And yet, as she could scarcely breathe, she rose and went towards a looking-glass. I am frightful to-night, she said. Debray rose, smiling, and was about to contradict the baroness upon this latter point, when the door opened suddenly. Monsieur Donglas appeared. Debray reseated himself. At the noise of the door, Madame Donglas turned around, and looked upon her husband with an astonishment. She took no trouble to conceal. "'Good evening, madame,' said the banker. "'Good evening, Monsieur de Bray. Probably the baroness thought this unexpected visit signified a desire to make up for the sharp words he had uttered during the day. Assuming a dignified air, she turned round to de Bray, without answering her husband. "'Read me something, Monsieur de Bray, she said. De Bray, who was slightly disturbed at this visit, recovered himself when he saw the calmness of the baroness, and took up a book marked by a mother-of-pearl knife inlaid with gold. "'Excuse me,' said the banker, "'but you will tie yourself, baroness, by such late hours, and Monsieur de Bray lives some distance from here.' De Bray was petrified, not only to hear Donglas speak so calmly and politely, but because it was apparent that beneath outward politeness there really lurked a determined spirit of opposition to anything his wife might wish to do. The baroness was also surprised, and showed her astonishment by a look which would doubtless have had some effect upon her husband, if he had not been intently occupied with the paper, where he was looking to see the closing stock quotations. The result was that the proud look entirely failed of its purpose. "'Monsieur Lucien,' said the baroness, "'I assure you, I have no desire to sleep, "'and that I have a thousand things to tell you this evening, "'which you must listen to even though you slept while hearing me.' "'I am at your service, madame,' replied Lucien coldly. "'My dear Monsieur de Bray,' said the banker, "'do not kill yourself to-night, "'listening to the follies of Madame Danglars, "'for you can hear them as well to-morrow.' But I claim to-night, and will devote it, if you will allow me, to talk over some serious matters with my wife. This time the blow was so well aimed, and hit so directly, that Lucien and the Baroness were staggered, and they interrogated each other with their eyes, as if to seek help against his aggression. But the irresistible will of the master of the house prevailed, and the husband was victorious. "'Do not think I wish to turn you out, my dear de Bray, continued Donglar. "'Oh, no, not at all. An unexpected occurrence forces me to ask my wife to have a little conversation with me. It is so rarely I make such a request. I am sure you cannot grudge it to me.' De Bray muttered something, bowed, and went out, knocking himself against the edge of the door, like Nathan in Atalie. It is extraordinary, 
he said when the door was closed behind him. How easily these husbands, whom we ridicule, gain an advantage over us. Lucien having left, Danglars took his place on the sofa, closed the open book, and placing himself in a dreadfully dictatorial attitude, he began playing with the dog, but the animal not liking him as well as Debray, and attempting to bite him. Danglars seized him by the skin of his neck and threw him upon a couch on the other side of the room. The animal uttered a cry during the transit, but arrived at its destination. It crouched behind the cushions and, stupefied at such unusual treatment, remained silent and motionless. "'Do you know, sir,' asked the baroness, "'that you are improving? Generally you are only rude, but to-night you are brutal.' "'It is because I am in a worse humour than usual,' replied Danglars. Hermine looked at the banker with supreme disdain. These glances frequently exasperated the pride of Danglars, but this evening he took no notice of them. "'And what have I to do with your ill humour? said the Marioness, irritated at the impassibility of her husband. "'Do these things concern me?' Keep your ill humour at home in your money boxes, or since you have clerks whom you pay, vent it upon them. Not so, replied Danglars. Your advice is wrong, so I shall not follow it. My money boxes are my patolos, as I think Monsieur de Moustier says, and I will not retard its course, or disturb its calm. My clerks are honest men who earn my fortune, my pay much below their deserts, if I may value them according to what they bring in. Therefore I shall not get into a passion with them, those with whom I will be in a passion, or those who eat my dinners, mount my horses, and exhaust my fortune. And pray, who are the persons who exhaust your fortune? Explain yourself more clearly, I beg, sir. Oh, make yourself easy. I am not speaking riddles, and you will soon know what I mean. The people who exhaust my fortune are those who draw out seven hundred thousand francs in the course of an hour. I do not understand you, sir, said the baroness, trying to disguise the agitation of her voice and the flush of her face. You understand me perfectly. "'On the contrary,' said Danglars. "'But if ye will persist, I will tell you that I have just lost seven hundred thousand francs upon the Spanish loan.' "'And pray,' asked the baroness, "'am I responsible for this loss?' "'Why not?' "'Is it my fault you have lost seven hundred thousand francs?' "'Certainly it is not mine.' "'Once for all, sir,' replied the baroness sharply. "'I tell you I will not hear cash named. It is a style of language I never heard in the house of my parents or in that of my first husband.' "'Oh, I can well believe that, for neither of them was worth a penny.' "'The better reason for my not being conversant with the slang of the bank, which is here dinning in my ears from morning to night.' That noise of jingling crowns, which are constantly being counted and recounted, is odious to me. I only know one thing I dislike more, which is the sound of your voice. Really, said Danglars, well, this surprises me, for I thought you took the liveliest interest in all my affairs. Why, what could put such an idea into your head? Yourself? Ah, what next? most assuredly i should like to know upon what occasion oh mon dieu that is very easily done last february you were the first who told me of the haitian funds you had dreamed that a ship had entered the harbour at havre that this ship brought news that a payment we had looked upon as lost was going to be made i know how clear-sighted your dreams are I therefore purchased immediately as many shares as I could of the Haitian debt, and I gained four hundred thousand francs by it, of which one hundred thousand have been honestly paid to you. 
you spent it as you pleased. That was your business. In March there was a question about a grant to a railway. Three companies presented themselves, each offering equal securities. You told me that your instinct, and although you pretend to know nothing about speculations, I think on the contrary that your comprehension is very clear upon certain affairs. Well, you told me that your instinct led you to believe the grant would be given to the company called the Southern. I bought two-thirds of the shares of that company. As you had foreseen, the shares trebled in value, and I picked up a million, from which two hundred and fifty thousand francs were paid to you for pin money. How have you spent this two hundred and fifty thousand francs? It is no business of mine. When are you coming to the point? cried the baroness, shivering with anger and impatience. Patience, madame, I am coming to it. That's fortunate. In April you went to dine at the minister's. You had a private conversation respecting Spanish affairs and the expulsion of Don Carlos. I bought some Spanish shares. The expulsion took place, and I pocketed six hundred thousand francs. The day Charles sank, repassed the Bidar Soa. Of those six hundred thousand francs, you took fifty thousand crowns. They were yours. You disposed of them according to your fancy, and I ask no questions. But it is not the less true that you have this year received five hundred thousand livres. Well, sir, and what then? Ah, yes, it was just after this that you spoiled everything. Really, your manner of speaking, it expresses my meaning, and that is all I want. Well, three days after that you talked politics with Monsieur de Bray, and you fancied from his words that Don Carlos had returned to Spain. Well, I sold my shares. The news got out, and I no longer sold. I gave them away. Next day I find the news was false, and by this false report I have lost seven hundred thousand francs. Well? Well, since I gave you a fourth of my gains, I think you owe me a fourth of my losses. The fourth of seven hundred thousand francs is one hundred and seventy-five thousand francs. What you say is absurd, and I cannot see why Monsieur Dupré's name is mixed up in this affair. Because, if you do not possess the one hundred and seventy-five thousand francs I reclaim, you must have lent them to your friends, and Monsieur Dupré is one of your friends. For shame! exclaimed the baroness. Oh, let us have no gestures, no screams, no modern drama, or you will oblige me to tell you that I see Debray leave here, pocketing the whole of the five hundred thousand livres you have handed over to him this year, while he smiles to himself, saying that he has found what the most skilful players have never discovered, that is, a roulette where he wins without playing, and is no loser when he loses. The baroness became enraged. Wretch! she cried. Will you dare to tell me you did not know what you now reproach me with? I do not say that I did know it. And I do not say that I did not know it. I merely tell you to look into my conduct during the last four years that we have ceased to be husband and wife, and see whether it has not always been consistent. Some time after our rupture, you wish to study music under the celebrated baritone who made such a successful appearance at the Theatre Italien. At the same time, I felt inclined to learn dancing of the dancers who acquired such a reputation in London. This cost me, on your account and mine, one hundred thousand francs. I said nothing, for we must have peace in the house. 
and one hundred thousand francs for a lady and gentleman to be properly instructed in music and dancing are not too much well you soon became tired of singing and you take a fancy to study diplomacy with the minister's secretary you understand it signifies nothing to me so long as you pay for your lessons out of your own cash box but to-day i find you are drawing on mine and that your apprenticeship may cost me seven hundred thousand francs per month stop there madame for this cannot last either the diplomatist must give his lessons gratis and i will tolerate him or he must never set his foot again in my house do you understand madame oh this is too much cried amine choking you are worse than despicable but continued danglars i find you did not even pause there insults you are right let us leave these facts alone and reason coolly i have never interfered in your affairs excepting for your good treat me in the same way you say you have nothing to do with my cash-box be it so do as you like with your own but do not fill or empty mine besides how do i know that this was not a political trick that the minister enraged at seeing me in the opposition and jealous of the popular sympathy i excite has not concerted with monsieur de bray to ruin me a probable thing why not who ever heard of such an occurrence as this a false telegraphic dispatch it is almost impossible for wrong signals to be made as they were in the last two telegrams it was done on purpose for me i am sure of it sir said the baroness humbly are you not aware that the man employed there was dismissed that they talked of going to law with him that orders were issued to arrest him and that this order would have been put into execution if he had not escaped by flight which proves that he is either mad or guilty it was a mistake yes which made fools laugh which caused the minister to have a sleepless night which has caused the minister's secretaries to blacken several sheets of paper by which has cost me seven hundred thousand francs but sir said amine suddenly if all this is as you say caused by monsieur de why instead of going direct to him do you come and tell me of it why to accuse the man do you address the woman do i know monsieur de Bray? do i wish to know him do i wish to know that he gives advice do i wish to follow it do i speculate no you do all this not i still it seems to me that as you profit by it danglars shrugged his shoulders foolish creature he exclaimed women fancy they have talent because they have managed two or three intrigues without being the talk of paris but know that if you had even hidden your irregularities from your husband who has but the commencement of the art for generally husbands will not see you would then have been but a faint imitation of most of your friends among the women of the world but it has not been so with me i see and always have seen during the last sixteen years you may perhaps have hidden a thought but not a step not an action not a fault has escaped me while you flattered yourself upon your address and firmly believed you had deceived me what has been the result that thanks to my pretended ignorance there is none of your friends from monsieur de villefort to monsieur de bray who has not trembled before me there is not one who has not treated me as the master of the house 
the only title I desire with respect to you. There is not one, in fact, who would have dared to speak of me as I have spoken of them this day. I will allow you to make me hateful, but I will prevent you rendering me ridiculous, and above all, I forbid you to ruin me. The baroness had been tolerably composed until the name of Villefort had been pronounced. Then she became pale, and rising as if touched by a spring, she stretched out her hands as though conjuring in an apparition. She then took two or three steps towards her husband, as though to tear the secret from him, of which she was ignorant, or which she withheld from some odious calculation, odious as all his calculations were. Monsieur de Villefort! What do you mean? I mean that Monsieur de Nargonne, your first husband, being neither a philosopher nor a banker, or perhaps being both and seeing there was nothing to be got out of a king's attorney, died of grief or anger at finding, after an absence of nine months, that you had been enceinte cease. I am brutal. I not only allow it, but boast of it. It is one of the reasons of my success in commercial business. Why did he kill himself instead of you? Because he had no cash to save. My life belongs to my cash. Monsieur Dobre has made me lose 700,000 francs. Let him bear his share of the loss, and we will go on as before. If not... Let him become bankrupt for the 250,000 livres, and do as all bankrupts do, disappear. He is a charming fellow, I allow, when his news is correct. But when it is not, there are fifty others in the world who would do better than he. Madame Danglars was rooted to the spot. She made a violent effort to reply to this last attack, but she fell upon a chair, thinking of Villefort, of the dinner scene, of the strange series of misfortunes which had taken place in her house during the last few days, and changed the usual calm of her establishment to a scene of scandalous debate. Danglars did not even look at her, though she did her best to faint. He shut the bedroom door after him, without adding another word, and returned to his apartments. And when Madame Donglar recovered from her half-fainting condition, she could almost believe that she had had a disagreeable dream. End of chapter 65 Chapter 66 Matrimonial Projects The day following this scene, at the hour the banker usually chose to pay a visit to Madame Donglar on his way to his office, his coupe did not appear. At this time, that is, about half-past twelve, Madame Donglars ordered her carriage and went out. Donglars, hidden behind a curtain, watched the departure he had been waiting for. He gave orders that he should be informed as soon as Madame Donglars appeared. But at two o'clock she had not returned. He then called for his horses, drove to the chamber, and inscribed his name to speak against the budget. From twelve to two o'clock, Danglars had remained in his study, unsealing his dispatches and becoming more and more sad every minute, heaping figure upon figure, and receiving, among other visits, one from Major Cavalcanti, who, as stiff and exact as ever, presented himself precisely at the hour named the night before, to terminate his business with the banker. On leaving the chamber, Danglars, who had shown violent marks of agitation during the sitting, and been more bitter than ever against the ministry, re-entered his carriage, and told the coachman to drive to the Avenue des Champs-Élysées, numéro 30. Monte Cristo was at home. Only he was engaged with someone and begged to Danglars to wait for a moment in the drawing-room. While the banker was waiting in the anteroom, the door opened, and a man dressed as an abbé, and doubtless more familiar with the house than he was, came in and, instead of waiting, merely bowed, passed on to the farther apartments, and disappeared. 
A minute after the door by which the priest had entered reopened, and Monte Cristo appeared, Pardon me, said he, my dear Baron, but one of my friends, the Abbe Busoni, whom you perhaps saw passed by, has just arrived in Paris. Not having seen him for a long time, I could not make up my mind to leave him sooner, so I hope this will be sufficient reason for my having made you wait. Nay, said Danglars, it is my fault. I have chosen a visit at a wrong time, and will retire. Not at all. On the contrary, be seated. But what is the matter with you? You look careworn. Really, you alarm me. A melancholy in a capitalist, like the appearance of a comet, presages some misfortune to the world. I have been in ill luck for several days, said Danglars, and I have heard nothing but bad news. Ah, indeed, said Monte Cristo. Have you had another fall at the Bourse? No, I am safe for a few days at least. I am only annoyed about a bankrupt of Trieste. Really? Does it happen to be Jacopo Manfredi? Exactly so. Imagine a man who has transacted business with me for I don't know how long to the amount of eight hundred thousand or nine hundred thousand francs during the year. Never a mistake or delay. A fellow who paid like a prince. Well, I was a million in advance with him, and now my fine Jacopo Manfredi suspends payment. Really? It is an unheard of fatality. I draw upon him for six hundred thousand francs. My bills are returned unpaid, and more than that, I hold bills of exchange signed by him to the value of four hundred thousand francs, payable at his correspondence in Paris at the end of this month. Today is the thirtieth. I present them but my correspondent has disappeared. This, with my Spanish affair, made a pretty end to the month. Then you really lost by that affair in Spain? Yes, only seven hundred thousand francs out of my cash box. Nothing more. Why, how could you have made such a mistake? Such an old stager! Oh, it is all my wife's fault. She dreamed Don Carlos had returned to Spain. She believes in dreams. It is magnetism, she says, and when she dreams a thing, it is sure to happen, she assures me. On this conviction, I allow her to speculate. She having her bank and her stockbroker, she speculated and lost. It is true she speculates with her own money, not mine. Nevertheless, you can understand that when seven hundred thousand francs leave the wife's pocket, the husband always finds it out. But do you mean to say you have not heard of this? Why, the thing has made a tremendous noise. Yes, I heard of it spoken, but I did not know the details. And then no one can be more ignorant than I am of the affairs in the Bourse. Then you do not speculate? I? How could I speculate when I already have so much trouble in regulating my income? I should be obliged, beside my steward, to keep a clerk and a boy. But touching these Spanish affairs, I think that the Baroness did not dream the whole of the Don Carlos matter. The papers said something about it, did they not? Then uh, you believe the papers? I? Not the least in the world. Only I fancied that the honest messager was an exception to the rule, and that it only announced telegraphic dispatches. Well, that's what puzzles me replied Danglars. The news of the return of Don Carlos was brought by telegraph. 
So that, said Monte Cristo, you have lost nearly one million seven hundred thousand francs this month. Not nearly, indeed. That is exactly my loss. Diable, said Monte Cristo compassionately. It is a hard blow for a third-rate fortune. Third-rate, said Danglars, rather humble. What do you mean by that? Certainly, continued Monte Cristo. I make three assortments in fortune. First-rate, second-rate, and third-rate fortunes. I call those first-rate, which are composed of treasures one possesses under one's hand, such as mines, lands, and funded property, in such states as France, Austria, and England, provided these treasures and property form a total of about a hundred millions. I call those second-rate fortunes that are gained by manufacturing enterprises, joint stock companies, vice royalties, and principalities, not drawing more than one million five hundred thousand francs, the whole forming a capital of about fifty millions. Finally, I call those third-rate fortunes, which are composed of a fluctuating capital, dependent upon the will of others, or upon chances which a bankruptcy involves or a false telegram shakes, such as banks, speculations of the day, in fact, all operations under the influence of greater or less mischances, the whole bringing in a real or fictitious capital of about fifteen millions. I think this is about your position, is it not? Confound it, yes, replied Danglars. The result, then, of six more such months as this would be to reduce the third-rate house to despair. Oh, said Danglars, becoming very pale, how you are running on. Let us imagine seven such months, continued Monte Cristo in the same tone. Tell me, have you ever thought that seven times one million seven hundred thousand francs make nearly twelve millions? No, you have not. Well, you are right, for if you indulge in such reflections, you would never risk your principle, which is to the speculator what the skin is to civilized man. We have our clothes, some more splendid than others. This is our credit. But when a man dies, he has only his skin. In the same way, on retiring from business, you have nothing but your real principle of about five or six millions, at the most. For third-rate fortunes, are never more than a fourth of what they appear to be, like the locomotive on a railway, the size of which is magnified by the smoke and steam surrounding it. Well, out of the five or six millions which form your real capital, you have just lost nearly two millions, which must, of course, in the same degree, diminish your credit and fictitious fortune to follow out my simile. Your skin has been opened by bleeding, and this, if repeated three or four times, will cause death. So pay attention to it, my dear Monsieur Donglar. Do you want money? Do you wish me to lend you some? What a bad calculator you are, exclaimed Donglar, calling to his assistance all his philosophy and dissimulation. I have made money at the same time by speculations which have succeeded. I have made up the loss of blood by nutrition. I lost a battle in Spain. I have been defeated in Trieste, but my naval army in India will have taken some galleons, and my Mexican pioneers will have discovered some mine. Very good, very good. But the wound remains and will reopen at the first loss. No, for I am only embarked in certainties, replied Danglars, with the air of a mountebank sounding his own praises. To involve me, three governments must crumble to dust. Well, such things have been. That there should be a famine... Recollect the seven fat and the seven lean kine. 
or that the sea should become dry as in the days of Pharaoh, and even then my vessels would become caravans. So much the better. I congratulate you, my dear Monsieur Danglars, said Monte Cristo. I see I was deceived, and that you belong to the class of second-rate fortunes. I think I may aspire to that honour, said Danglars with a smile, which reminded Monte Cristo of the sickly moons which bad artists are so fond of daubing into their pictures of ruins. But while we are speaking of business, Danglars added, pleased to find an opportunity of changing the subject, tell me what I am to do for Monsieur Cavalcanti. Give him money. If he is recommended to you, and the recommendation seems good. Excellent. He presented himself this morning with a bond of forty thousand francs, payable at sight on you, signed by Boussoni, and returned by you to me, with your endorsement, of course. I immediately counted him over the forty banknotes. Monte Cristo nodded his head in token of assent. But that is not all, continued Danglars. He has opened an account with my house for his son. May I ask how much he allows the young man? Uh, five thousand francs per month. Sixty thousand francs per year. I thought I was right in believing that Cavalcanti to be a stingy fellow. How can a young man live upon five thousand francs a month? But you understand that if the young man should want a few thousand more, do not advance it. The father will never repay it. You do not know these ultramontane millionaires. They are regular misers. And by whom were they recommended to you? Oh, by the house of Fenzi, one of the best in Florence. I do not mean to say you will lose, but nevertheless, mind you hold to the terms of the agreement. Would you not trust the Cavalcanti? I? Oh, I would advance six millions on his signature. I was only speaking in reference to the second-rate fortunes we were mentioning just now. And with all this, how unassuming he is. I should never have taken him for anything more than a mere major. And you would have flattered him, for certainly, as you say, he has no manner. The first time I saw him, he appeared to me like an old lieutenant, who had grown mouldy under the epaulets. But all the Italians are the same. They are like old Jews when they are not glittering in oriental splendour. The young man is better, said Danglars. Yes, a little nervous, perhaps. But upon the whole, he appeared tolerable. I was uneasy about him. Why? "'Because you met him at my house. "'Just after his introduction into the world, as they told me, "'he has been travelling with a very severe tutor, "'and had never been to Paris before. "'Ah, I believe noblemen marry amongst themselves, do they not?' "'asked Danglars carelessly. "'They like to unite their fortunes. "'It is usual, certainly,' But Cavalcanti is an original who does nothing like other people. I cannot help thinking that he has brought his son to France to choose a wife. Do you think so? I am sure of it. And you have heard his fortune mentioned? Nothing else was talked of. Only some said he was worth millions, and others that he did not possess a farthing. And what is your opinion? I ought not to influence you, because it is only my own personal impression. Well, and it is that... Uh, my opinion is that all these old podestas, those ancient condottieri, for the Cavalcanti, have commanded armies and governed provinces. My opinion, I say, is that they have buried their millions in corners, the secret of which they have transmitted only to their eldest sons, 
who have done the same from generation to generation, and the proof of this is seen in their yellow and dry appearance, like the Florins of the Republic, which, from being constantly gazed upon, have become reflected in them. Certainly, said Danglars, and this is further supported by the fact of their not possessing an inch of land. Very little, at least. I know of none which Cavalcanti possesses, excepting his palace in Lucca. Ah, he has a palace, said Danglars, laughing. Come, that is something. Yes, and more than that. He lets it to the Minister of Finance while he lives in a simple house. Oh, as I told you before, I think the old fellow is very close. Come, you do not flatter him. I scarcely know him. I think I have seen him three times in my life. All I know relating to him is through Busoni and, and himself. He was telling me this morning that, tired of letting his property lie dormant in Italy, which is a dead nation, he wished to find a method, either in France or England, of multiplying his millions. But remember that though I place great confidence in Busoni, I am not responsible for this. Never mind. Accept my thanks for the client you have sent me. It is a fine name to inscribe on my ledgers, and my cashier was quite proud of it when I explained to him who the Cavalcanti were. By the way, this is merely a simple question. When this sort of people marry their sons, do they give them any fortune? Oh, that depends upon circumstances. I know an Italian prince, rich as a gold mine, one of the noblest families in Tuscany, who, when his sons married, according to his wish, gave them millions, and when they married against his consent, merely allowed them thirty crowns a month. Should Andrea marry according to his father's views, he will perhaps give him one, two or three millions, for example, supposing it were the daughter of a banker. He might take an interest in the house of the father-in-law of his son. Then again, if he disliked his choice, the major takes the key, double locks his coffer, and Master Andrea would be obliged to live like his sons of a Parisian family, by shuffling cards or rattling dice. Ah, uh, that poor boy will find out some Bavarian or Peruvian princess. He'll want a crown and an immense fortune. No, these grand lords on the other side of the Alps frequently marry into plain families, like Jupiter. They like to cross the race. But do you wish to marry André, my dear Monsieur Donglar, that you are asking so many questions? Ma foi, said Donglar, it would not be a bad speculation, I fancy, and you know I am a speculator. You are not thinking of Mademoiselle Donglar, I hope. You would not like poor Andrea to have his throat cut by Albert. Albert, repeated Donglar, shrugging his shoulders. Ah, well, he would care very little about it, I think. But he is betrothed to your daughter, I believe. Well, Monsieur de Morcerf and I have talked about this marriage. But Madame de Morcerf and Albert, you do not mean to say that it would not be a good match? Indeed, I imagine that Mademoiselle Donglar is as good as Monsieur de Morcerf. Mademoiselle Donglar fortune will be great, no doubt, especially if the telegraph should not make any more mistakes. Oh, I do not mean her fortune only. But tell me, what? Why did you not invite Monsieur and Madame de Morcerf to your dinner? I did so, but he excused himself on account of Madame de Morcerf, being obliged to go to Dieppe for the benefit of sea air. Yes, yes, said Donglar, laughing. It would do her a great deal of good. 
Why so? Because it is the air she always breathed in her youth. Monte Cristo took no notice of this ill-natured remark. But still, if Albert be not so rich as Mademoiselle Danglars, said the Count, you must allow that he is a fine name. So he has, but I like mine as well. Certainly, your name is popular, and does honour to the title they have adorned it with, but you are too intelligent not to know that, according to a prejudice, too firmly rooted to be exterminated, a nobility which dates back five centuries is worth more than one that can only reckon twenty years. And for this very reason, said Donglar with a smile which he tried to make sardonic, I prefer Monsieur Andrea Calvalcanti to Monsieur Albert de Morcerf. Still, I should not think that the Morcerfs would yield to the Cavalcanti. The Morcerfs. Stay, my dear Count, said Danglars. You are a man of the world, are you not? I think so. And you understand the heraldry? A little. Well, look at my coat of arms. It is worth more than Morcerfs. Why so? Because though I am not a baron by birth, my real name is at least Donglar. Well, what then? Well, his name is not Morcerf. How? Not Morcerf? Not the least in the world. Go on. I have been made a baron, so that I actually am one. He made himself a count, so that he is not one at all. Impossibly. Listen, my dear count. Monsieur de Morcerf has been my friend, or rather my acquaintance, during the last thirty years. You know I have made the most of my arms, though I never forgot my origin. A proof of great humility or great pride, said Monte Cristo. Well, when I was a clerk, Morcerf was a mere fisherman. And then he was called? Fernand. Only Fernand? Fernand Mondego. You are sure? Pardieu, I have bought enough fish of him to know his name. Then why do you think of giving your daughter to him? Because Fernand and Danglars, being both parvenus, both having become noble, both rich, are about equal in worth, excepting that there have been certain things mentioned of him that were never said of me. What? Oh, nothing. Ah, yes, what you tell me recalls to mine something about the name of fernand mondego i have heard that name in greece in conjunction with the affairs of ali pasha exactly so this is the mystery said danglars i acknowledge i would have given anything to find it out it would be very easy if you much wished it how so Probably you have some correspondent in Greece. I should think so. At Yanina? Everywhere. Well, write to your correspondent in Yanina and ask him what part was played by a Frenchman named Fernand Mandego in the catastrophe of Ali Tepelini. You are right, exclaimed Ongla, rising quickly. I will write today. Do so. I will. And if you should hear of anything very scandalous, I will communicate it to you. You will oblige me. Donglar rushed out of the room and made but one leap into his coop. End of chapter 66 Chapter 67 At the Office of the King's Attorney let us leave the banker driving his horses at their fullest speed, and follow Madame Danglars in her morning excursion. 
We've said that at half past twelve o'clock, Madame Danglars had ordered her horses and had left her home in the carriage. She directed her course towards the Faubourg Saint Germain, went down the Rue Mazarine, and stopped at the Passage du Pont Neuf. She descended and went through the passage. She was very plainly dressed, as would be the case with a woman of taste walking in the morning. At the Rue Guénégaud, she called a cab and directed the driver to go to the Rue d'Arlée. As soon as she was seated in the vehicle, she drew from her pocket a very thick black veil, which she tied on to her straw bonnet. She then replaced the bonnet and saw with pleasure in a little pocket mirror that her white complexion and brilliant eyes were alone visible. The cab crossed the Pont Neuf and entered the Rue d'Arlée by the Place Dauphine. The driver was paid as the door opened, and stepping lightly up the stairs, Madame Donglard soon reached the Salle des Pas Perdus. There was a great deal going on that morning, and many business-like persons at the Palais. Business-like persons pay very little attention to women, and Madame Donglard crossed the hall without exciting any more attention than any other woman calling upon her lawyer. There was a great press of people in Monsieur de Villefort's antechamber, but Madame Danglars had no occasion even to pronounce her name. The instant she appeared, the doorkeeper rose, came to her, and asked her whether she was not the person with whom the procureur had made an appointment, and on her affirmative answer being given, he conducted her by a private passage to Monsieur de Villefort's office. The magistrate was seated in an armchair, writing with his back toward the door. He did not move as he heard it open, and the doorkeeper pronounced the words, Walk in, madame, and then reclose it. But no sooner had the man's footsteps ceased than he started up, drew the bolts, closed the curtains, and examined every corner of the room. Then, when he had assured himself that he could neither be seen nor heard, and was consequently relieved of doubts, he said, Thanks, madame, thanks for your punctuality and he offered a chair to Madame Danglars, which she accepted, for her heart beat so violently that she felt nearly suffocated. "'It is a long time, Madame,' said the procureur, describing a half-circle with his chair, so as to place himself exactly opposite to Madame Danglars. "'It is a long time since I had the pleasure of speaking alone with you, and I regret that we have only now met to enter upon a painful conversation.' "'Nevertheless, sir, you see I have answered your first appeal, "'although certainly the conversation must be much more painful for me than for you.' "'Villefort smiled bitterly. "'It is true, then,' he said, rather uttering his thoughts aloud than addressing his companion. "'It is true, then, that all our actions leave their traces, "'some sad, others bright, on our paths.' It is true that every step in our lives is like the course of an insect on the sands. It leaves its track. Alas, to many the path is traced by tears. Sir, said Madame Danglars, you can feel for my emotion, can you not? Spare me, then, I beseech you. When I look at this room, whence so many guilty creatures have departed, trembling and ashamed, when I look at that chair before which I now sit trembling and ashamed, oh, it requires all my reason to convince me that I am not a very guilty woman and you a menacing judge. Villefort dropped his head and sighed. And I, he said, I feel that my place is not in the judge's seat, but on the prisoner's stool. You, said Madame Danglars, Yes, I. I think, sir, you exaggerate your situation, said Madame Danglars, whose beautiful eyes sparkled for a moment. The paths of which you were just speaking have been traced by all young men of ardent imaginations. Besides the pleasure, there is always remorse from the indulgence of our passions, and, after all, what have you meant to fear from all this? The world excuses, and notoriety ennobles you. Madame, replied Villefort, you know that I am no hypocrite, or at least 
that I never deceive without a reason. If my brow be severe, it is because many misfortunes have clouded it. If my heart be petrified, it is that I might sustain the blows it has received. I was not so in my youth. I was not so on the night of the betrothal, when we were all seated around a table in the Rue du Cour at Marseille. But since then everything has changed in and about me. I am accustomed to brave difficulties, and in the conflict to crush those who, by their own free will, or by chance, voluntarily or involuntarily, interfere with me in my career. It is generally the case that what we most ardently desire is as ardently withheld from us by those who wish to obtain it, or from whom we attempt to snatch it. Thus, the greater number of a man's errors come before him disguised under the specious form of necessity. Then, after error has been committed in a moment of excitement, of delirium, or of fear, we see that we might have avoided and escaped it. The means we might have used, which we in our blindness could not see, then seem simple and easy. And we say, Why did I not do this instead of that? Women, on the contrary, are rarely tormented with remorse, for the decision does not come from you. Your misfortunes are generally imposed upon you, and your faults the results of others' crimes. In any case, sir, you will allow, replied Madame Danglars, that even if the fault were alone mine, I last night received a severe punishment for it. Poor thing, said Villefort, pressing her hand. It was too severe for your strength. For you were twice overwhelmed, and yet... Well? Well, I must tell you. Collect all your courage, for you have not yet heard it all. Ah, <sighs> exclaimed Madame Danglars, alarmed. What is there more to hear? You only look back to the past, and it is indeed bad enough. Well, picture to yourself a future more gloomy still, certainly frightful, perhaps sanguinary. The Baroness knew how calm Villefort naturally was, and his present excitement frightened her so much that she opened her mouth to scream, but the sound died in her throat. "'How has this terrible past been recalled?' cried Villefort. "'How is it that it has escaped from the depths of the tomb, and the recesses of our hearts where it was buried to visit us now like a phantom, whitening our cheeks and flushing our brows with shame?' "'Alas!' said Hermine. Doubtless it is chance. Chance, replied Villefort. No, no, madame, there is no such thing as chance. Oh, yes. Has not a fatal chance revealed all this? Was it not by chance the Count of Monte Cristo bought that house? Was it not by chance he caused the earth to be dug up? Is it not by chance that the unfortunate child was disinterred under the trees, that poor, innocent offspring of mine, which I never even kissed, but for whom I wept many, many tears. Ah, my heart clung to the Count when he mentioned the dear spoil found beneath the flowers. Well, no, madame, this is the terrible news I have to tell you, said Villefort in a hollow voice. No, nothing was found beneath the flowers. There was no child disinterred. No, you must not weep. No, you must not groan. You must tremble. What can you mean? asked Madame Danglars, shuddering. I mean that Monsieur de Monte Cristo, digging underneath these trees, found neither skeleton nor chest, because neither of them was there. Neither of them there? repeated Madame Danglars her staring, wide-open eyes expressing her alarm. "'Neither of them there?' she again said, as though striving to impress herself with the meaning of the words which escaped her. "'No,' said Villefort, burying his face in his hands. "'No, a hundred times no!' "'Then you did not bury the poor child there, sir. 
Why did you deceive me? Where did you place it? Tell me where. There. But listen to me, listen, and you will pity me, who has for twenty years alone borne the heavy burden of grief I am about to reveal without casting the least portion upon you. Oh, you frighten me. But speak, I will listen. You recollect that sad night, when you were half expiring on that bed in the red damask room, while I, scarcely less agitated than you, awaited your delivery. The child was born, was given to me, motionless, breathless, voiceless. We thought it dead. Madame Domblard moved rapidly as though she would spring from her chair, but Villefort stopped and clasped his hands as if to implore her attention. We thought it dead, he repeated. I placed it in the chest, which was to take the place of a coffin. I descended to the garden, I dug a hole, and then flung it down in haste. Scarcely had I covered it with earth when the arm of the Corsican was stretched towards me. I saw a shadow rise, and at the same time a flash of light. I felt pain. I wished to cry out, but an icy shiver ran through my veins and stifled my voice. I fell, lifeless, and fancied myself killed. Never shall I forget your sublime courage, when having returned to consciousness, I dragged myself to the foot of the stairs, and you, almost dying yourself, came to meet me. We were obliged to keep silent upon the dreadful catastrophe. You had the fortitude to regain the house, assisted by your nurse. A duel was the pretext for my wound, though we scarcely expected it. Our secret remained in our own keeping alone. I was taken to Versailles. For three months I struggled with death. At last, as I seemed to cling to life, I was ordered to the south. Four men carried me from Paris to Chalon, walking six leagues a day. Madame de Villefort followed the litter in her carriage. At Chalon I was put upon the Sound. Thence I passed on to the Rhône, whence I descended merely with the Count to Arles. At Arles I was again placed on my litter, and continued my journey to Marseille. My recovery lasted six months. I never heard you mentioned, and I did not dare inquire for you. When I returned to Paris, I learned that you, the widow of Monsieur de Nargonne, had married Monsieur Danglars. What was the subject of my thoughts from the time consciousness returned to me? Always the same, always the child's corpse, coming every night in my dreams, rising from the earth and hovering over the grave with menacing look and gesture. I inquired immediately on my return to Paris. The house had not been inhabited since we left it, but it had just been let for nine years. I found the tenant. I pretended that I disliked the idea that a house belonging to my wife's father and mother should pass into the hands of strangers. I offered to pay them for cancelling the lease. They demanded six thousand francs. I would have given ten thousand. I would have given twenty thousand. I had the money with me. I made the tenant sign the deed of resolution, and when I had obtained what I so much wanted, I galloped to Auteuil. No one had entered the house since I had left it. It was five o'clock in the afternoon. I ascended into the red room and waited for night. There, all the thoughts which had disturbed me during my years of constant agony came back with double force. The Corsican, who had declared the vendetta against me, who had followed me from Nîmes to Paris, who had hid himself in the garden, who had struck me, had seen me dig the grave, had seen me enter the child, he might become acquainted with your person. Nay, he might even then have known it. Would he not one day make you pay for keeping this terrible secret? Would it not be a sweet revenge for him when he found that I had not died from the blow of his dagger? It was therefore necessary 
before everything else, and at all risks, that I should cause all traces of the past to disappear, that I should destroy every material vestige. Too much reality would always remain in my recollection. It was for this I had annulled the lease. It was for this I had come. It was for this I was waiting. Night arrived. I allowed it to become quite dark. I was without a light in that room when the wind shook all the doors behind which I continually expected to see some spy concealed. I trembled. I seemed everywhere to hear your moans behind me in the bed, and I dared not turn around. My heart beat so violently that I feared my wound would open. At length, one by one, all the noises in the neighborhood ceased. I understood that I had nothing to fear, that I should neither be seen nor heard. So I decided upon descending to the garden. Listen, Hermine, I consider myself as brave as most men. But when I drew my from my breast the little key of the staircase, which I had found in my coat, that little key we have both used to cherish so much, which you wish to have fastened to a golden ring, when I opened the door and saw the pale moon shedding a long stream of white light on the spiral staircase like a spectre, I leaned against the wall and nearly shrieked. I seemed to be going mad. At last I mastered my agitation. I descended the staircase step by step. The only thing I could not conquer was a strange trembling in my knees. I grasped the railings. If I had relaxed my hold for a moment, I should have fallen. I reached the lower door. Outside this door, a spade was placed against a wall. I took it and advanced toward the thicket. I had provided myself with a dark lantern. In the middle of the lawn, I stopped to light it. Then I continued my path. It was the end of November. All the verdure of the garden had disappeared. The trees were nothing more than skeletons with their long, bony arms, and the dead leaves sounded on the gravel under my feet. My terror overcame me to such a degree as I approached the thicket that I took a pistol from my pocket and armed myself. I fancied continually that I saw the figure of the Corsican between the branches. I examined the thicket with my dark lantern. It was empty. I looked carefully around. I was indeed alone. No noise disturbed the silence but the owl, whose piercing cry seemed to be calling up the phantoms of the night. I tied my lantern to a forked branch. I had noticed a year before at the precise spot where I stopped to dig the hole. The grass had grown very thickly there during the summer, and when autumn arrived, no one had been there to mow it. Still, one place where the grass was thin attracted my attention. It evidently was there I had turned up the ground. I went to work. The hour, then, for which I had been waiting during the last year, had at length arrived. How I worked, how I hoped, how I struck every piece of turf, thinking to find some resistance to my spade. But no, I found nothing, though I had made a hole twice as large as the first. I thought I had been deceived. I had mistaken the spot. I turned around. I looked at the trees. I tried to recall the details which had struck me at the time. A cold, sharp wind whistled through the leafless branches, and yet the drops fell from my forehead. I recollected that I was stabbed just as I was trampling the ground to fill up the hole, which, doing so, I had leaned against a laburnum. Behind me was an artificial rockery intended to serve as a resting place for persons walking in the garden. In falling, my hand, relaxing its hold of the laburnum, felt the coldness of the stone. On my right I saw the tree, behind me the rock. I stood in the same attitude and threw myself down. I rose and again began digging and enlarging the hole. 
Still, I found nothing, nothing. The chest was no longer there. The chest was no longer there, murmured Madame Danglars, choking with fear. Think not I contented myself with this one effort, continued Villefort. No, I searched the whole thicket. I thought the assassin, having discovered the chest, and supposing it to be a treasure, had intended carrying it off. But perceiving his error, had dug another hole and deposited it there. But I could find nothing. Then the idea struck me that he had not taken these precautions, and had simply thrown it in a corner. In the last case, I must wait for daylight to renew my search. I remained in the room, and waited. Oh, heavens! When daylight dawned, I went down again. My first visit was to the thicket. I hoped to find some traces which had escaped me in the darkness. I had turned up the earth over a surface of more than twenty feet square, and a depth of two feet. A labourer would not have done in a day what occupied me an hour. But I could find nothing. Absolutely nothing. Then I renewed the search. Supposing it had been thrown aside, it would probably be on the path which led to the little gate. But this examination was as useless as the first, and with a bursting heart. I returned to the thicket, which now contained no hope for me. Oh, cried Madame Danglars, it was enough to drive you mad. I hoped for a moment that it might, said Villefort, but that happiness was denied me. However, recovering my strength and my ideas, why, said I, should that man have carried away the corpse? But you said replied Madame Danglars, he would require it as a proof. Ah, no, madame, that could not be. Dead bodies are not kept a year. They are shown to a magistrate and the evidence is taken. Now nothing of the kind has happened. What then? asked Hermine, trembling violently. Something more terrible, more fatal, more alarming for us. The child was perhaps alive, and the assassin may have saved it. Madame Danglars uttered a piercing cry, and seizing Villefort's hands exclaimed, My child was alive, she said. You buried my child alive. You were not certain my child was dead, and you buried it? Oh! Madame Danglars had risen, and stood before the procureur, whose hands she wrung in her feeble grasp. I know not. I merely suppose so, as I might suppose anything else, replied Villefort, with a look so fixed it indicated that his powerful mind was on the verge of despair and madness. Ah, oh, my poor child! My poor child! cried the baroness, falling on her chair and stifling her sobs in her handkerchief. Villefort became somewhat reassured, perceived that to avert the maternal storm gathering over his head, he must inspire Madame Danglars with the terror he felt. "'You understand, then, that if it were so,' said he, rising in his turn, and approaching the baroness to speak to her in a lower tone, "'we are lost. This child lives, and someone knows it lives. Someone who is in possession of our secret, and since Monte Cristo speaks before us of a child disinterred, when that child could not be found, it is he who is in possession of our secret. Just God, avenging God, murmured Madame Danglars. Villefort's only answer was a stifled groan. But the child, the child, sir, repeated the agitated mother. How I have searched for him, replied Villefort, wringing his hands. How I have called him in my long sleepless nights. How I have longed for royal wealth to purchase a million of secrets from a million of men, and to find mine among them. At last, one day, when for the hundredth time I took up my spade, I asked myself again and again, 
what the Corsican could have done with a child. A child encumbers a fugitive. Perhaps on perceiving it was still alive, he had thrown it into the river. Impossible, cried Madame Danglars. A man may murder another out of revenge, but he would not deliberately drown a child. Perhaps, continued Villefort, he had put it in the foundling hospital. Oh, yes, yes, cried the baroness. My child is there. I ran to the hospital and learned that the same night, the night of the 20th of September, a child had been brought there, wrapped in a part of a fine linen napkin, purposely torn in half. This portion of the napkin was marked with a half a baron's crown and the letter H. Truly, truly, said Madame Danglars, all my linen is marked thus. Monsieur de Nagan was a baronet, and my name is Hermine. Thank God, my child was not then dead. No, it was not dead. And you can tell me so without fearing to make me die of joy? Where is the child? Villefort shrugged his shoulders. Do I know? said he. And do you believe that if I knew I would relate to you all its trials and all its adventures as would a dramatist or a novel-writer? Alas, no. I know not. A woman about six months after came to claim it with the other half of the napkin. This woman gave all the requisite particulars, and it was entrusted to her. But you should have inquired for the woman. You should have traced her. And what do you think I did? I feigned a criminal process, and employed all the most acute bloodhounds and skilful agents in search of her. They traced her to Chalon, and there they lost her. They lost her? Yes, forever. Madame Danglars had listened to this recital with a sigh, a tear, or a shriek for every detail. And this is all? said she. And you stop there? Oh, no, said Villefort. I never ceased to search and to inquire. However, the last two or three years I had allowed myself some respite. But now I will begin with more perseverance and fury than ever, since fear urges me, not my conscience. But, replied Madame Danglars, the Count of Monte Cristo can know nothing, or he would not seek our society as he does. Oh, the wickedness of man is very great, said Villefort. Since it surpasses the goodness of God, did you observe that man's eyes while he was speaking to us? No. But have you ever watched him carefully? Doubtless he is capricious, but that is all. One thing alone struck me. Of all the exquisite things he placed before us, he touched nothing. I might have suspected he was poisoning us. And you see, you would have been deceived. Yes, doubtless. But believe me, that man has other projects. For that reason I wish to see you, to speak to you, to warn you against everyone, but especially against him. Tell me, cried Villefort, fixing his eyes more steadfastly on her than he had ever done before. Did you ever reveal to anyone our connection? Never, to anyone. You understand me, replied Villefort affectionately. When I say one, pardon my urgency, to any one living, I mean. Yes, yes, I understand very well, ejaculated the baroness. Never, I swear to you. Were you ever in the habit of writing in the evening, what had transpired in the morning? Do you keep a journal? No, my life has been passed in frivolity. I wish to forget it myself. Do you talk in your sleep? I sleep soundly, like a child. Do you not remember? The colour mounted to the baroness's face, and Villefort turned awfully pale. It is true, said he, in so low a tone that he could hardly be heard. Well? said the baroness. "'Well, I understand what I now have to do,' replied Villefort. 
in less than one week from this time, I will ascertain who this Monsieur de Monte Cristo is, whence he comes, where he goes, and why he speaks in our presence of children that have been disinterred in a garden. Villefort pronounced these words with an accent which would have made the Count shudder had he heard him. Then he pressed the hand the Baroness reluctantly gave him, and led her respectfully back to the door. Madame Danglars returned in another cab to the passage, on the other side of which she found her carriage, and her coachman sleeping peacefully on his box while waiting for her. End of chapter 67 Chapter 68 A Summer Ball The same day, during the interview between Madame Danglars and the procureur, a travelling carriage entered the Rue du Helder, passed through the gateway of number 27, and stopped in the yard. In a moment the door was opened, and Madame de Morcerf alighted, leaning on her son's arm. Albert soon left her, ordered his horses, and having arranged his toilet, drove to the Champs-Élysées to the house of Monte Cristo. The Count received him with his habitual smile. It was a strange thing that no one ever appeared to advance a step in that man's favour. Those who would, as it were, force a passage to his heart, found an impassable barrier. Morcerf, who ran towards him with open arms, was chilled as he drew near, in spite of the friendly smile, and simply held out his hand. Monte Cristo shook it coldly, according to his invariable practice. Here I am, dear Count. Welcome home again. I arrived an hour since. From Dieppe? No, from Treport. Indeed. And I have come at once to see you. This is extremely kind of you, said Monte Cristo with a tone of perfect indifference. And what is the news? You should not ask a stranger, a foreigner, for news. I know it, but in asking for news, I mean, have you done anything for me? Had you commissioned me? said Monte Cristo, feigning uneasiness. Come, come, said Albert, do not assume so much indifference. It is said, sympathy travels rapidly, and when at Treport, I felt the electric shock. You have either been working for me or thinking of me. Possibly, said Monte Cristo. I have indeed thought of you, but the magnetic wire I was guiding acted indeed without my knowledge. Indeed, pray tell me how it happened. Willingly, Monsieur Danglars dined with me. I know it. To avoid meeting him, my mother and I left town. But he met here Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti. Your Italian prince? Not so fast. Monsieur Andrea only calls himself Count. Calls himself, do you say? Yes, calls himself. Is he not a Count? What can I know of him? He calls himself so. I, of course, give him the same title, and everyone else does likewise. What a strange man you are. What next? You say Monsieur Danglars dined here? Yes, with Count Cavalcanti, the Marquis, his father, Madame Danglars, Monsieur and Madame de Villefort, charming people, Monsieur de Bray, Maximilien Morel, and Monsieur de Chateau Renaud. Did they speak of me? Not a word. So much the worse. Why so? I thought you wished them to forget you. If they do not speak of me, I am sure they thought about me, and I am in despair. How will that affect you, since Mademoiselle Danglars was not among the number here who thought of you? Truly she might have thought of you at home. I have no fear of that. Or if she did... It was only in the same way in which I think of her. Touching sympathy! So you hate each other, said the Count. Listen, said Morcerf. If Mademoiselle Danglars were disposed to take pity on my supposed martyrdom on her account, and would dispense with all matrimonial formalities between our two families, I am ready to agree to the arrangement. In a word, Mademoiselle Danglars would make a charming mistress. But a wife? 
Diable! And this, said Monte Cristo, is your opinion of your intended spouse? Yes, it is rather unkind, I acknowledge, but it is true. But as this dream cannot be realized, since Mademoiselle Donglar must become my lawful wife, live perpetually with me, sing to me, compose verses and music within ten paces of me, and that for my whole life, it frightens me. One may forsake a mistress, but a wife, good heavens, there she must always be, and to marry Mademoiselle Donglar would be awful. You are difficult to please, Viscount. Yes, for I often wish for what is impossible. What is that? To find such a wife as my father found. Monte Cristo turned pale and looked at Albert while playing with some magnificent pistols. Your father was fortunate then, said he. You know my opinion of my mother, Count. Look at her, still beautiful, witty, more charming than ever. For any other son to have stayed with his mother for four days at Treport, it would have been a condescension or a martyrdom. While I return more contented, more peaceful, shall I say more poetic, than if I had taken Queen Mab or Titania as my companion. That is an overwhelming demonstration, and you would make everyone vow to live a single life. Such are my reasons for not liking to marry Mademoiselle Donglar. Have you ever noticed how much a thing is heightened in value when we obtain possession of it? The diamond which glittered in the window at Mars or Fossins shines with much more splendor when it is our own. But if we are compelled to acknowledge the superiority of another, and still must retain the one that is inferior, do you not know what we have to endure? Worldling, murmured the Count. Thus I shall rejoice when Mademoiselle Eugenie perceives I am but a pitiful atom, with scarcely as many hundred thousand francs as she has millions. Monte Cristo smiled. One plan occurred to me, continued Albert. France likes all that is eccentric. I try to make him fall in love with Mademoiselle Danglars, but in spite of four letters written in the most alluring style, he invariably answered, My eccentricity may be great, but it will not make me break my promise. That is what I call a devoted friendship, to recommend to another one whom you would not marry yourself. Albert smiled. A propos, continued he, France is coming soon, but it will not interest you. You dislike him, I think. I? said Monte Cristo. My dear Viscount, how have you discovered that I did not like Monsieur France? I like everyone. And you include me in the expression everyone? Many thanks. Let us not mistake, said Monte Cristo. I love everyone as God commands us to love our neighbor as Christians. But I thoroughly hate but a few. Let us return to Monsieur Franz Depinay. Did you say he was coming? Yes, summoned by Monsieur de Villefort, who is apparently as anxious to get Mademoiselle Valentine married as Monsieur Donglar is to see Mademoiselle Eugenie settled. It must be a very irksome office to be the father of a grown-up daughter. It seems to make one feverish and to raise one's pulse to ninety beats a minute until the deed is done. But Monsieur Depinay, unlike you, bears his misfortune patiently. Still more, he talks seriously about the matter, puts on a white tie, and speaks of his family. He entertains a very high opinion of Monsieur and Madame de Villefort. Which they deserve, do they not? I believe they do. Monsieur de Villefort has always passed for a severe, but a just man. There is then one, said Monte Cristo, whom you do not condemn like poor Danglars. <laughs> because I am not compelled to marry his daughter, perhaps, replied Albert, laughing. Indeed, my dear sir, said Monte Cristo, you are revoltingly foppish. I, foppish? How do you mean? Yes, pray take a cigar, 
and cease to defend yourself and to struggle to escape marrying Mademoiselle Donglar. Let things take their course. Perhaps you may not have to retract. Pah, said Albert, staring. Doubtless, my dear Viscount, you will not be taken by force. And seriously, do you wish to break off your engagement? I would give a hundred thousand francs to be able to do so. Then make yourself quite easy. Monsieur Donglar would get double at sum to attain the same end. Am I indeed so happy? said Albert, who still could not prevent an almost imperceptible cloud passing across his brow. But, my dear Count, has Monsieur Donglar any reason? Ah, there is your proud and selfish nature. You would expose the self-love of another with a hatchet. But you shrink if your own is attacked with a needle. But yet Monsieur Donglar appeared delighted with you, was he not? Well, he is a man of bad taste, and is still more enchanted with another. I know not whom. Look and judge for yourself. Thank you. I understand. But my mother... No, not my mother. A mistake. My father intends giving a ball. A ball at this season? Summer balls are fashionable. If they were not, the Countess has only to wish it, and they would become so. You are right. You know they are select affairs. Those who remain in Paris in July must be true Parisian. Will you take charge of our invitation to Messieurs Cavalcanti? When will it take place? On Saturday. Monsieur Cavalcanti's father will be gone. But the son will be here. Will you invite young Monsieur Cavalcanti? I do not know him, Viscount. You do not know him? No, I never saw him until a few days since, and I'm not responsible for him. But you receive him at your house. That is another thing. He was recommended to me by a good abbé, who may be deceived. Give him a direct invitation, but do not ask me to present him. If he were afterwards to marry Mademoiselle Donglar, you would accuse me of intrigue, and would be challenging me. Besides, I may not be there myself. Where? At your ball. Why should you not be there? Because you have not yet invited me. But I come expressly for that purpose. You are very kind, but I may be prevented. If I tell you one thing, you will be so amiable as to set aside all impediments. Tell me what it is. My mother begs you to come. The Comtesse de Morcerf, said Monte Cristo, starting. Ah, Count, said Albert, I assure you, Madame de Morcerf speaks freely to me, and if you have not felt those sympathetic fibres of which I spoke just now thrill within you, you must be entirely devoid of them, for during the last four days we have spoken of no one else. You have talked of me? Yes, that is the penalty of being a living puzzle. Then I am also a puzzle to your mother. I should have thought her too reasonable to be led by imagination. A problem, my dear Count, for every one, for my mother as well as others, much studied but not solved, you still remain an enigma. Do not fear. My mother is only astonished that you remain so long unsolved. I believe, while the Countess G takes you for Lord Ruthven, my mother imagines you to be Cagliostro, or the Count Saint Germain. The first opportunity you have, confirm her in her opinion. It will be easy for you, as you have the philosophy of the one and the wit of the other. I thank you for the warning, said the Count. I shall endeavour to be prepared for all suppositions. You will then come on Saturday? Yes, since Madame de Morcerf invites me. You are very kind. Will Monsieur Donglar be there? He has already been invited by my father. We shall try to persuade the great Dagesso, Monsieur de Villefort, to come, but have not much hope of seeing him. 
Never despair of anything, says the proverb. Do you dance, Count? I dance. Yes, you. It would not be astonishing. That is very well before one is over forty. No, I do not dance, but I like to see others do so. Does Madame de Morcerf dance? Never. You can talk to her. She so delights in your conversation. Indeed. Yes, truly, and I assure you, you are the only man of whom I have heard her speak with interest. Albert rose and took his hat. The Count conducted him to the door. I have one thing to reproach myself with, said he, stopping Albert on the steps. What is it? I have spoken to you indiscreetly about Donglar. On the contrary, speak to me always in the same strain about him. I am glad to be reassured on that point. A propos, when do you expect Monsieur d'Epinay? Five or six days hence, at the latest. And when is he to be married? Immediately on the arrival of Monsieur and Madame de saint Meron. Bring him to see me. Although you say I do not like him, I assure you I shall be happy to see him. I will obey your orders, my lord. Good-bye. Until Saturday, when I may expect you, may I not? Yes, I promised you. The Count watched Albert, waving his hand to him. When he had mounted his phaeton, Monte Cristo turned and seeing Bertuccio. What news? said he. She went to the palais, replied the steward. Did she stay long there? An hour and a half. Did she return home? Directly. Well, my dear Bertuccio, said the Count, I now advise you to go in quest of the little estate I spoke to you of in Normandy. Bertuccio bowed, and as his wishes were in perfect harmony with the order he had received, he started the same evening. End of chapter 68 Chapter 69 The Inquiry Monsieur de Villefort kept the promise he had made to Madame Donglard to endeavour to find out how the Count of Monte Cristo had discovered the history of the house at Auteuil. He wrote the same day for the required information to Monsieur de Beauville, who, from having been an inspector of prisons, was promoted to a high office in the police, and the latter begged for two days' time to ascertain exactly who would be most likely to give him full particulars. At the end of the second day, Monsieur de Villefort received the following note. The person called the Count of Monte Cristo is an intimate acquaintance of Lord Wilmore, a rich foreigner, who is sometimes seen in Paris and who is there at this moment. He is also known to the Abbe Busoni, a Sicilian priest of high repute in East, where he has done much good. Monsieur de Villefort replied by ordering the strictest inquiries to be made respecting these two persons. His orders were executed, and the following evening he received these details. The abbé, who was in Paris only for a month, inhabited a small, two-storied house behind Saint-Sulpice. There were two rooms on each floor, and he was the only tenant. The two lower rooms consisted of a dining room, with a table, chairs, and a sideboard of walnut, and a wainscoted parlour without ornaments, carpet, or timepiece. It was evident that the abbé limited himself to objects of strict necessity. He preferred to use the sitting-room upstairs, which was more library than parlour, and was furnished with theological books and parchments, in which he delighted to bury himself for months at a time, according to his valet de chambre. His valet looked at the visitors through a sort of wicket, and if their faces were unknown to him or displeased him, he replied that the abbé was not in Paris, an answer which satisfied most persons, because the abbé was known to be a great traveller. Besides, whether at home or not, whether in Paris or Cairo, the abbé always left something to give away, which the valet distributed through his wicket in his master's name. The other room near the library was a bedroom, a bed without curtains, four armchairs and a couch covered with yellow Utrecht velvet, composed with a prix dieu all its furniture. Lord Wilmore resided in Rue Fontaine Saint-Georges. He was one of those English tourists who consume a large fortune in travelling, he hired the apartment in which he lived, furnished, passed only a few hours in the day there, 
and rarely slept there. One of his peculiarities was never to speak a word of French, which he, however, wrote with great facility. The day after this important information had been given to the king's attorney, a man alighted from a carriage at the corner of the Rue Farou, and, rapping at an olive-green door, asked if the Abbe Busoni were within. No, he went out early this morning, replied the valet. I might not always be content with that answer, replied the visitor, for I come from one to whom everyone must be at home, but have the kindness to give the Abbe Busoni. I told you he was not at home, repeated the valet. Then on his return, give him that card and this sealed paper. Will he be at home at eight o'clock this evening? Doubtless, unless he had at work, which is the same as if he were out. I will come again at that time, replied the visitor, who then retired. At the appointed hour, the same man returned in the same carriage, which, instead of stopping this time at the end of the Rue Ferru, drove up to the green door. He knocked, and it opened immediately to admit him. From the signs of respect the valet paid him, he saw that his note had produced a good effect. "'Is the abbé at home?' asked he. "'Yes, he is at work in his library, but he expects you, sir,' replied the valet. The stranger ascended a rough staircase, and before a table illumined by a lamp whose light was concentrated by a large shade, while the rest of the apartment was in partial darkness, he perceived the abbé in a monk's dress, with a cowl on his head, such as is used by learned men of the Middle Ages. "'Have I the honour of addressing the Abbé Busoni?' asked the visitor. "'Yes, sir,' replied the abbé. "'And you are the person whom Monsieur de Beauville, formerly an inspector of prisons, sends to me from the prefect of police?' "'Exactly, sir.' one of the agents appointed to secure the safety of Paris. Yes, sir, replied the stranger with a slight hesitation and blushing. The abbe replaced the large spectacles which covered not only his eyes but his temples, and sitting down motioned to his visitor to do the same. I am at your service, sir, said the abbe with a marked Italian accent. The mission with which i am charged sir replied the visitor speaking with hesitation is a confidential one on the part of him who fulfils it and him by whom he is employed the abbe bowed your probity replied the stranger is so well known to the prefect that he wishes as a magistrate to ascertain from you some particulars connected with the public safety, to ascertain which I am deputed to see you. It is hoped that no ties of friendship or humane consideration will induce you to conceal the truth. Provided, sir, the particulars you wish for do not interfere with my scruples or my conscience. I am a priest, sir, and the secrets of confession, for instance, must remain between me and God and not between me and human justice. Do not alarm yourself, monsieur. We will duly respect your conscience. At this moment, the abbe pressed down his side of the shade and so raised it on the other, throwing a bright light on the stranger's face, while his own remained obscured. Excuse me, abbe, said the envoy of the prefect of the police. But the light tries my eyes very much. The abbe lowered the shade. Now, sir, I am listening. Go on. I will come at once to the point. Do you know the Count of Monte Cristo? You mean Monsieur Zacon, I presume. Zacon? Is not his name Monte Cristo? Monte Cristo is the name of an estate, or rather of a rock, and not a family name. Well, be it so. Let us not dispute about words. And since Monsieur de Monte Cristo and Monsieur Zacon are the same, absolutely the same, let us speak of Monsieur Zacon. Agreed. 
I asked you if you knew him. Extremely well. Who is he? The son of a rich shipbuilder in Malta. I know that is a report, but as you are aware, the police does not content itself with vague reports. However, replied the abbe with an affable smile, when that report is in accordance with the truth, everybody must believe it, the police as well as all the rest. Are you sure of what you assert? What do you mean by that question? Understand, sir. I do not in the least suspect your veracity. I ask if you are certain of it. I knew his father, Monsieur Zacon. Ah, indeed. And when a child, I often played with the son in the timber yards. But whence does he derive the title of Count? You are aware that may be bought. In Italy? Everywhere. And his immense riches, whence does he procure them? They may not be so very great. How much do you suppose he possesses? From one hundred and fifty to hundred thousand livres per annum? That is reasonable, said the visitor. I have heard he had three or four million. Two hundred thousand per annum would make four millions of capital. But I was told he had four million per annum. That is not probable. Do you know this island of Monte Cristo? Certainly. Everyone who has come from Palermo, Napoli or Roma to France by sea must know it since he has passed close to it and must have seen it. I am told it is a delightful place. It is a rock. And why has the Count bought a rock? For the sake of being a count. In Italy, one must have territorial possessions to be a count. You have doubtless heard the adventures of Monsieur Zacan's youth. The fathers? No, the sons. I know nothing certain. At that period of his life, I lost sight of my young comrade. Was he in the wars? I think he entered the service. In what branch? In the navy. Are you not his confessor? No, sir, I believe he is a Lutheran. A Lutheran? I say I believe such is the case. I do not affirm it. Besides, liberty of conscience is established in France. Doubtless, and we are not now inquiring into his creed, but his actions, in the name of the Prefect of Police. I ask you what you know of him. He passes for a very charitable man. Our Holy Father, the Pope, has made him a knight of Jesus Christ for the services he rendered to the Christians in the East. He has five or six rings as testimonials from Eastern monarchs of his services. Does he wear them? No, but he is proud of them. He is better pleased with rewards given to the benefactors of man than to his destroyers. He is a Quaker, then. Exactly, he is a Quaker, with the exception of the peculiar dress. Has he any friends? Yes, everyone who knows him is his friend. But has he any enemies? One only. What is his name? Lord Wilmore. Where is he? He is in Paris just now. Can he give me any particulars? Important ones. He was in India with Zacon. Do you know his abode? It's somewhere in the Chaussée d'Antin, but I know neither the street nor the number. Are you at variance with the Englishman? I love Zacon, and he hates him. We are consequently not friends. Do you think the Count of Monte Cristo had ever been in France before he made his visit to Paris? To that question I can answer positively no. He had not, because he applied to me six months ago for the particulars he required, and as I did not know when I might again come to Paris, I recommended Monsieur Cavalcanti to him. Andrea? 
No, Bartolomeo, his father. Now, sir, I have but one question more to ask, and I charge you in the name of honour, of humanity and of religion, to answer me candidly. What is it, sir? Do you know with what design Monsieur de Monte Cristo purchased a house at Auteuil? Certainly, for he told me. What is it, sir? To make a lunatic asylum of it, similar to that founded by the Count of Pisani at Palermo. Do you know about that institution? I have heard of it. It is a magnificent charity. Having said this, the abbe bowed to imply he wished to pursue his studies. The visitor either understood the abbe's meaning, or had no more questions to ask. He arose, and the abbe accompanied him to the door. "'You are a great alms-giver,' said the visitor, "'and although you are said to be rich, I will venture to offer you something for your poor people. Will you accept my offering?' "'I thank you, sir. I am only jealous in one thing, and that is that the relief I give should be entirely from my own resources. However, my resolution, sir, is unchangeable, but you have only to search for yourself, and you will find, alas, but too many objects upon whom to exercise your benevolence. The abbe once more bowed as he opened the door. The stranger bowed and took his leave, and the carriage conveyed him straight to the house of Monsieur de Villefort. An hour afterwards, the carriage was again ordered, and this time it went to the Rue Fontaine Saint-Georges, and stopped at number five, where Lord Wilmore lived. The stranger had written to Lord Wilmore, requesting an interview which the latter had fixed for ten o'clock. As the envoy of the Prefect of Police arrived ten minutes before ten, he was told that Lord Wilmore, who was precision and punctuality personified, was not yet come in, but that he should be sure to return as the clock struck. The visitor was introduced into the drawing-room, which was like all other furnished drawing-rooms, a mantelpiece with two modern Sèvres vases, a timepiece representing Cupid with his bent bow, a mirror with an engraving on each side, one representing Homer carrying his guide, the other Belisarius begging, a greyish paper, red and black tapestry. Such was the appearance of Lord Wilmore's drawing-room. It was illuminated by lamps with ground-glass shades which gave only a feeble light, as if out of consideration for the envoy's weak sight. After ten minutes' expectation, the clock struck ten. At the fifth stroke, the door opened, and Lord Wilmore appeared. He was rather above the middle height, with thin reddish whiskers, light complexion and light hair, turning rather grey. He was dressed with all the English peculiarity, namely in a blue coat with gilt buttons and high collar in the fashion of 1811, a white kerseymere waistcoat and nankeen pantaloons, three inches too short, but which were prevented by straps from slipping up to the knee. His first remark on entering was, oh, You know, sir, I do not speak French. I know you do not like to converse in our language, replied the envoy. But you may use it replied Lord Wilmore. I understand it. And I, replied the visitor, changing his idiom, know enough of English to keep up the conversation. Do not put yourself to the slightest inconvenience. Oh, said Lord Wilmore, with that tone which is only known to natives of Great Britain. The envoy presented his letter of introduction, which the latter read with English coolness, and having finished, "'I understand,' said he, "'perfectly.' Then began the questions, which were similar to those which had been addressed to the Abbé Bussoni. But as Lord Wilmore, in the character of the Count's enemy, was less restrained in his answers, they were more numerous. He described the youth of Monte Cristo, who, he said, at ten years of age, entered the service of one of the petty sovereigns of India, who made war on the English.' It was there Wilmore had first met him and fought against him. And in that war, Zacon had been taken prisoner, sent to England, and consigned to the hulks, whence he had escaped by swimming. 
Then began his travels, his duels, his caprice. Then the insurrection in Greece broke out, and he had served in the Grecian ranks. While in that service he had discovered a silver mine in the mountains of Thessaly, but he had been careful to conceal it from everyone. After the Battle of Navarino, when the Greek government was consolidated, he asked of King Otho a mining grant for that district, which was given him. Hence that immense fortune which, in Lord Wilmore's opinion, possibly amounted to one or two millions per annum, a precarious fortune which might be momentarily lost by the failure of the mine. But, asked the visitor, do you know why he came to France? He is speculating in railways, said Lord Wilmore, and as he is an expert chemist and physicist, he has invented a new system of telegraphy, which he is seeking to bring to perfection. How much does he spend a yearly? asked the prefect. Not more than five or six hundred thousand francs, said Lord Wilmore. He is a miser. Hatred evidently inspired the Englishman, who, knowing no other reproach to bring on the Count, accused him of avarice. Do you know his house at Auteuil? Certainly. What do you know respecting it? Do you wish to know why he bought it? Yes. The Count is a speculator, who will certainly ruin himself in experiments. He supposes there is in the neighbourhood of the house he has bought a mineral spring equal to those at Bagnères, Luchon, Cateret. He is going to turn his house into a bath house, as the Germans term it. He has already dug up all the garden two or three times to find the famous spring, and being unsuccessful, he will soon purchase all the contiguous houses. Now, as I dislike him and hope his railway, his electric telegraph, or his search for baths will ruin him, I am watching for his discomfiture, which must soon take place. What was the cause of your quarrel? When he was in England, he seduced the wife of one of my friends. Why do you not seek revenge? I have already fought three duels with him said the Englishman, the first with the pistol, the second with the sword, and the third with the sabre. And what was the result of those duels? The first time he broke my arm, the second he wounded me in the breast, and the third time made this large wound. The Englishman turned down his shirt collar and showed a scar whose redness proved it to be a recent one. So that, you see, there is a deadly feud between us. But, said the envoy, you do not go about it in the right way to kill him, if I understand you correctly. Oh, said the Englishman, I practice shooting every day, and every other day Grisier comes to my house. This was all the visitor wished to ascertain, or rather all the Englishman appeared to know. The agent arose, and having bowed to Lord Wilmore, who returned his salutation with the stiff politeness of the English, he retired. Lord Wilmore, having heard the door close after him, returned to his bedroom, where with one hand he pulled off his light hair, his red whiskers, his false jaw, and his wound, to resume the black hair, dark complexion, and pearly teeth of the Count of Monte Cristo. It was Monsieur de Villefort, and not the prefect, who returned to the house of Monsieur de Villefort. The procureur felt more at ease, although he had learned nothing really satisfactory. And for the first time since the dinner party at Auteuil, he slept soundly. End of chapter 69 Chapter 70 The Ball it was in the warmest days of July, when in due course of time the Saturday arrived upon which the ball was to take place at Monsieur de Morcerf's. It was ten o'clock at night. The branches of the great trees in the garden of the Count's house stood out boldly against the azure canopy of heaven, which was studded with golden stars, but where the last fleeting clouds of a vanishing storm yet lingered. From the apartments on the ground floor might be heard the sound of music with the whirl of the waltz and gallop, 
while brilliant streams of light shone through the openings of the venetian blinds at this moment the garden was only occupied by about ten servants who had just received orders from their mistress to prepare the supper the serenity of the weather continuing to increase until now it had been undecided whether the supper should take place in the dining-room or under a long tent erected on the lawn but the beautiful blue sky studded with stars had settled the question in favor of the lawn the gardens were illuminated with colored lanterns according to the italian custom and as is usual in countries where the luxuries of the table the rarest of all luxuries in their complete form are well understood the supper table was loaded with wax lights and flowers at the time the countess of morcerf returned to the rooms after giving her orders many guests were arriving more attracted by the charming hospitality of the countess than by the distinguished position of the count for owing to the good taste of mercedes one was sure of finding some devices at her entertainment worthy of describing or even copying in case of need madame danglars in whom the events we have related had caused deep anxiety had hesitated about going to madame de morcerf's when during the morning her carriage happened to meet that of villefort the latter made a sign and when the carriages had drawn close together said you are going to madame de morcerf's are you not no replied madame Longlar. i am too ill you are wrong replied villefort significantly it is important that you should be seen there do you think so asked the baroness i do in that case i will go and the two carriages passed on towards their different destinations madame danglars therefore came not only beautiful in person but radiant with splendor she entered by one door at the time when mercedes appeared at the door the countess took albert to meet madame danglars he approached paid her some well-merited compliments on her toilet and offered his arm to conduct her to her seat albert looked around him you are looking for my daughter said the baroness smiling i confess it replied albert could you have been so cruel as not to bring her calm yourself she has met mademoiselle de villefort and has taken her arm see they are following us both in white dresses one with a bouquet of camellias the other with one of miosotis but tell me well what do you wish to know will not the count of monte cristo be here to-night seventeen replied albert what do you mean i only mean that the count seems the rage replied the viscount smiling and that you are the seventeenth person that has asked me the same question the count is in fashion i congratulate him upon it and have you replied to every one as you have to me ah to be sure i have not answered you be satisfied we shall have this lion we are among the privileged ones were you at the opera yesterday no he was there ah indeed and did, did the eccentric person commit any new originality can he be seen without doing so elsler was dancing in the diable boiteux the greek princess was in ecstasies after the cachucha he placed a magnificent ring on the stem of a bouquet and threw it to the charming dancers who in the third act to do honor to the gift reappeared with it on her finger and the greek princess will she be here no you will be deprived of that pleasure her position in the count's establishment is not sufficiently understood wait leave me here and go and speak to madame de villefort who is trying to attract your attention albert bowed to madame danglars and advanced towards madame de villefort whose lips opened as he approached i wager anything said albert interrupting her that i know what you are about to say well what is it if i guess rightly will you confess it yes on your honor on my honor you were going to ask me if the count of monte cristo had arrived or was expected 
"'Not at all. It is not of him that I am now thinking. I was going to ask you if you had received any news of Monsieur France. "'Yes, yesterday.' "'What did he tell you?' "'That he was leaving at the same time as his letter.' "'Well, now then, the Count?' "'The Count will come, of that you may be satisfied.' "'You know that he has another name besides Monte Cristo?' "'No, I did not know it. "'Monte Cristo is the name of an island, and he has a family name.' "'I never heard it.' "'Well, then, I am better informed than you. "'His name is Zacone. "'It is possible. "'He is Maltese. "'That is also possible.' the son of a ship-owner. Really, you should relate all this aloud. You would have the greatest success. He served in India, discovered a mine in Thessaly, and comes to Paris to establish a mineral water cure at Auteuil. Well, I am sure, said Morcerf, this is indeed news. Am I allowed to repeat it? Yes, but cautiously. Tell one thing at a time, and do not say I told you. "'Why so?' "'Because it is a secret just discovered.' "'By whom?' "'The police.' "'Then the news originated at the prefect's last night. "'Paris, you can understand, is astonished at the sight of such unusual splendour, "'and the police have made inquiries. "'Well, well, nothing more is wanting than to arrest the Count as a vagabond "'on the pretext of his being too rich.' "'Indeed, that doubtless would have happened if his credentials had not been so favourable. "'Poor Count! And is he aware of the danger he has been in?' "'I think not.' "'Then it will be but charitable to inform him when he arrives. I will not fail to do so.' Just then a handsome young man with bright eyes, black hair, and glossy moustache respectfully bowed to Madame de Villefort. Albert extended his hand. Madame, said Albert, allow me to present to you Monsieur Maximilian Morel, captain of Spahis, one of our best, and above all of our bravest officers. I have already had the pleasure of meeting this gentleman at Auteuil, at the house of the Count of Monte Cristo, replied Madame de Villefort, turning away with marked coldness of manner. This answer, and especially the tone in which it was uttered, chilled the heart of poor Morel. But a recompense was in store for him. Turning around, he saw near the door a beautiful fair face, whose large blue eyes were without any marked expression fixed upon him, while the bouquet of Myosotis was gently raised to her lips. The salutation was so well understood that Morel, with the same expression in his eyes, placed his handkerchief to his mouth, and these two living statues, whose hearts beat so violently under their marble aspect, separated from each other by the whole length of the room, forgot themselves for a moment, or rather forgot the world in their mutual contemplation. They might have remained much longer lost in one another without any one noticing their abstraction. The Count of Monte Cristo had just entered." We have already said that there was something in the Count which attracted universal attention wherever he appeared. It was not the coat, unexceptional in its cut, though simple and unornamented. It was not the plain white waistcoat. It was not the trousers that displayed the foot so perfectly formed. It was none of these things that attracted the attention. It was his pale complexion, his waving black hair, his calm and serene expression, his dark and melancholy eye, his mouth, chiselled with such marvellous delicacy, which so easily expressed such high disdain, these were what fixed the attention of all upon him. Many men might have been handsomer, but certainly there could be none whose appearance was more significant, if the expression may be used. Everything about the Count seemed to have its meaning, for the constant habit of thought which he had acquired had given an ease and vigour to the expression of his face, and even to the most trifling gesture, scarcely to be understood. 
yet the parisian world is so strange that even all this might not have won attention had there not been connected with it a mysterious story gilded by an immense fortune meanwhile he advanced through the assemblage of guests under a battery of curious glances towards madame de morcerf who standing before a mantelpiece ornamented with flowers had seen his entrance in a looking-glass placed opposite the door and was prepared to receive him she turned towards him with a serene smile just at the moment he was bowing to her no doubt she fancied the count would speak to her while on his side the count thought she was about to address him but both remained silent and after a mere bow monte cristo directed his steps to albert who received him cordially have you seen my mother asked albert i have just had the pleasure replied the count but i have not seen your father see he is down there talking politics with that little group of great geniuses indeed said monte cristo and so those gentlemen down there are men of great talent i should not have guessed it and for what kind of talent are they celebrated you know there are different sorts the tall harsh looking man is very learned he discovered in the neighborhood of rome a kind of lizard with a vertebra more than lizards usually have and he immediately laid his discovery before the institute the thing was discussed for a long time but finally decided in his favor i can assure you the vertebra made a great noise in the learned world and the gentleman who was only a knight of the legion of honor was made an officer come said monte cristo this cross seems to me to be wisely awarded i suppose had he found another additional vertebra they would have made him a commander very likely said albert and who can that person be who has taken it in his head to wrap himself up in a blue coat embroidered with green oh that coat is not his own it is the republics which deputed david to devise a uniform for the academicians indeed said monte cristo so this gentleman is an academician within the last week he has been made one of the learned assembly and what is his special talent his talent i believe he thrusts pins through the heads of rabbits he makes fowls eat madder and punches the spinal marrow out of dogs with whalebone and he is made a member of the academy of sciences for this no of the french academy but what has the french academy to do with all this i was going to tell you it seems that his experiments have very considerably advanced the cause of science doubtless no that his style of writing is very good this must be very flattering to the feelings of the rabbits into whose heads he has thrust pins to the fowls whose bones he has dyed red and to the dogs whose spinal marrow he has punched out albert laughed and the other one demanded the count that one yes the third the one in the dark blue coat yes he is a colleague of the count and one of the most active opponents to the idea of providing the chamber of peers with a uniform he was very successful upon that question he stood badly with the liberal papers but his noble opposition to the wishes of the court is now getting him into favor with the journalists they talk of making him an ambassador and what are his claims to the peerage he has composed two or three comic operas written four or five articles in the siècle and voted five or six years on the ministerial side bravo viscount said monte cristo smiling you are a delightful cicerone and now you will do me a favor will you not what is it do not introduce me to any of these gentlemen and should they wish it you will warn me just then the count felt his arm pressed he turned round it was Danglars. ah is it you baron said he why do you call me baron said Danglars. you know that i care nothing for my title 
I am not like you, Viscount. You like your title, do you not? Certainly, replied Albert, seeing that without my title I should be nothing, while you, sacrificing the baron, would still remain the millionaire. Which seems to me the finest title under the royalty of July, replied Danglars. Unfortunately, said Monte Cristo, one's title to a millionaire does not last for life, like that of baron, peer of France, or academician, for example, the millionaires Frank and Pullman of Frankfurt, who have just become bankrupts. Indeed, said Danglars, becoming pale. Yes, I received the news this evening by a courier. I had about a million in their hands, but warned in time, I withdrew it a month ago. Ah, mon Dieu! exclaimed Danglars. They have drawn on me for two hundred thousand francs. Well, you can throw out the draft. Their signature is worth five per cent. Yes, but it is too late, said Danglars. I have honoured their bills. Then, said Monte Cristo, here are two hundred thousand francs gone after. Hush! Do not mention these things, said Danglars. Then, approaching Monte Cristo, he added, especially before young Monsieur Cavalcanti. After which he smiled and turned towards the young man in question. Albert had left the count to speak to his mother. Danglars to converse with young Cavalcanti. Monte Cristo was for an instant alone. Meanwhile, the heat became excessive. The footmen were hastening through rooms with waiters loaded with ices. Monte Cristo wiped the perspiration from his forehead, but drew back when the waiter was presented to him. He took no refreshment. Madame de Morcerf did not lose sight of Monte Cristo. She saw that he took nothing, and even noticed his gesture of refusal. Albert, she asked, did you notice that? What, mother? That the Count has never been willing to partake of food under the roof of Monsieur de Morcerf. Yes, but then he breakfasted with me. Indeed, he made his first appearance in the world on that occasion. But your house is not Monsieur de Morcerf's, murmured Mercedes. And since he has been here, I have watched him. Well? Well, he has taken nothing yet. The Count is very temperate. Mercedes smiled sadly. Approach him, said she, and when the next waiter passes, insist upon his taking something. But why, mother? Just to please me, Albert, said Mercedes. Albert kissed his mother's hand and drew near the Count. Another salver passed, loaded like the preceding ones. She saw Albert attempt to persuade the Count, but he obstinately refused. Albert rejoined his mother. She was very pale. Well, said she, you see he refuses. Yes, but why need this annoy you? You know, Albert, women are singular creatures. I should like to have seen the Count take something in my house, if only an ice. Perhaps he cannot reconcile himself to the French style of living, and might prefer something else. Oh, no, I have seen him eat of everything in Italy. No doubt he does not feel inclined this evening. And besides, said the Countess, accustomed as he is to burning climates, possibly he does not feel the heat as we do. I do not think that, for he has complained of feeling almost suffocated, and asked why the Venetian blinds were not opened as well as the windows. In a word, said Mercedes, it was a way of assuring me that his abstinence was intended. And she left the room. A minute afterwards the blinds were thrown open, and through the jessamine and clematis that overhung the window one could see the garden ornamented with lanterns, and the supper laid under the tent. Dancers, players, talkers, all uttered an exclamation of joy. Every one inhaled with delight the breeze that floated in. At the same time, Mercedes reappeared, paler than before, but with that imperturbable expression of countenance which she sometimes wore. She went straight to the group of which her husband formed the centre. "'Do not detain these gentlemen here, Count,' said she. "'They would prefer 
i should think to breathe in the garden rather than suffocate here since they are not playing ah oh, said a gallant old general who in eighteen o nine had sung partan pour la syrie we will not go alone to the garden then said mercedes i will lead the way turning towards monte cristo she added count will you oblige me with your arm the count almost staggered at these simple words then he fixed his eyes on mercedes it was only a momentary glance but it seemed to the countess to have lasted for a century so much was expressed in that one look he offered his arm to the countess she took it or rather just touched it with her little hand and they together descended the steps lined with rhododendrons and camellias behind them by another outlet a group of about twenty persons rushed into the garden with loud exclamations of delight end of chapter seventy chapter seventy one bread and salt madame de morcerf entered an archway of trees with her companion it led through a grove of lindens to a conservatory it was too warm in the room was it not count she asked yes madame and it was an excellent idea of yours to open the doors and the blinds as he ceased speaking the count felt the hand of mercedes tremble but you he said with that light dress and without anything to cover you but that gauze scarf perhaps you feel cold do you know where i am leading you said the countess without replying to the question no madame replied monte cristo but you see i make no resistance we are going to the greenhouse that you see at the other end of the grove the count looked at mercedes as if to interrogate her but she continued to walk on in silence and he refrained from speaking they reached the building ornamented with magnificent fruits which ripen at the beginning of july in the artificial temperature which takes the place of the sun so frequently absent in our climate the countess left the arm of monte cristo and gathered a bunch of muscatel grapes see count she said with a smile so sad in its expression that one could almost detect the tears on her eyelids see our french grapes are not to be compared i know with yours of sicily and cyprus but you will make allowance for our northern sun the count bowed but stepped back do you refuse said mercedes in a tremulous voice pray excuse me madame replied monte cristo but i never eat muscatel grapes mercedes let them fall and sighed a magnificent peach was hanging against an adjoining wall ripened by the same artificial heat mercedes drew near and plucked the fruit take this peach then she said the count again refused what again she exclaimed in so plaintive an accent that it seemed to stifle a sob really you pain me a long silence followed the peach like the grapes fell to the ground count added mercedes with a supplicating glance there is a beautiful arabian custom which makes eternal friends of those who have eaten together bread and salt under the same roof i know it madame replied the count but we are in france and are not in arabia and in france eternal friendships are as rare as the custom of dividing bread and salt with one another but said the countess breathlessly with her eyes fixed on monte cristo whose arm she convulsively pressed with both hands we are friends are we not the count became pale as death the blood rushed to his heart and then again rising dyed his cheeks with crimson his eyes swam like those of a man suddenly dazzled certainly we are friends he replied why should we not be the answer was so little like the one mercedes desired that she turned away to give vent to a sigh 
which sounded more like a groan. "'Thank you,' she said, and they walked on again. They went the whole length of the garden without uttering a word. "'Sir,' suddenly exclaimed the countess, after their walk had continued ten minutes in silence, "'is it true that you have seen so much, travelled so far, and suffered so deeply?' "'I have suffered deeply, madame,' answered Monte Cristo. "'But now you are happy?' "'Doubtless,' replied the Count, "'since no one hears me complain.' "'And your present happiness, has it softened your heart?' "'My present happiness equals my past misery,' said the Count. "'Are you not married?' asked the Countess. "'I married?' exclaimed Monte Cristo, shuddering. "'Who could have told you so?' "'No one told me you were, but you have frequently been seen at the opera with a young and lovely woman.' "'She is a slave whom I bought at Constantinople, madame, the daughter of a prince. I have adopted her as my daughter, having no one else to love in the world.' "'You live alone, then?' "'I do.' "'You have no sister, no son, no father?' "'I have no one.' "'How can you exist thus, without any one to attach you to life?' "'It is not my fault, madame. "'At Malta I loved a young girl, was on the point of marrying her, "'when war came and carried me away. "'I thought she loved me well enough to wait for me, "'and even to remain faithful to my memory.' When I returned, she was married. This is the history of most men who have passed twenty years of age. Perhaps my heart was weaker than the hearts of most men, and I suffered more than they could have done in my place. That is all. The countess stopped for a moment, as if gasping for breath. Yes, she said, and you have still preserved this love in your heart. One can only love once— "'And did you ever see her again?' "'Never.' "'Never?' "'I never returned to the country where she lived.' "'To Malta?' "'Yes, Malta.' "'She is then now at Malta?' "'I think so.' "'And have you forgiven her for all she has made you suffer?' "'Her, yes. "'But only her.' "'Do you then still hate those who separated you?' "'I hate them?' "'Not at all. Why should I?' The countess placed herself before Monte Cristo, still holding in her hand a portion of the perfumed grapes. "'Take some,' she said. "'Madam, I never eat muscatel grapes,' replied Monte Cristo, as if the subject had not been mentioned before. The countess dashed the grapes into the nearest thicket with a gesture of despair. "'Inflexible man!' she murmured. Monte Cristo remained as unmoved as if the reproach had not been addressed to him. Albert at this moment ran in. "'Oh, mother!' he exclaimed. "'Such a misfortune has happened!' "'What? What has happened?' asked the countess, as though awakening from a sleep to the realities of life. "'Did you say a misfortune? Indeed, I should expect misfortunes. Monsieur de Villefort is here. Well? He comes to fetch his wife and daughter. Why so? Because Madame de saint Maron has just arrived in Paris, bringing the news of Monsieur de saint Maron's death, which took place on the first stage after he left Marseille. Madame de Villefort, who was in very good spirits, would neither believe nor think of the misfortune, but Mademoiselle Valentine, at the first words, guessed the whole truth, notwithstanding all the precautions of her father. The blow struck her like a thunderbolt, and she fell senseless. "'And how was Monsieur de saint Méran related to Mademoiselle de Villefort?' said the Count. "'He was her grandfather on the mother's side.' "'He was coming here to hasten her marriage with France.' "'Ah, indeed. "'So France must wait. "'Why was not Monsieur de saint Méran also grandfather to Mademoiselle Danglars?' 
Albert, Albert, said Madame de Morcerf, in a tone of mild reproof, what are you saying? Ah, oh, Count, he esteems you so highly. Tell him that he has spoken amiss. And she took two or three steps forward. Monte Cristo watched her with an air so thoughtful and so full of affectionate admiration that she turned back and grasped his hand. At the same time she seized that of her son and joined them together. "'We are friends, are we not?' she asked. "'Oh, madame, I do not presume to call myself your friend, but at all times I am your most respectful servant.' The countess left with an indescribable pang in her heart, and before she had taken ten steps, the count saw her raise her handkerchief to her eyes. "'Do not my mother and you agree?' asked Albert, astonished. "'On the contrary,' replied the count. "'Did you not hear her declare that we were friends?' They re-entered the drawing-room, which Valentine and Madame de Villefort had just quitted, it is perhaps needless to add that Morel departed almost at the same time. End of chapter 71 Chapter 72 Madame de Saint-Méran A gloomy scene had indeed just passed at the house of Monsieur de Villefort. After the ladies had departed for the ball, whither all the entreaties of Madame de Villefort had failed in persuading him to accompany them, the procureur had shut himself up in his study, according to his custom, with a heap of papers calculated to alarm anyone else, but which generally scarcely satisfied his inordinate desires. But this time the papers were a mere matter of form. Villefort had secluded himself, not to study, but to reflect and with the door locked and orders given that he should not be disturbed excepting for important business, he sat down in his armchair and began to ponder over the events, the remembrance of which had during the last eight days filled his mind with so many gloomy thoughts and bitter re recollections. Then, instead of plunging into the mass of documents piled before him, he opened the drawer of his desk, touched a spring, and drew out a parcel of cherished memoranda, amongst which he had carefully arranged in characters only known to himself, the names of all those who either in his political career, in money matters, at the bar, or in his mysterious love affairs, had become his enemies. Their number was formidable. Now that he had begun to fear, and yet these names, powerful though they were, had often caused him to smile with the same kind of satisfaction experienced by a traveller who from the summit of a mountain beholds at his feet the craggy eminences, the almost impassable paths, and the fearful chasms through which he has so perilously climbed. When he had run over all those names in his memory, again read and studied them, commenting meanwhile upon his lists, he shook his head. No, he murmured, none of my enemies would have waited so patiently and laboriously for so long a space of time that they might now come and crush me with this secret. Sometimes, as Hamlet says, foul deeds will rise, though all the earth overwhelm them to men's eyes. But, like a phosphoric light, they rise but to mislead. The story has been told by the Corsican to some priest, who in his turn has repeated it. Monsieur de Monte Cristo may have heard it, and to enlighten himself, but why should he wish to enlighten himself upon the subject? asked Villefort, after a moment's reflection. What interest can this Monsieur de Monte Cristo, or Monsieur Zaccone, son of a shipowner of Malta, discoverer of a mine in Thessaly, now visiting Paris for the first time? What interest, I say, can he take in discovering a gloomy, mysterious, and useless fact like this? However, among all the incoherent details given to me by the Abbe Bussoni, and by Lord Wilmore, by that friend and that enemy, one thing appears certain and clear in my opinion, that in no period, in no case, in no circumstance, could there have been any contact between him and me. 
but Villefort uttered words which even he himself did not believe. He dreaded not so much the revelation, for he could reply to or deny its truth. He cared little for that mean, tickle, upharsin, which appeared suddenly in letters of blood upon the wall. But what he was really anxious for was to discover whose hand had traced them. While he was endeavouring to calm his fears, and instead of dwelling upon the political future that had so often been the subject of his ambitious dreams, was imagining a future limited to the enjoyments of home, in fear of awakening the enemy that had so long slept, the noise of a carriage sounded in the yard. Then he heard the steps of an aged person ascending the stairs, followed by tears and lamentations, such as servants always give vent to when they wish to appear interested in their master's grief. He drew back the bolt of his door, and almost directly an old lady entered, unannounced, carrying her shawl on her arm and her bonnet in her hand. The white hair was thrown back from her yellow forehead, and her eyes, already sunken by the furrows of age, now almost disappeared beneath the eyelids, swollen with grief. "'Oh, sir,' she said, "'oh, sir, what a misfortune! I shall die of it! Oh, yes, I shall certainly die of it!' And then, falling upon the chair nearest the door, she burst into a paroxysm of sobs. The servants standing in the doorway, not daring to approach, Nero were looking at Noirtier's old servant, who had heard the noise from his master's room, and run there also, remaining behind the others. Villefort rose and ran towards his mother-in-law, for it was she. "'Why, what can have happened?' he exclaimed. "'What has thus disturbed you? Is Monsieur de saint Maron with you?' "'Monsieur de saint Maron is dead!' answered the old marchioness, without preface and without expression. She appeared to be stupefied. Villefort drew back, and clasping his hands together, exclaimed, "'Dead? So suddenly?' "'A week ago,' continued Madame de saint Maron, "'we went out together in the carriage after dinner. Monsieur de saint Maron had been unwell for some days. Still, the idea of seeing our dear Valentine again inspired him with courage, and notwithstanding his illness, he would leave. At six leagues from Marseilles, after having eaten some of the lozenge he is accustomed to take, he fell into such a deep sleep that it appeared to me unnatural. Still, I hesitated to wake him, although I fancied that his face was flushed, and that the veins of his temple throbbed more violently than usual. However, as it became dark, and I could no longer see, I fell asleep. I was soon aroused by a piercing shriek, as from a person suffering in his dreams, and he suddenly threw his head back violently. I called the valet, I stopped the postilion, I spoke to Monsieur de saint Meran. I applied my smelling salts. But all was over, and I arrived at Aix, by the side of a corpse. Villefort stood with his mouth half open, quite stupefied. Of course you sent for a doctor? Immediately. But as I have told you, it was too late. Yes, but then he could tell of what complaint the poor Marquis had died. Oh, yes, sir. He told me. It appears to have been an apoplectic stroke. And what did you do then? Monsieur de saint Meran had always expressed a desire, in case his death happened during his absence from Paris, that his body might be brought to the family vault. I had him put into a leaden coffin, and I am preceding him by a few days. Oh, my poor mother, said Villefort, to have such duties to perform at your age after such a blow. God has supported me through all. And then, my dear Marquis, he would certainly have done everything for me that I perform for him. It is true that since I left him, I seem to have lost my senses. I cannot cry. At my age they say that we have no more tears. Still, I think that 
when one is in trouble one should have the power of weeping where is valentine sir it is on her account i am here i wish to see valentine villefort thought it would be terrible to reply that valentine was at a ball so he only said that she had gone out with her stepmother and that she should be fetched this instant sir this instant i beseech you said the old lady villefort placed the arm of madame de saint Maron within his own and conducted her to his apartment rest yourself mother he said the marchioness raised her head at this word and beholding the man who so forcibly reminded her of her deeply regretted child who still lived for her in valentine she felt touched at the name of mother and bursting into tears she fell on her knees before an armchair where she buried her venerable head villefort left her to the care of the women while old barois ran half scared to his master for nothing frightens old people so much as when death relaxes its vigilance over them for a moment in order to strike some other old person then while madame de saint Maron remained on her knees praying fervently villefort sent for a cab and went himself to fetch his wife and daughter from madame de morcerf's he was so pale when he appeared at the door of the ballroom that valentine ran to him saying oh father some misfortune has happened your grandmamma has just arrived valentine said m de villefort and grandpapa inquired the young girl trembling with apprehension m de villefort only replied by offering his arm to his daughter it was just in time for valentine's head swam and she staggered madame de villefort instantly hastened to her assistance and aided her husband in dragging her to the carriage saying what a singular event who could have thought it ah yes it is indeed strange and the wretched family departed leaving a cloud of sadness hanging over the rest of the evening at the foot of the stairs valentine found barois awaiting her monsieur noirtier wishes to see you to-night he said in an undertone tell him i will come when i leave my dear grandmamma she replied feeling with true delicacy that the person to whom she could be of the most service just then was madame de saint Maron. valentine found her grandmother in bed silent caresses heart-wrung sobs broken sighs burning tears were all that passed in this sad interview while madame de villefort leaning on her husband's arm maintained all outward forms of respect at least towards the poor widow she soon whispered to her husband i think it would be better for me to retire with your permission for the sight of me appears still to afflict your mother-in-law madame de saint Maron heard her yes yes she said softly to valentine let her leave but do you stay madame de villefort left and valentine remained alone beside the bed for the procureur overcome with astonishment at the unexpected death had followed his wife meanwhile barois had returned for the first time to old noirtier who having heard the noise in the house had as we have said sent his old servant to inquire the cause on his return his quick intelligent eye interrogated the messenger alas sir exclaimed barois a great misfortune has happened madame de saint Maron has arrived and her husband is dead m de saint Maron and noirtier had never been on strict terms of friendship still the death of one old man always considerably affects another noirtier let his head fall upon his chest apparently overwhelmed and thoughtful then he closed one eye in token of inquiry mademoiselle valentine noirtier nodded his head she is at the ball as you know since she came to say good-bye to you in full dress noirtier again closed his left eye do you wish to see her noirtier again made an affirmative sign well they have gone to fetch her no doubt from madame de morcerf's i will await her return and beg her to come up here is that what you wish for 
yes replied the invalid barois therefore as we have seen watched for valentine and informed her of her grandfather's wish consequently valentine came up to noirtier on leaving madame de saint meron who in the midst of her grief had at last yielded to fatigue and fallen into a feverish sleep within reach of her hand they placed a small table upon which stood a bottle of orangeade her usual beverage and a glass then as we have said the young girl left the bedside to see monsieur noirtier valentine kissed the old man who looked at her with such tenderness that her eyes again filled with tears whose sources he thought must be exhausted the old gentleman continued to dwell upon her with the same expression yes yes said valentine you mean that i have yet a kind grandfather left do you not the old man intimated that such was his meaning ah oh, yes happily i have replied valentine without that what would become of me it was one o'clock in the morning barois who wished to go to bed himself observed that after such sad events every one stood in need of rest noirtier would not say that the only rest he needed was to see his child but wished her a good night for grief and fatigue had made her appear quite ill the next morning she found her grandmother in bed the fever had not abated on the contrary her eyes glistened and she appeared to be suffering from violent nervous irritability oh dear grandmamma are you worse exclaimed valentine perceiving all these signs of agitation no my child no said madame de saint meron but i was impatiently waiting for your arrival that i might send for your father my father inquired valentine uneasily yes i wish to speak to him valentine durst not oppose her grandmother's wish the cause of which she did not know and an instant afterwards villefort entered sir said madame de saint meron without using any circumlocution and as if fearing she had no time to lose you wrote to me concerning the marriage of this child yes madame replied villefort it is not only projected but arranged your intended son-in-law is named monsieur franz d'epinay yes madame is he not the son of general d'epinay who was under our side and who was assassinated some days before the usurper returned from the island of elba the same does he not dislike the idea of marrying the granddaughter of a jacobin our civil dissensions are now happily extinguished mother said villefort monsieur d'epinay was quite a child when his father died he knows very little of monsieur noirtier and will meet him if not with pleasure at least with indifference is it a suitable match in every respect and the young man is regarded with universal esteem you approve of him he is one of the most well-bred young men i know during the whole of this conversation valentine had remained silent well sir said madame de saint meron after a few minutes reflection i must hasten the marriage for i have but a short time to live you madame you dear mamma exclaimed monsieur de villefort and valentine at the same time i know what i am saying continued the marchioness i must hurry you so that as she has no mother she may at least have a grandmother to bless her marriage i am all that is left to her belonging to my poor rene whom you have so soon forgotten sir oh madame said villefort you forget that i was obliged to give a mother to my child a stepmother is never a mother sir but this is not to the purpose our business concerns valentine let us leave the dead in peace all this was said with such exceeding rapidity that there was something in the conversation that seemed like the beginning of delirium it shall be as you wish madame said villefort more especially since your wishes coincide with mine and as soon as monsieur d'epinay arrives in paris 
"'My dear grandmother,' interrupted Valentine, "'consider decorum, the recent death. "'You would not have me marry under such sad auspices.' "'My child!' exclaimed the old lady sharply. "'Let us hear none of the conventional objections "'that deter weak minds from preparing for the future. "'I also was married at the deathbed of my mother, "'and certainly I have not been less happy on that account.' "'Still, that idea of death, madame,' said Villefort. "'Still, always. I tell you, I am going to die. Do you understand? Well, before dying, I wish to see my son-in-law. I wish to tell him to make my child happy. I wish to read in his eyes whether he intends to obey me. In fact, I will know him. I will,' continued the old lady with a fearful expression, that I may rise from the depths of my grave to find him, if he should not fulfil his duty. Madame, said Villefort, you must lay aside these exalted ideas, which almost assume the appearance of madness. The dead, once buried in their graves, rise no more. And I tell you, sir, that you are mistaken. This night I have had a fearful sleep, it seemed as though my soul were already hovering over my body. My eyes, which I tried to open, closed against my will. And what will appear impossible above all to you, sir, I saw, with my eyes shut, in the spot where you are now standing, issuing from that corner where there is a door leading into Madame Villefort's dressing-room. I saw, I tell you, silently enter a white figure. Valentine screamed. "'It was the fever that disturbed you, madame,' said Villefort. "'Doubt, if you please, but I am sure of what I say. I saw a white figure, and as if to prevent my discrediting the testimony of only one of my senses, I heard my glass removed, the same which is there now on the table.' "'Oh, dear mother, it was a dream.' So little was it a dream that I stretched my hand toward the bell, but when I did so, the shade disappeared, my maid then entered with a light. But she saw no one. Phantoms are visible to those only who ought to see them. It was the soul of my husband. Well, if my husband's soul can come to me, why should not my soul appear? to guard my granddaughter. The tie is even more direct, it seems to me. Oh, madame, said Villefort, deeply affected in spite of himself, do not yield to these gloomy thoughts. You will long live with us, happy, loved, and honoured, and we will make you forget. Never, 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 said the marchioness. When does Monsieur Depinay return? We expect him every moment. It is well. As soon as he arrives, inform me. We must be expeditious. And then I also wish to see a notary, that I may be assured that all our property returns to Valentine. Oh, Grandmamma, murmured Valentine, pressing her lips on the burning brow. Do you wish to kill me? Oh, how feverish you are. We must not send for a notary, but for a doctor. A doctor? said she, shrugging her shoulders. "'I am not ill. I am thirsty, that is all.' "'What are you drinking, dear grandmamma? "'The same as usual, my dear. My glass is there, on the table. Give it to me, Valentine.' Valentine poured the orangeade into a glass and gave it to her grandmother, with a certain degree of dread. For it was the same glass, she fancied, that had been touched by the spectre. The marchioness drained the glass at a single draught, and then turned on her pillow, repeating, "'The notary! The notary!' Monsieur de Villefort left the room, and Valentine seated herself at the bedside of her grandmother. The poor child appeared herself to require the doctor she had recommended to her aged relative. A bright spot burned in either cheek. Her respiration was short and difficult, and her pulse beat with feverish excitement. She was thinking of the despair of Maximilian when he should be informed that Madame de Saint-Méran, instead of being an ally, 
was unconsciously acting as his enemy. More than once she thought of revealing all to her grandmother, and she would not have hesitated a moment if Maximilien Morel had been named Albert de Morcerf or Raoul de Chateaurenaud. But Morel was of plebeian extraction, and Valentine knew how the haughty Marquise de saint Meran despised all who were not noble. Her secret had each time been repressed when she was about to reveal it, by the sad conviction that it would be useless to do so. For were it were once discovered by her father and mother, all would be lost. Two hours passed thus. Madame de saint Meran was in a feverish sleep, and the notary had arrived. Though his coming was announced in a very low tone, Madame de saint Meran arose from her pillow. "'The notary!' she exclaimed. "'Let him come in!' The notary, who was at the door, immediately entered. "'Go, Valentine,' said Madame de saint Meran, "'and leave me with this gentleman.' "'But, Grandmama, leave me, go!' The young girl kissed her grandmother, and left with her handkerchief to her eyes. At the door she found the valet de chambre, who told her that the doctor was waiting in the dining-room. Valentine instantly ran down. The doctor was a friend of the family, and at the same time one of the cleverest men of the day, and very fond of Valentine, whose birth he had witnessed. He had himself a daughter about her age, but whose life was one continued source of anxiety and fear to him from her mother having been consumptive. "'Oh,' said Valentine, "'we have been waiting for you with such impatience, dear Monsieur d'Avigny. But first of all, how are Madeleine and Antoinette?' Madeleine was the daughter of Monsieur d'Avrigny, and Antoinette his niece. Monsieur d'Avrigny smiled sadly. "'Antoinette is very well,' he said. "'And Madeleine tolerably so. Uh, "'But you send for me, my dear child. "'It is not your father or Madame de Villefort who is ill. "'As for you, although we doctors cannot divest our patients of nerves, I fancy you have no further need of me than to recommend you not to allow your imagination to take too wide a field. Valentine coloured. M. d'Avrigny carried the science of divination almost to a miraculous extent, for he was one of the physicians who always work upon the body through the mind. No, she replied. It is for my dear grandmother. You know the calamity that has happened to us. "'Do you not?' "'I know nothing,' said Monsieur d'Arigny. "'Alas!' said Valentine, restraining her tears. "'My grandfather is dead.' "'Monsieur de saint Meran? "'Yes.' "'Suddenly?' "'From an apoplectic stroke.' "'An apoplectic stroke?' repeated the doctor. "'Yes, and my poor grandmother fancies that her husband—' whom she never left as called her, and that she must go and join him. Oh, Monsieur d'Avrigny, I beseech you, do something for her. Where is she? In her room with the notary. And Monsieur Noitier? Just as he was, his mind perfectly clear, but the same incapability of moving or speaking. And the same love for you, eh, my dear child? Yes, said Valentine. He was very fond of me. Who does not love you? Valentine smiled sadly. What are your grandmother's symptoms? An extreme nervous excitement, and a strangely agitated sleep. She fancied this morning in her sleep that her soul was hovering above her body, which she at the same time watched. It must have been delirium. She fancies, too, that she saw a phantom enter her chamber and even heard the noise it made on touching her glass. "'It is singular,' said the doctor. "'I was not aware that Madame de saint Meran was subject to such hallucinations.' "'It is the first time I have ever saw her in this condition,' said Valentine. "'And this morning she frightened me so that I thought her mad. "'And my father, who you know is a strong-minded man, "'himself appeared deeply impressed.' "'We will go and see,' said the doctor. "'What you tell me seems very strange.' The notary here descended, and Valentine was informed that her grandmother was alone. "'Go upstairs,' she said to the doctor. 
"'And you?' "'Oh, I dare not. She forbade me sending for you, and, as you say, I am myself agitated, feverish, and out of sorts. I will go and take a turn in the garden to recover myself.' The doctor pressed Valentine's hand, and while he visited her grandmother she descended the steps. We need not say which portion of the garden was her favourite walk. After remaining for a short time in the parterre surrounding the house, and gathering a rose to place in her waist or hair, she turned into the dark avenue which led to the bench. Then from the bench she went to the gate. As usual, Valentine strolled for a short time among her flowers, but without gathering them. The mourning in her heart forbade her assuming this simple ornament, though she had not yet had time to put on the outward semblance of woe. She then turned towards the avenue. As she advanced, she fancied she heard a voice speaking her name. She stopped, astonished. Then the voice reached her ear more distinctly, and she recognized it to be that of Maximilian. End of chapter 72 Chapter 73 The Promise it was, indeed, Maximilien Morel, who had passed a wretched existence since the previous day. With the instinct peculiar to lovers, he had anticipated after the return of Madame de saint Meran and the death of the Marquis that something would occur at Monsieur de Villefort's in connection with his attachment for Valentine. His presentiments were realized, as we shall see, and his uneasy forebodings had goaded him pale and trembling to the gate under the chestnut trees. Valentine was ignorant of the cause of this sorrow and anxiety, and as it was not his accustomed hour for visiting her, she had gone to the spot simply by accident, or perhaps through sympathy. Morel called her, and she ran to the gate. "'You are here at this hour,' said she. "'Yes, my poor girl,' replied Morel. "'I come to bring and to hear bad tidings.' "'This is indeed a house of mourning,' said Valentine. "'Speak, Maximilien, although the cup of sorrow seems already full.' "'Dear Valentine,' said Morel, endeavouring to conceal his own emotion, "'listen, I entreat you. What I am about to say is very serious. When are you to be married?' "'I will tell you all,' said Valentine. "'From you I have nothing to conceal. This morning the subject was introduced, and my dear grandmother—' on whom I have depended as my only support, not only declared herself favourable to it, but is so anxious for it that they only await the arrival of Monsieur d'Epinay, and the following day the contract will be signed. A deep sigh escaped the young man, who gazed long and mournfully at her he loved. Alas, replied he, it is dreadful thus to hear my condemnation from your own lips. The sentence is passed and in a few hours will be executed. It must be so, and I will not endeavour to prevent it. But since you say nothing remains but for Monsieur de Pinay to arrive, that the contract may be signed, and the following day you will be his. Tomorrow you will be engaged to Monsieur de Pinay, for he came this morning to Paris. Oh! Valentine uttered a cry. "'I was at the house of Monte Cristo an hour since,' said Morel. "'We were speaking, he of the sorrow your family had experienced, "'and I of your grief, when a carriage rolled into the courtyard. "'Never till then had I placed any confidence in presentiments, "'but now I cannot help believing them. "'At the sound of that carriage I shuddered. "'Soon I heard steps on the staircase, which terrified me as much as the footsteps of the commander did Don Juan. The door at last opened. Albert de Morcerf entered first, and I began to hope my fears were vain, when after him another young man advanced, and the Count exclaimed, "'Ah! here is the Baron Franz d'Epinay!' I summoned all my strength and courage to my support. Perhaps I turned pale and trembled, but certainly I smiled, and five minutes after I left, without having heard one word that had passed. "'Poor Maximilien,' 
murmured Valentine. Valentine, the time has arrived when you must answer me. And remember, my life depends on your answer. What do you intend doing? Valentine held down her head. She was overwhelmed. Listen, said Morel. It is not the first time you have contemplated our present position, which is a serious and urgent one. I do not think it is a moment to give way to useless sorrow. Leave that for those who like to suffer at their leisure and indulge their grief in secret. There are such in the world, and God will doubtless reward them in heaven for their resignation on earth. But those who mean to contend must not lose one precious moment, but first return immediately the blow which fortune strikes. Do you intend to struggle against our ill fortune? Tell me, Valentine, for it is that I came to know. Valentine trembled and looked at him with amazement. The idea of resisting her father, her grandmother, and all the family had never occurred to her. What do you say, Maximilien? asked Valentine. What do you mean by a struggle? Oh, it would be sacrilege. What? I resist my father's order and my dying grandmother's wish? Impossible! Morel started. You are too noble not to understand me, and you understand me so well that you already yield, dear Maximilien. No, no, I shall need all my strength to struggle with myself and support my grief in secret, as you say. But to grieve my father, to disturb my grandfather's last moments, never. You are right, said Morel calmly. In what a tone you speak, cried Valentine. I speak as one who admires you, mademoiselle. Mademoiselle? cried Valentine. Mademoiselle? Oh, selfish man! He sees me in despair and pretends he cannot understand me. You mistake. I understand you perfectly. You will not oppose Monsieur Villefort. You will not displease the Marchioness. And tomorrow you will sign the contract which will bind you to your husband. But, mon Dieu, tell me, how can I do otherwise? Do not appeal to me, mademoiselle. I shall be a bad judge in such a case. My selfishness will bind me, replied Morel whose low voice and clinched hands announced his growing desperation. "'What would you have proposed, Maximilian, had you found me willing to accede?' "'It is not for me to say.' "'You are wrong. You must advise me what to do.' "'Do you seriously ask my advice, Valentine?' "'Certainly, dear Maximilian, for if it is good, I will follow it.' You know my devotion to you. Valentine, said Morel, pushing aside a loose plank, give me your hand in token of forgiveness of my anger. My senses are confused, and during the last hour the most extravagant thoughts have passed through my brain. Oh, if you refuse my advice! What do you advise? said Valentine, raising her eyes to heaven and sighing. I am free said Maximilian, and rich enough to support you. I swear to make you my lawful wife before my lips even shall have approached your forehead. You make me tremble, said the young girl. Follow me, said Morel. I will take you to my sister, who is worthy also to be yours. We will embark for Algiers, for England, for America, or, if you prefer it, Retire to the country, and only return to Paris when our friends have reconciled your family. Valentine shook her head. I feared it, Maximilien, said she. It is the counsel of a madman, and I should be more mad than you did I not stop you at once with the word impossible, impossible. You will then submit to what fate decrees for you? "'without even attempting to contend with it?' said Morel sorrowfully. "'Yes, if I die.' "'Well, Valentine,' resumed Maximilian, "'I can only say again that you are right. "'Truly it is I who am mad, 
and you prove to me that passion blinds the most well-meaning. I appreciate your calm reasoning. It is then understood that to-morrow you will be irrevocably promised to Monsieur Franz d'Epinay, not only by that theatrical formality invented to heighten the effect of a comedy called the signature of the contract, but your own will? Again, you drive me to despair, Maximilian, said Valentine. Again, you plunge the dagger into the wound. What would you do, tell me, if your sister listened to such a proposition? Mademoiselle, replied Morel, with a bitter smile, I am selfish. You have already said so. And as a selfish man I think not of what others would do in my situation, but of what I intend doing myself. I think only that I have known you not a whole year. From the day I first saw you, all my hopes of happiness have been in securing your affection. One day you acknowledged that you loved me, and since that day my hope of future happiness has rested on obtaining you, for to gain you would be life to me. Now I think no more. I say only that fortune has turned against me. I had thought to gain heaven, and now I have lost it. It is an everyday occurrence for a gambler to lose not only what he possesses, but also what he has not. Morel pronounced these words with perfect calmness. Valentine looked at him a moment with her large, scrutinizing eyes, endeavouring not to let Morel discover the grief which struggled in her heart. "'But, in a word, what are you going to do?' asked she. "'I am going to have the honour of taking my leave of you, mademoiselle, solemnly assuring you that I wish your life may be so calm, so happy, and so full occupied, that there may be no place for me, even in your memory.' "'Oh!' murmured Valentine. Adieu, Valentine. Adieu, said Morel, bowing. Where are you going? cried the young girl, extending a hand through the opening and seizing Maximilian by his coat, for she understood from her own agitated feelings that her lover's calmness could not be real. Where are you going? I am going that I may not bring fresh trouble into your family and to set an example which every honest and devoted man, situated as I am, may follow. Before you leave me, tell me what you are going to do, Maximilian. The young man smiled sorrowfully. Speak, speak, said Valentine. I entreat you. Has your resolution changed, Valentine? It cannot change, unhappy man. "'You know it must not,' cried the young girl. "'Then adieu, Valentine.' Valentine shook the gate with a strength of which she could not have been supposed to be possessed, as Morel was going away, and passing both her hands through the opening, she clasped and wrung them. "'I must know what you mean to do,' she said. "'Where are you going?' "'Oh, fear not,' said Maximilian, stopping at a short distance. I do not intend to render another man responsible for the rigorous fate reserved for me. Another might threaten to seek M. Franz, to provoke him and to fight with him. All oh, that would be folly. What has M. Franz to do with it? He saw me this morning for the first time, and has already forgotten he has seen me. He did not even know I existed when it was arranged by your two families that you should be united. I have no enmity against M. Franz, and promise you the punishment shall not fall on him. On whom, then? On me? On you? Valentine! Oh, heaven forbid! Woman is sacred. The woman one loves is holy. On yourself, then, unhappy man! On yourself? I am the only guilty person, am I not? said Maximilian. Maximilian, said Valentine, Maximilian, come back, I entreat you. He drew near with his sweet smile, and but for his paleness one might have thought him in his usual happy mood. Listen, 
"'My dear, my adored Valentine,' said he in his melodious and grave tone, "'those who, like us, have never had a thought for which we need blush before the world, such may read each other's hearts. I never was romantic, and am no melancholy hero. I imitate neither Manfred nor Antony, but without words, protestations, or vows, my life has entwined itself with yours. You leave me, and you are right in doing so. I repeat it, you are right, but in losing you, I lose my life. The moment you leave me, Valentine, I am alone in the world. My sister is happily married. Her husband is only my brother-in-law, that is, a man whom the ties of social life alone attach to me. No one then longer needs my useless life. This is what I shall do. I will wait until the very moment you are married, for I will not lose the shadow of one of those unexpected chances which are sometimes reserved for us, since Monsieur Franz may, after all, die before that time. A thunderbolt may fall even on the altar as you approach. Nothing appears impossible to one condemned to die, and miracles appear quite reasonable when his escape from death is concerned. I will, then, wait until the last moment, and when my misery is certain, irremediable, hopeless. I will write a confidential letter to my brother-in-law, another to the prefect of police, to acquaint them with my intention. And at the corner of some wood, on the brink of some abyss, on the bank of some river, I will put an end to my existence, as certainly as I am the son of the most honest man who ever lived in France. Valentine trembled convulsively. She loosened her hold of the gate. Her arms fell by her side, and two large tears rolled down her cheeks. The young man stood before her, sorrowful and resolute. "'Oh, for pity's sake,' said she, "'you will live, will you not?' "'No, on my honour, said Maximilian. "'But that will not affect you. "'You have done your duty, and your conscience will be at rest.' "'Valentine fell on her knees, and pressed her almost bursting heart. "'Maximilian,' said she, "'Maximilian, my friend, my brother on earth, "'my true husband in heaven, I entreat you, do as I do. Live in suffering. Perhaps one day we may be united. Adieu, Valentine, repeated Morel. My God, said Valentine, raising both her hands to heaven with a sublime expression, I have done my utmost to remain a submissive daughter. I have begged, entreated, implored. He has regarded neither my prayers my entreaties nor my tears. It is done, cried she, willing away her tears and resuming her firmness. I am resolved not to die of remorse, but rather of shame. Live, Maximilian, and I will be yours. Say when shall it be. Speak, command, I will obey. Morel, who had already gone some few steps away, again returned, and pale with joy, extended both hands towards Valentine through the opening. Valentine, said he, dear Valentine, you must not speak thus, rather let me die. Why should I obtain you by violence, if our love is mutual? Is it from mere humanity you bid me live? I would rather die. Truly, murmured Valentine, who on this earth cares for me? if he does not. Who has consoled me in my sorrow but he? On whom do my hopes rest? On whom does my bleeding heart repose? On him, on him, always on him. Yes, you are right, Maximilian. I will follow you. I will leave the paternal home. I will give up all. Oh, ungrateful girl that I am, cried Valentine, sobbing, I will give up all, 
even my dear old grandfather, whom I had nearly forgotten. No, said Maximilian, you shall not leave him. Monsieur Noirtier has evinced, you say, a kind feeling towards me. Well, before you leave, tell him all. His consent would be your justification in God's sight. As soon as we are married, he shall come and live with us. Instead of one child, he shall have two. You have told me how you talk to him, and how he answers you. I shall very soon learn that language by signs. Valentine, I promise you solemnly that instead of despair, it is happiness that awaits us. Oh, see, Maximilian, see the power you have over me. You almost make me believe you, and yet what you tell me is madness, for my father will curse me. He is inflexible. He will never pardon me. Now listen to me, Maximilian. If by artifice, by entreaty, by accident, in short, if by any means I can delay this marriage, will you wait? Yes, I promise you. As faithfully as you have promised me that this horrible marriage shall not take place, and that if you are dragged before a magistrate or a priest, you will refuse. I promise you, by all that is most sacred to me in the world, namely, by my mother. We will wait, then, said Morel. Yes, we will wait, replied Valentine, who revived at these words. There are so many things which may save unhappy beings such as we are. I rely on you, Valentine, said Morel. All you do will be well done, only if they disregard your prayers. If your father and Madame de saint Maron insist that Monsieur de Depinay should be called to-morrow to sign the contract, then you have my promise, Maximilian. Instead of signing, I will go to you, and we will fly. But from this moment until then, let us not tempt Providence. Let us not see each other. It is a miracle. It is a providence that we have not been discovered. If we were surprised, if it were known that we met thus, we should have no further resource. You are right, Valentine. But how shall I ascertain? From the notary, Monsieur Deschamps. I know him. And for myself, I will write to you. Depend on me. I dread this marriage, Maximilian, as much as you. Thank you, my adored Valentine. Thank you. That is enough. When once I know the hour, I will hasten to this spot. You can easily get over this fence with my assistance. A carriage will await us at the gate, in which you will accompany me to my sister's. There, living, retired, or mingling in society, as you wish, we shall be unable to use our power to resist oppression and not suffer ourselves to be put to death like sheep, which only defend themselves by sighs. Yes, said Valentine. I will now acknowledge you are right, Maximilian. And now are you satisfied with your betrothal? said the young girl sorrowfully. My adored Valentine, words cannot express one half of my satisfaction. Valentine had approached, or rather had placed her lips so near the fence that they nearly touched those of Morel, which were pressed against the other side of the cold and inexorable barrier. Adieu, until we meet again, said Valentine, tearing herself away. I shall hear from you? Yes. Thanks, thanks, dear love. Adieu. The sound of a kiss was heard and Valentine fled through the avenue. Morel listened to catch the last sound of her dress brushing the branches, and of her footstep on the gravel, then raised his eyes with an ineffable smile of thankfulness to heaven for being permitted to be thus loved, and then also disappeared. The young man returned home and waited all the evening, and all the next day without getting any message. It was only on the following day, at about ten o'clock in the morning, as he was starting to call on Monsieur Deschamps, the notary, that he received from the postman a small billet, which he knew to be from Valentine, although he had not before seen her writing. 
It was to this effect. Tears, entreaties, prayers have availed me nothing. Yesterday, for two hours, I was at the church of St. Philippe du Roule, and for two hours I prayed most fervently. Heaven is as inflexible as man, and the signature of the contract is fixed for this evening at nine o'clock. I have but one promise, and but one heart to give. That promise is pledged to you. That art is also yours. This evening, then, at a quarter to nine, at the gate. Your betrothed, Valentine de Villefort. P.S. My poor grandmother gets worse and worse. Yesterday her fever amounted to delirium. Today her delirium is almost madness. You'll be very kind to me, will you not, Morel, to make me forget my sorrow in leaving her thus? I think it is kept a secret from Grandpapa Noirtier that the contract is to be signed this evening. Morel went also to the notary, who confirmed the news that the contract was to be signed that evening. Then he went to call on Monte Cristo, and heard still more. France had been to announce the ceremony, and Madame de Villefort had also written to beg the Count to excuse her not inviting him. The death of Monsieur de saint Meron and the dangerous illness of his widow would cast a gloom over the meeting which she would regret should be shared by the Count, whom she wished every happiness. The day before France had been presented to Madame de saint Meron, who had left her bed to receive him, but had been obliged to return to it immediately after. It is easy to suppose that Morel's agitation would not escape the Count's penetrating eye. Monte Cristo was more affectionate than ever. Indeed, his manner was so kind that several times Morel was on the point of telling him all. But he recalled the promise he had made to Valentine, and kept his secret. The young man read Valentine's letter twenty times in the course of the day. It was her first, and on what an occasion! Each time he read it, he renewed his vow to make her happy. How great is the power of a woman who has made so courageous a resolution! What devotion does she deserve from him for whom she has sacrificed everything? How ought she really to be supremely loved? She becomes at once a queen and a wife, and it is impossible to thank and love her sufficiently. Morel longed intensely for the moment when he should hear Valentine say, "'Here I am, Maximilian. Come and help me.' He had arranged everything for her escape. Two ladders were hidden in the clover field. A cabriolet was ordered for Maximilian alone, without a servant, without lights. At the turning of the first street they would light the lamps, as it would be foolish to attract the notice of the police by too many precautions. Occasionally he shuddered. He thought of the moment when, from the top of that wall, he should protect the descent of his dear Valentine, pressing in his arms for the first time her, of whom he had yet only kissed the delicate hand. When the afternoon arrived, and he felt that the hour was drawing near, he wished for solitude. His agitation was extreme. A simple question from a friend would have irritated him. He shut himself in his room and tried to read but his eye glanced over the page without understanding a word, and he threw away the book, and for the second time sat down to sketch his plan, the ladders and the fence. At length the hour drew near. Never did a man deeply in love allow the clocks to go on peacefully. Morel tormented his so effectually that they struck eight at half-past six. He then said, "'It is time to start.' The signature was indeed fixed to take place at nine o'clock, but perhaps Valentine will not wait for that. Consequently, Morel, having left the Rue Melee at half-past eight by his timepiece, entered the clover field, while the clock of Saint-Philippe du Roule was striking eight. The horse and cabriolet were concealed behind a small ruin, where Morel had often waited. The night gradually drew on and the foliage in the garden assumed a deeper hue. Then Morel came out from his hiding-place with a beating heart, and looked through the small opening in the gate. There was yet no one to be seen. The clock struck half-past eight, and still another half-hour was passed in waiting, while Morel 
walked to and fro, and gazed more and more frequently through the opening. The garden became darker still, but in the darkness he looked in vain for the white dress, and in the silence he vainly listened for the sound of footsteps. The house, which was discernible through the trees, remained in darkness, and gave no indication that so important an event as the signature of a marriage contract was going on. Morel looked at his watch, which wanted a quarter to ten. But soon, the same clock he had already heard strike two or three times, rectified the error by striking half-past nine. This was already half an hour past the time Valentine had fixed. It was a terrible moment for the young man. The slightest rustling of the foliage, the least whistling of the wind attracted his attention, and drew the perspiration to his brow. Then he tremblingly fixed his ladder, and, not to lose a moment, placed his foot on the first step. Amidst all these alternations of hope and fear, the clock struck ten. "'It is impossible,' said Maximilian, "'that the signing of a contract should occupy so long a time without unexpected interruptions. I have weighed all the chances, calculated the time required for all the forms. Something must have happened.' and then he walked rapidly to and fro, and pressed his burning forehead against the fence. Had Valentine fainted? Or had she been discovered and stopped in her flight? These were the only obstacles which appeared possible to the young man. The idea that her strength had failed her in attempting to escape, and that she had fainted in one of the paths, was the one that most impressed itself upon his mind. "'In that case,' said he, "'I should lose her.' and by my own fault. He dwelt on this idea for a moment. Then it appeared reality. He even thought he could perceive something on the ground at a distance. He ventured to call, and it seemed to him that the wind wafted back an almost inarticulate sigh. At last the half-hour struck. It was impossible to wait longer. His temples throbbed violently. His eyes were growing dim. He passed one leg over the wall, and in a moment leapt down on the other side. He was on Villefort's premises, had arrived there by scaling the wall. What might be the consequences? However, he had not ventured thus far to draw back. He followed a short distance close under the wall, then crossed a path, hid, entered a clump of trees. In a moment he had passed through them, and could see the house distinctly. Then Morel saw that he had been right in believing that the house was not illuminated. Instead of lights at every window, as is customary on days of ceremony, he saw only a grey mass, which was veiled also by a cloud, which at that moment obscured the moon's feeble light. A light moved rapidly from time to time past three windows of the second floor. These three windows were in Madame de saint Meron's room. Another remained motionless behind some red curtains which were in Madame de Villefort's bedroom. Morel guessed all this. So many times, in order to follow Valentine, in thought at every hour in the day, had he made her describe the whole house, that without having seen it, he knew it all. This darkness and silence alarmed Morel still more than Valentine's absence had done. Almost mad with grief, and determined to venture everything in order to see Valentine once more, and be certain of the misfortune he feared. Morel gained the edge of the clump of trees, and was going to pass as quickly as possible through the flower-garden, when the sound of a voice, still at some distance, but which was borne upon the wind, reached him. At this sound, as he was already partially exposed to view, he stepped back and concealed himself completely, remaining perfectly motionless. He had formed his resolution. If it was Valentine alone, he would speak as she passed. If she was accompanied, and he could not speak, still he should see her and know that she was safe. If they were strangers, he would listen to their conversation, and might understand something of this hitherto incomprehensible mystery. The moon had just then escaped from behind the cloud which had concealed it, and Morel saw Villefort come out upon the steps, followed by a gentleman in black. They descended, and advanced towards the clump of trees, and, 
Morel soon recognized the other gentleman as Dr. Davrigny. The young man, seeing them approach, drew back mechanically, until he found himself stopped by a sycamore tree in the centre of the clump. There he was compelled to remain. Soon the two gentlemen stopped also. "'Ah, my dear doctor,' said the procureur, "'heaven declares itself against my house. What a dreadful death! What a blow! Seek not to console me. Alas, nothing can alleviate so great a sorrow. The wound is too deep and too fresh. Dead! Dead!' The cold sweat sprang to the young man's brow, and his teeth chattered. Who could be dead in that house? which Villefort himself had called accursed. "'My dear Monsieur de Villefort,' replied the doctor, with a tone which redoubled the terror of the young man, "'I have not led you here to console you. On the contrary.' "'What can you mean?' asked the procureur, alarmed. "'I mean that behind the misfortune which has just happened to you, there is another, perhaps still greater.' "'Can it be possible?' murmured Villefort clasping his hands. "'What are you going to tell me?' "'Are we quite alone, my friend?' "'Yes, quite. But why all these precautions?' "'Because I have a terrible secret to communicate to you,' said the doctor. "'Let us sit down.' Villefort fell, rather than seated himself. The doctor stood before him with one hand placed on his shoulder. Morel, horrified, supported his head with one hand, and with the other pressed his heart, lest its beating should be heard. "'Dead! Dead!' repeated he within himself, and he felt as if he were also dying. "'Speak, doctor, I am listening,' said Villefort. "'Strike! I am prepared for everything.' "'Madame de saint Meron was doubtless advancing in years, but she enjoyed excellent health.' Morel began again to breathe freely, which he had not done during the last ten minutes. "'Grief has consumed her,' said Villefort. "'Yes, grief, doctor. After living forty years with the Marquis—' "'It is not grief, my dear Villefort,' said the doctor. "'Grief may kill, although it rarely does, and never in a day, never in an hour, never in ten minutes.' Villefort answered nothing. He simply raised his head, which had been cast down before, and looked at the doctor with amazement. "'Were you present during the last struggle?' asked M. de Davrigny. "'I was,' replied the procureur. "'You begged me not to leave. "'Did you notice the symptoms of the disease to which Madame de saint Meron has fallen a victim?' "'I did. Madame de saint Meron had three successive attacks, at intervals of some minutes, each one more serious than the former. When you arrived, Madame de saint Meron had already been panting for breath some minutes. She then had a fit, which I took to be simply a nervous attack, and it was only when I saw her raise herself in the bed, and her limbs and neck appeared stiffened, that I became really alarmed. Then I understood from your countenance there was more to fear than I had thought. This crisis passed. I endeavoured to catch your eye, but could not. You held her hand. You were feeling her pulse, and the second fit came on before you had turned towards me. This was more terrible than the first. The same nervous movements were repeated, and the mouth contracted and turned purple. And at the third she expired. At the end of the first attack, I discovered symptoms of tetanus. You confirm my opinion. Yes, before others, replied the doctor. But now we are alone. What are you going to say? Oh, spare me! That the symptoms of tetanus and poisoning by vegetable substances are the same. Monsieur de Villefort started from his seat, then in a moment fell down again silent and motionless. Morel knew not if he were dreaming or awake. "'Listen,' said the doctor. "'I know the full importance of the statement I have just made, and the disposition of the man to whom I have made it. 
"'Do you speak to me as a magistrate or as a friend?' asked Villefort. "'As a friend, and only as a friend at this moment. "'The similarity in the symptoms of tetanus and poisoning by vegetable substances is so great "'that were I obliged to affirm by oath what I have now stated, I should hesitate. "'I therefore repeat to you, I speak not to a magistrate, but to a friend.' And to that friend, I say, during the three-quarters of an hour that the struggle continued, I watched the convulsions and the death of Madame de saint Meron, and am thoroughly convinced that not only did her death proceed from poison, but I could also specify the poison. Can it be possible? The symptoms are marked, do you see? Sleep, broken by nervous spasms. Excitation of the brain, topper of the nerve centers. Madame de saint Meron succumbed to a powerful dose of brucine or of strychnine, which by some mistake, perhaps, has been given to her. Villefort seized the doctor's hand. Oh, it, it is impossible, said he. I must be dreaming. It is frightful to hear such things from such a man as you. Tell me, I entreat you, my dear doctor, that you may be deceived. Doubtless I may, but— But? But I do not think so. Have pity on me, doctor. So many dreadful things have happened to me lately that I am on the verge of a madness. Has anyone besides me seen Madame de saint Meron? No. Has anything been sent for from a chemist that I have not examined? Nothing. Had Madame de saint Meron any enemies? Not to my knowledge. Would her death affect any one's interest? It could not indeed. My daughter is her only heiress, Valentine alone. Oh, if such a thought could present itself, I would stab myself to punish my heart for having for one instant harboured it. Indeed, my dear friend, said M. d'Avrigny, I would not accuse any one. I speak only of an accident, you understand, of a mistake. But whether accident or mistake, the fact is there. It is on my conscience and compels me to speak aloud to you. Make inquiry. Of whom? How? Of what? May not Barrois, the old servant, have made a mistake, and have given Madame de saint Meron a dose prepared for his master? For my father? Yes. But how could a dose prepared for Monsieur Noirtier poison Madame de saint Meron? Nothing is more simple. You know poisons become remedies in certain diseases of which paralysis is one. For instance, having tried every other remedy to restore movement and speech to Monsieur Noirtier, I resolved to try one last means, and for three months— I have been giving him brucine, so that in the last dose I ordered for him there were six grains. This quantity, which is perfectly safe to administer to the paralyzed frame of Monsieur Noirtier, which has become gradually accustomed to it, would be sufficient to kill another person. My dear doctor, there is no communication between Monsieur Noirtier's apartment and that of Madame de saint Meron. "'and Barrois never entered my mother-in-law's room. "'In short, doctor, although I know you to be the most conscientious man in the world, "'and although I place the utmost reliance on you, "'I want, notwithstanding my conviction, to believe this axiom, "'errare humanum est. "'Is there one of my brethren in whom you have equal confidence with myself?' "'Why do you ask me that? What do you wish?' "'Send for him. I will tell him what I have seen, and we will consult together and examine the body.' "'And you will find traces of poison?' "'No, I did not say of poison. But we can prove what was the state of the body. We shall discover the cause of her sudden death, and we shall say, dear Villefort, if this thing has been caused by negligence, watch over your servants, if from hatred—' Watch your enemies. What do you propose to me, Davrigny? 
said Villefort in despair. So soon as another is admitted into our secret, an inquest will become necessary. And an inquest in my house? Impossible! Still, continued the procureur, looking at the doctor with uneasiness, if you wish it, if you demand it, why, then it shall be done. But, doctor, you see me already so grieved. How can I introduce into my house so much scandal after so much sorrow? My wife and my daughter would die of it. And I, doctor, you know a man does not arrive at the post I occupy. One has not been king's attorney twenty-five years without having amassed a tolerable number of enemies. Mine are numerous. Let this affair be talked of. It will be a triumph for them, which will make them rejoice and cover me with shame. Pardon me, doctor, these worldly ideas. Were you a priest, I should not dare to tell you. But you are a man, and you know mankind. Doctor, pray recall your words. You have said nothing, have you? My dear Monsieur de Villefort, replied the doctor, my first duty is to humanity. I would have saved Madame de saint Meron, if science could have done it. But she is dead, and my duty regards the living. Let us bury this terrible secret in the deepest recesses of our hearts. I am willing, if any one should suspect this, that my silence on the subject should be imputed to my ignorance. Meanwhile, sir, watch always. Watch carefully, for perhaps the evil may not stop here, and when you have found the culprit, if you find him, I will say to you, you are a magistrate. Do as you will. I thank you, doctor, said Villefort, with indescribable joy. I never had a better friend than you. And as if he feared Dr. Davrigny would recall his promise, he hurried him towards the house. When they were gone, Morel ventured out from under the trees, and the moon shone upon his face, which was so pale it might have been taken for that of a ghost. "'I am manifestly protected in a most wonderful but most terrible manner,' said he. "'But Valentine, poor girl, how will she bear so much sorrow?' As he thought thus, he looked alternately at the window with red curtains, and the three windows with white curtains. The light had almost disappeared from the former. Doubtless Madame de Villefort had just put out her lamp, and the night lamp alone reflected its dull light on the window. At the extremity of the building, on the contrary, he saw one of the three windows open. A wax light placed on the mantelpiece threw some of its pale rays without, and a shadow was seen for one moment on the balcony. Morel shuddered. He thought he heard a sob. It cannot be wondered at that his mind, generally so courageous, but now disturbed by the two strongest human passions, love and fear, was weakened even to the indulgence of superstitious thoughts. Although it was impossible that Valentine should see him, hidden as he was, he thought he heard the shadow at the window call him. His disturbed mind told him so. This double error became an irresistible reality, and by one of the incomprehensible transports of youth he bounded from his hiding-place, and with two strides, at the risk of being seen, at the risk of alarming Valentine, at the risk of being discovered by some exclamation which might escape the young girl, he crossed the flower-garden, which by the light of the moon resembled a large white lake, and having passed the rows of orange-trees which extended in front of the house, he reached the step, ran quickly up, and pushed the door, which opened without offering any resistance. Valentine had not seen him. Her eyes raised towards heaven were watching a silvery cloud gliding over the Asia, its form that of a shadow mounting towards heaven. Her poetic and excited mind pictured it as the soul of her grandmother. Meanwhile, Morel had traversed the anteroom and found the staircase which, being carpeted, prevented his approach being heard, and he had regained that degree of confidence that the presence of M. de Villefort even would not have alarmed him. He was quite prepared for any such encounter. He would at once approach Valentine's father and acknowledge all. 
begging Villefort to pardon and sanction the love which united two fond and loving hearts. Morel was mad. Happily, he did not meet anyone. Now, especially, did he find the description Valentine had given of the interior of the house useful to him. He arrived safely at the top of the staircase, and while he was feeling his way, a sob indicated the direction he was to take. He turned back. A door, partly opened, enabled him to see his road, and to hear the voice of one in sorrow. He pushed the door open, and entered. At the other end of the room, under a white sheet which covered it, lay the corpse, still more alarming to Morel since the account he had so unexpectedly overheard. By its side, on her knees, and with her head buried in the cushion of an easy chair, was Valentine, trembling and sobbing, her hands extended above her head, clasped and stiff. She had turned from the window which remained open, and was praying in accents that would have affected the most unfeeling. Her words were rapid, incoherent, unintelligible, for the burning weight of grief almost stopped her utterance. The moon, shining through the open blinds, made the lamp appear to burn paler, and cast a sepulchral hue over the whole scene. Morel could not resist this. He was not exemplary for piety. He was not easily impressed. But Valentine, suffering, weeping, wringing her hands before him, was more than he could bear in silence. He sighed and whispered a name, and the head bathed in tears and pressed on the velvet cushion of the chair, a head like that of a Magdalene by Correggio, was raised and turned toward him. Valentine perceived him without betraying the least surprise. A heart overwhelmed with one great grief is insensible to minor emotions. Morel held out his hand to her. Valentine, as her only apology for not having met him, pointed to the corpse under the sheet, and began to sob again. Neither dared for some time to speak in that room. They hesitated to break the silence which death seemed to impose. At length, Valentine ventured. "'My dear friend,' said she, "'how came you here? Alas, I would say you are welcome, had not death opened the way for you into this house.' "'Valentine,' said Morel, with a trembling voice, "'I had waited since half-past eight, and did not see you come. I became uneasy, leapt the wall, found my way through the garden, when voices conversing about the fatal event. "'What voices?' asked Valentine. Morel shuddered as he thought of the conversation of the doctor and Monsieur de Villefort, and he thought he could see through the sheet the extended hands, the stiff neck, and the purple lips. "'Your servants,' said he, "'who were repeating the whole of the sorrowful story. From them I learned it all.' "'But it was risking the failure of our plan to come up here, love.' "'Forgive me,' replied Morel. "'I will go away.' "'No,' said Valentine. "'You might meet someone. Stay.' "'But if anyone should come here?' The young girl shook her head. "'No one will come,' said she. "'Do not fear. There is our safeguard,' pointing to the bed. "'But what has become of Monsieur Depinay?' replied Morel. "'Monsieur Franz arrived to sign the contract, just as my dear grandmother was dying.' "'Alas!' said Morel, with a feeling of selfish joy, for he thought this death would cause the wedding to be postponed indefinitely. "'But what redoubles my sorrow?' continued the young girl, as if this feeling was to receive its immediate punishment. "'Is that the poor old lady on her deathbed requested that the marriage might take place as soon as possible. She also, thinking to protect me, was acting against me. Hark, said Morel. They both listened. Steps were distinctly heard in the corridor and on the stairs. It is my father, who has just left his study. To accompany the doctor to the door, added Morel. How did you know it is the doctor? asked Valentine, astonished. I imagined it must be said Morel. Valentine looked at the young man. 
they heard the street door close. Then M. de Villefort locked the garden door and returned upstairs. He stopped a moment in the anteroom, as if hesitating whether to turn to his own apartment or into Madame de saint Méran's. Morel concealed himself behind a door. Valentine remained motionless, grief seeming to deprive her of all fear. M. de Villefort passed on to his own room. Now, said Valentine, you can neither go out by the front door nor by the garden. Morel looked at her with astonishment. There is but one way left that is safe, she said. It is through my grandfather's room. She rose. Come, she added. Where? asked Maximilian. To my grandfather's room. I? In Monsieur Noirtier's apartment? Yes. Can you mean it, Valentine? I have long wished it. He is my only remaining friend, and we both need his help. Come. Be careful, Valentine, said Morel, hesitating to comply with the young girl's wishes. I now see my error. I acted like a madman in coming here. Are you sure are you more reasonable? Yes, said Valentine, and I have but one scruple that of leaving my dear grandmother's remains which i had undertaken to watch valentine said morel death is in itself sacred yes said valentine besides it will not be for long she then crossed the corridor and led the way down a narrow staircase to monsieur noirtier's room morel followed her on tiptoe at the door they found the old servant barois said valentine Shut the door, and let no one come in. She passed first. Noirtier, seated in his chair, and listening to every sound, was watching the door. He saw Valentine, and his eye brightened. There was something grave and solemn in the approach of the young girl which struck the old man, and immediately his bright eye began to interrogate. "'Dear grandfather,' said she hurriedly, "'you know poor grandmamma died an hour since.' and now I have no friend in the world but you. His expressive eyes evinced the greatest tenderness. To you alone, then, may I confide my sorrows and my hopes. The paralytic motioned, yes. Valentine took Maximilian's hand. Look attentively, then, at this gentleman. The old man fixed his scrutinizing gaze with slight astonishment on Morel. It is Monsieur Maximilian Morel, said she the son of that good merchant of Marseilles, whom you doubtless recollect. Yes, said the old man. He brings an irreproachable name, which Maximilian is likely to render glorious, since at thirty years of age he is a captain, an officer of the Legion of Honour. The old man signified that he recollected him. Well, grandpapa, said Valentine, kneeling before him and pointing to Maximilian, I love him and will be only his. Were I compelled to marry another, I would destroy myself." The eyes of the paralytic expressed a multitude of tumultuous thoughts. "'You like M. Maximilien Morel, do you not, Grandpapa?' asked Valentine. "'Yes.' "'And you will protect us, who are your children, against the will of my father?' Noirtier cast an intelligent glance at Morel, as if to say, "'Perhaps I may.' Maximilian understood him. Mademoiselle, said he, you have a sacred duty to fulfil in your deceased grandmother's room. Will you allow me the honour of a few minutes' conversation with Monsieur Noirtier? That is it, said the old man's eye. Then he looked anxiously at Valentine. Do you fear you will not understand? Yes. Oh, we have so often spoken of you that he knows exactly how I talk to you. Then turning to Maximilian with an adorable smile, although shaded by sorrow, he knows everything I know," said she. Valentine rose, placed a chair for Morel, requested Barois not to admit any one, and having tenderly embraced her grandfather and sorrowfully taken leave of Morel, she went away. To prove to Noirtier that he was in Valentine's confidence and knew all their secrets. Morel took the dictionary, a pen, and some paper, and placed them all on a table where there was a light. "'But first,' said Morel, 
Allow me, sir, to tell you who I am, how much I love Mademoiselle Valentine, and what are my designs respecting her. Noirtier made a sign that he would listen. It was an imposing sight to witness this old man, apparently a mere useless burden, becoming the sole protector, support, and adviser of the lovers who were both young, beautiful, and strong. His remarkably noble and austere expression struck Morel, who began his story with trembling. He related the manner in which he had become acquainted with Valentine, and how he had loved her, and that Valentine, in her solitude and her misfortune, had accepted the offer of his devotion. He told him his birth, his position, his fortune, and more than once, when he consulted the look of the paralytic, that look answered, "'That is good. Proceed.' "'And now,' said Morel, when he had finished the first part of his recital, "'now I have told you of my love and my hopes. May I inform you of my intentions?' "'Yes,' signified the old man. "'This was our resolution. A cabriolet was in waiting at the gate in which I intended to carry off Valentine to my sister's house, to marry her, and to wait respectfully Monsieur de Villefort's pardon. No, said Noirtier. We must not do so? No. You do not sanction our project? No. There is no other way, said Morel. The old man's interrogative eye said, What? I will go, continued Maximilian. I will seek Monsieur Franz d'Epinay. I am happy to be able to mention this in Mademoiselle de Villefort's absence, and will conduct myself toward him so as to compel him to challenge me. Noirtier's look continued to interrogate. You wish to know what I will do? Yes. I will find him as I told you. I will tell him the ties which bind me to Mademoiselle Valentine. If he be a sensible man, he will prove it by renouncing of his own accord the hand of his betrothed, and will secure my friendship and love until death. If he refuse, either through interest or ridiculous pride, after I have proved to him that he would be forcing my wife from me, that Valentine loves me and will have no other, I will fight him, give him every advantage, and I shall kill him, or he will kill me. If I am victorious, I will not marry Valentine, and if I die, I am very sure Valentine will not marry him. Noirtier watched with indescribable pleasure this noble and sincere countenance on which every sentiment his tongue uttered was depicted, adding by the expression of his fine features all that colouring adds to a sound and faithful drawing. Still, when Morel had finished, he shut his eyes several times, which was his manner of saying, No. No, said Morel, you disapprove of this second project? as you did of the first? I do, signified the old man. But what then must be done? asked Morel. Madame de saint Méran's last request was that the marriage might not be delayed. Must I let things take their course? Noirtier did not move. I understand, said Morel. I am to wait. Yes. But delay may ruin our plan, sir, replied the young man. Alone, Valentine has no power. She will be compelled to submit. I am here almost miraculously, and can scarcely hope for so good an opportunity to occur again. Believe me, there are only the two plans I have proposed to you. Forgive my vanity, and tell me which you prefer. Do you authorize Mademoiselle Valentine to entrust herself to my honor? No. Do you prefer I seek out Monsieur Depinay? No. Whence, then, will you come the help we need, from chance? resumed Morel. No. From you? Yes. You thoroughly understand me, sir. Pardon my eagerness for my life depends on your answer. Will our help come from you? Yes. You are sure of it? Yes. There was so much firmness in the look which gave this answer. No one could at any rate doubt his will, if they did his power. Oh, thank you a thousand times! But how? Unless a miracle should restore your speech, your gesture, your movement, how can you, chained to that armchair, dumb and motionless, 
oppose this marriage a smile lit up the old man's face a strange smile of the eyes in a paralyzed face then i must wait asked the young man yes but the contract the same smile returned will you assure me it shall not be signed yes said noirtier the contract shall not be signed cried morel oh pardon me sir i can scarcely realize so great a happiness will they not sign it no said the paralytic notwithstanding that assurance morel still hesitated this promise of an impotent old man was so strange that instead of being the result of the power of his will it might emanate from enfeebled organs is it not natural that the madman ignorant of his folly should attempt things beyond his power the weak man talks of burdens he can raise the timid of giants he can confront the poor of treasures he spends the most humble peasant in the height of his pride calls himself jupiter whether noirtier understood the young man's indecision or whether he had not full confidence in his docility he looked uneasily at him what do you wish sir asked morel that i should renew my promise of remaining tranquil noirtier's eyes remained fixed and firm as if to imply that a promise did not suffice then it passed from his face to his hands shall i swear to you sir asked maximilian yes said the paralytic with the same solemnity morel understood that the old man attached great importance to an oath he extended his hand i swear to you on my honor said he to await your decision respecting the course i am to pursue with monsieur d'epinay that is right said the old man now said morel do you wish me to retire yes without seeing mademoiselle valentine yes morel made a sign that he was ready to obey but said he first allow me to embrace you as your daughter did just now noirtier's expression could not be understood the young man pressed his lips on the same spot on the old man's forehead where valentine's had been then he bowed a second time and retired he found outside the door the old servant to whom valentine had given directions morel was conducted along a dark passage which led to a little door opening on the garden soon found the spot where he had entered with the assistance of the shrubs gained the top of the wall and by his ladder was in an instant in the clover field where his cabriolet was still waiting for him he got in it and thoroughly wearied by so many emotions arrived about midnight in the rue melee threw himself on his bed and slept soundly end of chapter 73「The Villefort Family Vault」Two days after, a considerable crowd was assembled, towards ten o'clock in the morning, around the door of Monsieur de Villefort's house, and the long file of mourning coaches and private carriages extended along the Faubourg Saint-Honoré and the Rue de la Papinière. Among them was one of a very singular form, which appeared to have come from a distance. It was a kind of covered wagon painted black and was one of the first to arrive inquiry was made and it was ascertained that by a strange coincidence this carriage contained the corpse of the marquis de saint Maron, and that those who had come thinking to attend one funeral would follow two their number was great the marquis de saint Maron was one of the most zealous and faithful dignitaries of louis eighteenth and king charles the tenth had preserved a great number of friends, and these, added to the personages whom the usages of society gave Villefort a claim on, formed a considerable body. Due information was given to the authorities, and permission obtained that the two funerals should take place at the same time. A second hearse, decked with the same funereal pomp, was brought to Monsieur de Villefort's door, and the coffin removed into it from the post-wagon. The two bodies were to be interred in the cemetery of Père Lachaise, where Monsieur de Villefort had long since had a tomb prepared for the reception of his family. 
The remains of poor René were already deposited there, and now, after ten years of separation, her father and mother were to be reunited with her. The Parisians, always curious, always affected by funereal display, looked on with religious silence, while the splendid procession accompanied to their last abode two of the number of the old aristocracy, the greatest protectors of commerce and sincere devotees to their principles. In one of the morning coaches, Beauchamp, de Bray, and Chateau Renaud were talking of the very sudden death of the Marchioness. "'I saw Madame de saint Méran only last year at Marseille, when I was coming back from Algiers,' said Chateau Renaud. "'She looked like a woman destined to live to be a hundred years old from her apparent sound health and great activity of mind and body. How old was she?' "'France assured me,' replied Albert, "'that she was sixty-six years old. But she has not died of old age, but of grief.' It appears that since the death of the Marquis, which affected her very deeply, she has not completely recovered her reason. "'But of what disease, then, did she die?' asked de Bray. "'It is said to have been a congestion of the brain, or apoplexy, which is the same thing, is it not?' "'Nearly.' "'It is difficult to believe that it was apoplexy,' said Beauchamp. Madame de saint Meran, whom I once saw, was short, of slender form, and of a much more nervous than sanguine temperament. Grief could hardly produce apoplexy in such a constitution as that of Madame de saint Meran. At any rate, said Albert, whatever disease or doctor may have killed her, Monsieur de Villefort, or rather Mademoiselle Valentine, or still rather our friend Franz, inherits a magnificent fortune, amounting, I believe, to eighty thousand livres per annum. And this fortune will be doubled at the death of the old Jacobin Noirtier. This is a tenacious old grandfather, said Beauchamp. Tenacem probositi virum. I think he must have made an agreement with death to outlive all his heirs, and he appears likely to succeed. He resembles the old conventionalist of ninety-three, who said to Napoleon in eighteen fourteen, "'You bend because your empire is a young stem, weakened by rapid growth. Take the Republic for a tutor. Let us return with renewed strength to the battlefield, and I promise you five hundred thousand soldiers, another Marengo, and a second Austerlitz. Ideas do not become extinct, sire. They slumber sometimes, but only revive the stronger before they sleep entirely. Ideas and men appear the same to him. On one thing only it puzzles me, namely how Franz d'Epinay will like a grandfather who cannot be separated from his wife. But where is Franz? In the first carriage with Monsieur de Villefort, who considered him already as one of the family. Such was the conversation in almost all the carriages. These two sudden deaths, so quickly following each other, astonished everyone. But no one suspected the terrible secret which M. d'Avrigny had communicated in his nocturnal walk to M. de Villefort. They arrived in about an hour at the cemetery. The weather was mild, but dull, and in harmony with the funeral ceremony. Among the groups which flocked towards the family vault. Chateau Renaud recognized Morel, who had come alone in a cabriolet, and walked silently along the path or bordered with yew trees. "'You hear?' said Chateau Renaud, passing his arms through the young captains. "'Are you a friend of Villefort's? How is it that I have never met you at his house?' "'I am no acquaintance of Monsieur de Villefort's,' answered Morel. "'But I was of Madame de saint Meran. Albert came up to them at this moment with France. "'The time and place are but ill-suited for an introduction,' said Albert. "'But we are not superstitious, Monsieur Morel. Allow me to present to you Monsieur Franz d'Epinay, a delightful travelling companion with whom I made the tour of Italy. My dear Franz, 
Monsieur Maximilien Morel, an excellent friend I have acquired in your absence, and whose name you will hear me mention every time I make an allusion to affection, wit, or amiability. Morel hesitated for a moment. He feared it would be hypocritical to accost in a friendly manner the man whom he was tacitly opposing, but his oath and the gravity of the circumstances recurred to his memory. He struggled to conceal his emotion, and bowed to France. "'Mademoiselle de Villefort is in deep sorrow, is she not?' said de Bray to France. "'Extremely,' replied he. "'She looked so pale this morning, I scarcely knew her.' These apparently simple words pierced Morel to the heart. This man had seen Valentine, and spoken to her. The young and high-spirited officer required all his strength of mind to resist breaking his oath. He took the arm of Chateau Renaud, and turned towards the vault, where the attendants had already placed the two coffins. "'This is a magnificent habitation,' said Beauchamp, looking towards the mausoleum. "'A summer and winter palace. You will in turn enter it, my dear Epinay, for you will soon be numbered as one of the family.' I, as a philosopher, should like a little country house, a cottage down there under the trees, without so many free stones over my poor body. In dying, I will say to those around me what Voltaire wrote to Piron, Eorus, and all will be over. But come, France, take courage. Your wife is an heiress. Indeed, Beauchamp, you are unbearable. Politics has made you laugh at everything, and political men have made you disbelieve everything. But when you have the honour of associating with ordinary men, and the pleasure of leaving politics for a moment, try to find your affectionate heart, which you leave with your stick when you go to the chamber. But tell me, said Beauchamp, what is life? Is it not a hall in death's anteroom? "'I am prejudiced against Beauchamp,' said Albert, drawing France away, and leaving the former to finish his philosophical dissertation with Debray. The Villefort vault formed a square of white stones about twenty feet high. An interior partition separated the two families, and each apartment had its entrance door. Here were not, as in other tombs, ignoble drawers— one above another, where thrift bestows its dead, and labels them like specimens in a museum. All that was visible within the bronze gates was a gloomy-looking room, separated by a wall from the vault itself. The two doors before mentioned were in the middle of this wall, and enclosed the Villefort and saint Méran coffins. Their grief might freely expend itself, without being disturbed, by the trifling loungers who came from a picnic party to visit Père Lachaise, or by lovers who made it their rendezvous. The two coffins were placed on trestles previously prepared to their reception in the right-hand crypt belonging to the saint Méran family. Villefort, France, and a few near relatives alone entered the sanctuary. As the religious ceremonies had all been performed at the door, and there was no address given, the party all separated. Chateau Renaud, Albert and Morel went one way, and de Bray and Beauchamp the other. France remained with Monsieur de Villefort at the gate of the cemetery. Morel made an excuse to wait. He saw France and Monsieur de Villefort get into the same mourning coach, and thought this meeting foreboded evil. He then returned to Paris, and although in the same carriage with Chateau Renaud and Albert, he did not hear one word of their conversation. As France was about to take leave of Monsieur de Villefort, "'When shall I see you again?' said the latter. "'At what time you please, sir,' replied France. "'As soon as possible.' "'I am at your command, sir. Shall we return together?' "'If not unpleasant to you?' "'On the contrary. I shall feel much pleasure.' Thus the future father and son-in-law stepped into the same carriage, and Morel, seeing them pass, became uneasy. Villefort and France returned to the Faubourg Saint-Honoré. The procureur, without going to see either his wife or his daughter, went at once to his study, and offering the young man a chair. "'Monsieur Depinay,' 
said he, "'allow me to remind you at this moment, which is perhaps not so ill-chosen as at first sight may appear, for obedience to the wishes of the departed is the first offering which should be made at their tomb. Allow me then to remind you of the wish expressed by Madame de saint Meran on her deathbed, that Valentine's wedding might not be deferred. You know the affairs of the deceased are in perfect order, and her will bequeaths to Valentine the entire property of the saint Meran family. The notary showed me the documents yesterday, which will enable us to draw up the contract immediately. You may call on the notary, Monsieur Deschamps, Place Beauvau, Faubourg Saint-Honoré, and you have my authority to inspect those deeds. Sir, replied Monsieur d'Epinay, it is not, perhaps, the moment for Mademoiselle Valentine, who is in deep distress, to think of her husband. Indeed, I fear, Valentine will have no greater pleasure than that of fulfilling her grandmother's last injunctions. There will be no obstacle from that quarter, I assure you. In that case, replied Franz, as I shall raise none, you may make arrangements when you please. I have pledged my word, and shall feel pleasure and happiness in adhering to it. Then, said Villefort, nothing further is required. The contract was to have been signed three days since. We shall find it all ready, and can sign it to-day. But the morning, said Franz, hesitating. Don't be uneasy on that score, replied Villefort. No ceremony will be neglected in my house. Mademoiselle de Villefort may retire during the prescribed three months to her estate of saint Meron. I say hers, for she inherits it to-day. There, after a few days, if you like, the civil marriage shall be celebrated without pomp or ceremony. Madame de saint Meron wished her daughter should be married there. When that is over, you, sir, can return to Paris, while your wife passes the time of her mourning with her mother-in-law. "'As you please, sir,' said Franz. "'Then,' replied Monsieur de Villefort, "'have the kindness to wait half an hour. "'Valentine shall come down into the drawing-room. "'I will send Monsieur Deschamps. "'We will read and sign the contract before we separate. "'And this evening Madame de Villefort shall accompany Valentine to her estate, "'where we will rejoin them in a week.' "'Sir,' said Franz, "'I have one request to make. "'What is it? "'I wish Albert de Morcerf and Raoul de Chateauneau "'to be present at this signature. "'You know they are my witnesses.' "'Half an hour will suffice to apprise them. "'Will you go for them yourself, or shall you send?' "'I prefer going, sir.' "'I shall expect you then in half an hour, Baron, "'and Valentine will be ready.' Franz bowed and left the room. Scarcely had the door closed when Monsieur de Villefort sent to tell Valentine to be ready in the drawing-room in half an hour, as he expected the notary and Monsieur d'Epinay and his witnesses. The news caused a great sensation throughout the house. Madame de Villefort would not believe it, and Valentine was thunderstruck. She looked around for help, and would have gone down to her grandfather's room but on the stairs she met M. de Villefort, who took her arm and led her into the drawing-room. In the ante-room, Valentine met Barrois, and looked despairingly at the old servant. A moment later, Madame de Villefort entered the drawing-room with her little Edward. It was evident that she had shared the grief of the family, for she was pale and looked fatigued. She sat down, took Edward on her knees, and from time to time pressed this child, on whom her affections appeared centred, almost convulsively to her bosom. Two carriages were soon heard to enter the courtyard. One was the notary's, the other that of France and his friends. In a moment the whole party was assembled. Valentine was so pale one might trace the blue veins from her temples, round her eyes and down her cheeks. France was deeply affected. Chateau Renaud and Albert looked at each other with amazement. 
the ceremony which was just concluded had not appeared more sorrowful than did that which was about to begin madame de villefort had placed herself in the shadow behind a velvet curtain and as she constantly bent over her child it was difficult to read the expression of her face monsieur de villefort was as usual unmoved the notary after having according to the customary method arranged the papers on the table taken his place in an armchair and raised his spectacles turned towards france are you monsieur france de quinel baron d'epinay asked he although he knew it perfectly yes sir replied france the notary bowed i have then to inform you sir at the request of monsieur de villefort that your projected marriage with mademoiselle de villefort has changed the feeling of monsieur noirtier towards his grandchild and that he disinherits her entirely of the fortune he would have left her let me hasten to add continued he that the testator having only the right to alienate a part of his fortune and having alienated it all the will will not bear scrutiny and is declared null and void yes said villefort but i warn m d'epinay that during my lifetime my father's will shall never be questioned my position forbidding any doubt to be entertained sir said france i regret much that such a question has been raised in the presence of mademoiselle valentine i have never inquired the amount of her fortune which however limited it may be exceeds mine my family has sought consideration in this alliance with monsieur de villefort all i seek is happiness valentine imperceptibly thanked him while two silent tears rolled down her cheeks besides sir said villefort addressing himself to his future son-in-law excepting the loss of a portion of your hopes this unexpected will not need to personally wound you Monsieur Noirtier's weakness of mind sufficiently explains it. It is not because Mademoiselle Valentine is going to marry you that he is angry, but because she will marry. A union with any other would have caused him the same sorrow. Old age is selfish, sir, and Mademoiselle de Villefort has been a faithful companion to Monsieur Noirtier, which she cannot be when she becomes the Baroness d'Epinay my father's melancholy state prevents our speaking to him on any subjects which the weakness of his mind would incapacitate him from understanding and i am perfectly convinced that at the present time although he knows that his granddaughter is going to be married m noirtier has ever forgotten the name of his intended grandson m de villefort had scarcely said this when the door opened and barrois appeared gentlemen said he in a tone strangely firm for a servant speaking to his masters under such solemn circumstances gentlemen m noirtier de villefort wishes to speak immediately to m franz de quenel baron d'epinay he as well as the notary that there might be no mistake in the person gave all his titles to the bridegroom-elect villefort started madame de villefort let her son slip from her knees valentine rose pale and dumb as a statue albert and chateau renaud exchanged a second look more full of amazement than the first the notary looked at villefort it is impossible said the procureur monsieur d'epinay cannot leave the drawing-room at present it is at this moment replied barrois with the same firmness that m noirtier my master wishes to speak on important subjects to m franz d'epinay grandpapa noirtier can speak now then said edward with his habitual quickness however his remark did not make madame de villefort even smile so much was every mind engaged and so solemn was the situation astonishment was at its height something like a smile was perceptible on madame de villefort's countenance 
Valentine instinctively raised her eyes, as if to thank heaven. "'Pray go, Valentine,' said M. de Villefort, "'and see what this new fancy of your grandfather's is.' Valentine rose quickly, and was hastening joyfully towards the door, when M. de Villefort altered his intention. "'Stop,' said he. "'I will go with you.' "'Excuse me, sir,' said Franz. "'Since M. Noirtier sent for me, I am ready to attend to his wish. Besides, I shall be happy to pay my respects to him, not having yet had the honour of doing so.' "'Pray, sir,' said Villefort, with marked uneasiness, "'do not disturb yourself.' "'Forgive me, sir,' said Franz, in a resolute tone. "'I would not lose this opportunity of proving to M. Noirtier how wrong it would be of him to encourage feelings of dislike to me, which I am determined to conquer, whatever they may be, by my devotion. And without listening to Villefort, he arose and followed Valentine, who was running downstairs with the joy of a shipwrecked mariner who finds a rock to cling to. Monsieur de Villefort followed them. Chateau Renault and Morcerf exchanged a third look of still increasing wonder. End of chapter 74 Chapter 75 A Signed Statement Noirtier was prepared to receive them, dressed in black and installed in his armchair. When the three persons he expected had entered, he looked at the door, which his valet immediately closed. Listen, whispered Villefort to Valentine, who could not conceal her joy. If Monsieur Noirtier wishes to communicate anything which would delay your marriage, I forbid you to understand him. Valentine blushed, but did not answer. Villefort, approaching Noirtier, Here is Monsieur Franz d'Epinay, said he. You are requested to see him. We have all wished for this interview, and I trust it will convince you how ill-informed are your objections to Valentine's marriage. Noirtier answered only by a look which made Villefort's blood run cold. He motioned to Valentine to approach. In a moment, thanks to her habit of conversing with her grandfather, she understood that he asked for a key. Then his eye was fixed on the drawer of a small chest between the windows. She opened the drawer, and found a key, and, understanding that was what he wanted, again watched his eyes, which turned towards an old secretary which had been neglected for many years, and was supposed to contain nothing but useless documents. "'Shall I open the secretary?' asked Valentine. "'Yes,' said the old man. "'And the drawers?' "'Yes.' "'Those at the side?' "'No.' "'The middle one?' "'Yes.' Valentine opened it, and drew out a bundle of papers. "'Is that what you wish for?' asked she. "'No.' She took successively all the other papers out till the drawer was empty. "'But there are no more,' said she. Noirtier's eye was fixed on the dictionary. "'Yes, I understand, grandfather,' said the young girl. He pointed to each letter of the alphabet. At the letter S the old man stopped her. She opened and found the word, secret. "'Ah! Is there a secret spring?' said Valentine. "'Yes,' said Noirtier. "'And who knows it?' Noirtier looked at the door where the servant had gone out. "'Barois?' said she. "'Yes.' "'Shall I call him?' "'Yes.' Valentine went to the door and called Barois. Villefort's impatience during this scene made the perspiration roll from his forehead, and France was stupefied. The old servant came. "'Barois,' said Valentine, "'my grandfather has told me to open that drawer in the secretary, but there is a secret spring in it, which you know. Will you open it?' Barois looked at the old man. "'Obey,' said Noirtier's intelligent eye. Barois touched a spring, the false bottom came out, and they saw a bundle of papers tied with a black string. "'Is that what you wish for?' said Barois. "'Yes.' "'Shall I give these papers to Monsieur de Villefort?' "'No.' 
To Mademoiselle Valentine? No. To Monsieur Franz Depinay? Yes. Franz, astonished, advanced a step. To me, sir? said he. Yes. Franz took them from Barois, and casting a glance at the cover, read, To be given after my death to General Durand, who shall bequeath the packet to his son, with an injunction to preserve it as containing an important document. Well, sir, asked Franz, what do you wish me to do with this paper? To preserve it, sealed up as it is, doubtless, said the procureur. No, replied Noirtier eagerly. Do you wish him to read it? said Valentine. Yes, replied the old man. You understand, Baron, my grandfather wishes you to read this paper, said Valentine. Then let us sit down, said Villefort impatiently, for it will take some time. Sit down, said the old man. Villefort took a chair, but Valentine remained standing by her father's side, and France before him, holding the mysterious paper in his hand. Read, said the old man. France untied it, and in the midst of the most profound silence read, Extract from the report of a meeting of the Bonapartist Club in the Rue Saint-Jacques, held February 5th, 1815. France stopped. February 5th? 1815? said he. It is the day my father was murdered. Valentine and Villefort were dumb. The eye of the old man alone seemed to say clearly, Go on. But it was on leaving this club, said he, my father disappeared. Noirtier's eyes continued to say, Read. He resumed. The undersigned Louis Jacques Beaupère, lieutenant colonel of artillery, Etienne Dauchampy, general of the brigade, and Claude Lecharpal, keeper of the woods and forests, declare that on the 4th of February a letter arrived from the island of Elba, recommending to the kindness and the confidence of the Bonapartist club General Flavien de Quesnel, who, having served the emperor from 1804 to 1814, was supposed to be devoted to the interests of the Napoleon dynasty, notwithstanding the title of baron, which Louis XVIII had just granted to him with his estate of Epinay. A note was in consequence addressed to General de Quesnel, begging him to be present at the meeting next day, the 5th. The note indicated neither the street nor the number of the house where the meeting was to be held. It bore no signature, but it announced to the general that someone would call for him if he would be ready at nine o'clock. The meetings were always held from that time till midnight. At nine o'clock, the president of the club presented himself. The general was ready. The president informed him that one of the conditions of his introduction was that he should be eternally ignorant of the place of the meeting, and that he would allow his eyes to be bandaged, swearing that he would not endeavor to take off the bandage. General de Quesnel accepted the condition, and promised on his honor not to seek to discover the road they took. The general's carriage was ready, but the president tell him it was impossible for him to use it, since it was useless to blindfold the master if the coachman knew through what streets he went. "'What must be done, then?' asked the general. "'I have my carriage here,' said the president. "'Have you then so much confidence in your servant that you can entrust him with a secret you will not allow me to know?' "'Our coachman is a member of the club,' said the president. "'We shall be driven by a state councillor. "'Then we run another risk,' said the general, laughing, "'that of being upset. "'We insert this joke to prove that the general was not in the least compelled to attend the meeting, "'but that he came willingly. "'When they were seated in the carriage, the president reminded the general of his promise "'to allow his eyes to be bandaged, to which he made no opposition.' On the road, the president thought he saw the general make an attempt to remove the handkerchief, and reminded him of his oath. "'Sure enough,' said the general. The carriage stopped at an alley leading out of the Rue Saint-Jacques. The general alighted, leaning on the arm of the president, of whose dignity he was not aware, considering him simply as a member of the club. 
they went through the alley, mounted a flight of stairs, and entered the assembly room. The deliberations had already begun. The members, apprised of the sort of presentation which was to be made that evening, were all in attendance. When, in the middle of the room, the general was invited to remove his bandage, he did so immediately, and was surprised to see so many well-known faces in a society of whose existence he had till then been ignorant. They questioned him as to his sentiments, but he contented himself with answering that the letters from the island of Elba ought to have informed them. Franz interrupted himself by saying, "'My father was a royalist. They need not have asked his sentiments, which were well known.' "'And hence,' said Villefort, "'arose my affection for your father, my dear Monsieur Franz. Opinions held in common are a ready bond of union.' "'Read again,' said the old man. Franz continued. The President then sought to make him speak more explicitly, but M. de Quesnel replied that he wished to first to know what they wanted with him. He was then informed of the contents of the letter from the island of Elba, in which he was recommended to the club as a man who would be likely to advance the interests of their party. One paragraph spoke of the return of Bonaparte, and promised another letter and further details on the arrival of the pharaon belonging to the shipbuilder Morel of Marseille, whose captain was entirely devoted to the emperor. During all this time, the general on whom they thought to have relied as on a brother manifested evidently signs of discontent and repugnance. When the reading was finished, he remained silent with knitted brows. "'Well?' asked the president. "'What do you say to this letter, General?' "'I say that it is too soon after declaring myself for Louis XVIII "'to break my vow in behalf of the ex-emperor.' "'This answer was too clear to permit of any mistake as to his sentiments. "'General,' said the President, "'we acknowledge no king Louis XVIII or an ex-emperor, "'but His Majesty the Emperor and King driven from France, which is his kingdom, by violence and treason. "'Excuse me, gentlemen,' said the general. "'You may not acknowledge Louis XVIII, but I do, as he has made me a baron and a field-marshal, and I shall never forget that for these two titles I am indebted to his happy return to France.' "'Sir,' said the president, rising with gravity, "'be careful what you say.' Your words clearly show us that they are deceived concerning you in the island of Elba, and have deceived us. The communication has been made to you in consequence of the confidence placed in you, and which does your honour. Now we discover our error. A title and promotion attach you to the government which we wish to overturn. We will not constrain you to help us. We enroll no one against his conscience." but we will compel you to act generously, even if you are not disposed to do so. You could call acting generously, knowing your conspiracy, and not informing against you. That is what I should call becoming your accomplice. You see, I am more candid than you. Ah, oh, my father, said Franz, interrupting himself, I understand now why they murdered him. Valentine could not help casting one glance toward the young man, whose filial enthusiasm it was delightful to behold. Villefort walked to and fro behind them. Noirtier watched the expression of each one, and preserved his dignified and commanding attitude. France returned to the manuscript, and continued. "'Sir,' said the President, "'you have been invited to join this assembly. You were not forced here.' It was proposed to you to become blindfolded, you accepted. When you complied with this twofold request, you well knew we did not wish to secure the throne of Louis XVIII, or we should not take so much care to avoid the vigilance of the police. It would be conceding too much to allow you to put on a mask to aid you in the discovery of our secret, and then to remove it that you may ruin those who have confided in you. No, no, you must first say if you declare yourself for the king of a day who now reigns, 
or for his majesty the emperor i am a royalist replied the general i have taken the oath of allegiance to louis eighteenth and i will adhere to it these words were followed by a general murmur and it was evident that several of the members were discussing the propriety of making the general repent of his rashness the president again arose and having imposed silence said sir you are too serious and too sensible a man not to understand the consequences of our present situation and your candour has already dictated to us the conditions which remain for us to offer you the general putting his hand on his sword exclaimed if you talk of honour do not begin by disavowing its laws and impose nothing by violence and you sir continued the president with a calmness still more terrible than the general's anger i advise you not to touch your sword the general looked around with slight uneasiness however he did not yield but calling up all his fortitude said i will not swear then you must die replied the president calmly monsieur d'epinay became very pale he looked round him for a second time several members of the club were whispering and getting their arms from under their cloaks general said the president do not alarm yourself you are among men of honour who will use every means to convince you before resorting to the last extremity but as you have said you are among conspirators you are in possession of our secret and you must restore it to us a significant silence followed these words and as the general did not reply close the doors said the president to the doorkeeper the same deadly silence succeeded these words then the general advanced and making a violent effort to control his feelings i have a son said he and i ought to think of him finding myself among assassins general said the chief of the assembly one man may insult fifty it is the privilege of weakness but he does wrong to use his privilege follow my advice swear and do not insult the general again daunted by the superiority of the chief hesitated a moment then advancing to the president's desk what is the form said he it is this i swear by my honour not to reveal to any one what i have seen and heard on the fifth of february eighteen fifteen between nine and ten o'clock in the evening and i plead guilty of death should i ever violate this oath the general appeared to be affected by a nervous tremor which prevented his answering for some moments then overcoming his manifest repugnance he pronounced the required oath but in so low a tone as to be scarcely audible to the majority of the members who insisted on his repeating it clearly and distinctly which he did now am i at liberty to retire said the general the president arose appointed three members to accompany him and got into the carriage with the general after bandaging his eyes one of those three members was the coachman who had driven them there the other members silently dispersed where do you wish to be taken asked the president anywhere out of your presence replied m d'epinay beware sir replied the president you are no longer in the assembly and have only to do with individuals do not insult them unless you wish to be held responsible but instead of listening m d'epinay went on you are still as brave in your carriage as in your assembly because you are still four against one the president stopped the coach they were at the part of the quai des ormes where the steps lead down to the river why do you stop here asked d'epinay because sir said the president you have insulted a man and that man will not go one step farther without demanding honourable reparation another method of assassination said the general shrugging his shoulders 
Make no noise, sir. Unless you wish me to consider you as one of the men of whom you spoke just now as cowards, who take their weakness for a shield. You are alone. One alone shall answer you. You have a sword by your side. I have one in my cane. You have no witness. One of these gentlemen will serve you. Now, if you please, remove your bandage. The general tore the handkerchief from his eyes. At last, said he, I shall know with whom I have to do. They opened the door, and the four men alighted. Franz again interrupted himself and wiped the cold drops from his brow. There was something awful in hearing the son read aloud in trembling pallor these details of his father's death, which had hitherto been a mystery. Valentine clasped her hands as if in prayer. Noirtier looked at Villefort with an almost sublime expression of contempt and pride. France continued. It was, as we said, the 5th of February. For three days the mercury had been five or six degrees below freezing, and the steps were covered with ice. The general was stout and tall. The president offered him the side of the railing to assist him in getting down. The two witnesses followed. It was a dark night. The ground from the steps to the river was covered with snow and hoar-frost. The water of the river looked black and deep. One of the seconds went for a lantern in a coal barge near, and by its light they examined the weapons. The president's sword, which was simply, as he had said, one he carried in his cane, was five inches shorter than the general's and had no guard. The general proposed to cast lots for the swords, but the president said it was he who had given the provocation, and when he had given it, he had supposed each would use his own arms. The witnesses endeavored to insist, but the president bade them be silent. The lantern was placed on the ground. The two adversaries took their stations, and the duel began. The light made the two swords appear like flashes of lightning. As for the men, they were scarcely perceptible. The darkness was so great. General Depinay passed for one of the best swordsmen in the army, but he was pressed so closely in the onset that he missed his aim and fell. The witnesses thought he was dead, but his adversary, who knew he had not struck him, offered him the assistance of his hand to rise. The circumstance irritated instead of calming the general, and he rushed on his adversary. But his opponent did not allow his guard to be broken. He received him on his sword, and three times the general drew back on finding himself too closely engaged, and then returned to the charge. At the third he fell again. They thought he slipped, as at first, and the witnesses, seeing he did not move, approached and endeavoured to raise him. But the one who passed his arm around the body found it was moistened with blood. The general, who had almost fainted, revived. Ah, said he, they have sent some fencing master to fight with me. The president, without answering, approached the witness who held the lantern, and raising his sleeve, showed him two wounds he had received in his arm. Then opening his coat and unbuttoning his waistcoat, displayed his side, pierced with a third wound. Still, he had not even uttered a sigh. General Depinay died five minutes after. France read these last words in a voice so choked that they were hardly audible, and then stopped, passing his hand over his eyes as if to dispel a cloud. But after a moment's silence, he continued. The président went up the steps, after pushing his sword into his cane. A track of blood on the snow marked his course. He had scarcely arrived at the top when he heard a heavy splash in the water. It was the general's body, which the witnesses had just thrown into the river, after ascertaining that he was dead. The general fell, then, in a loyal duel, and not in ambush, as it might have been reported. In proof of this, we have signed this paper to establish the truth of the facts, lest the moment should arrive when either of the actors in this terrible scene 
should be accused of premeditated murder or of infringement of the laws of honor. Signed, Beaurepaire, Deschamps, and Le Charpal. When France had finished reading this account, so dreadful for a son, when Valentine, pale with emotion, had wiped away a tear, when Villefort, trembling and crouched in a corner, had endeavoured to lessen the storm by supplicating glances at the implacable old man. Sir, said Depinay to Noirtier, since you are well acquainted with all these details, which are attested by honourable signatures, since you appear to take some interest in me, although you have only manifested it hitherto by causing me sorrow, refuse me not one final satisfaction. Tell me the name of the president of the club, that I may at least know who killed my father. Villefort mechanically felt for the handle of the door. Valentine, who understood sooner than any one her grandfather's answer, and who had often seen two scars upon his right arm, drew back a few steps. "'Mademoiselle,' said France, returning towards Valentine, "'unite your efforts with mine to find out the name of the man who had made me an orphan at two years of age.' Valentine remained dumb and motionless. "'Hold, sir,' said Villefort. "'Do not prolong this dreadful scene. The names have been purposely concealed. My father himself does not know who his president was, and if he knows he cannot tell you. Proper names are not in the dictionary.' "'Oh, misery!' cried Franz. "'The only hope which sustained me and enabled me to read to the end was that of knowing at least the name of him who killed my father. Sir, sir, cried he, turning to Noirtier, do what you can. Make me understand in some way. Yes, replied Noirtier. Oh, mademoiselle, mademoiselle, cried Franz, your grandfather says he can indicate the person. Help me, lend me your assistance. Noirtier looked at the dictionary. France took it with a nervous trembling, and repeated the letters of the alphabet successfully, until he came to M. At that letter the old man signified, yes. M, repeated France. The young man's finger glided over the words, but at each one Noirtier answered by a negative sign. Valentine hid her head between her hands. At length France arrived at the word myself yes you cried franz whose hair stood on end you monsieur noirtier you killed my father yes replied noirtier fixing a majestic look on the young man franz fell powerless on a chair villefort opened the door and escaped for the idea had entered his mind to stifle the little remaining life in the heart of this terrible old man. End of chapter 75 Chapter 76 Progress of Cavalcanti the Younger Meanwhile, Monsieur Cavalcanti, the elder, had returned to his service, not in the army of His Majesty the Emperor of Austria, but at the gaming-table of the baths of Lucca, of which he was one of the most assiduous courtiers. He had spent every farthing that had been allowed for his journey as a reward for the majestic and solemn manner in which he had maintained his assumed character of father. M. Andrea, at his departure, inherited all the papers which proved that he had indeed the honour of being the son of the Marquis Bartolomeo and the Marchioness Oliva Corsinari. He was now fairly launched in that Parisian society which gives such ready access to foreigners, and treats them not as they really are, but as they wish to be considered. Besides, what is required of a young man in Paris? To speak its language tolerably, to make a good appearance, to be a good gamester, and to pay in cash. They are certainly less particular with a foreigner than with a Frenchman. Andrea had then in a fortnight attained a very fair position. He was called Count. He was said to possess fifty thousand livres per annum, 
and his father's immense riches, buried in the quarries of Saravezza, were a constant theme. A learned man, before whom the last circumstance was mentioned as a fact, declared he had seen the quarries in question which gave great weight to assertions hitherto somewhat doubtful, but which now assumed the garb of reality. Such was the state of society in Paris at the period we bring before our readers, when Monte Cristo went one evening to pay M. Donglard a visit. M. Donglard was out, but the Count was asked to go and see the Baroness, and he accepted the invitation. It was never without a nervous shudder since the dinner at Auteuil, and the events which followed it, that Madame Donglard heard Monte Cristo's name announced. If he did not come, the painful sensation became most intense. If, on the contrary, he appeared, his noble countenance, his brilliant eyes, his amiability, his polite attention even towards Madame Danglars, soon dispelled every impression of fear. It appeared impossible to the Baroness that a man of such delightfully pleasing manners should entertain evil designs against her. Besides, the most corrupt minds only suspect evil when it would answer some interested end. Useless injury is repugnant to every mind. When Monte Cristo entered the boudoir, to which we have already once introduced our readers, and where the Baroness was examining some drawings which her daughter passed to her after having looked at them with Monsieur Cavalcanti, his presence soon produced its usual effect, and it was with smiles that the Baroness received the Count although she had been a little disconcerted at the announcement of his name, the latter took in the whole scene at a glance. The Baroness was partially reclining on a sofa. Eugénie sat near her, and Cavalcanti was standing. Cavalcanti, dressed in black like one of Goethe's heroes, with varnished shoes and white silk open-worked stockings, passed a white and tolerably nice-looking hand through his light hair, and so displayed a sparkling diamond, that in spite of Monte Cristo's advice, the vain young man had been unable to resist putting on his little finger. This movement was accompanied by killing glances at Mademoiselle Danglars, and by sighs launched in the same direction. Mademoiselle Danglars was still the same, cold, beautiful, and satirical. Not one of these glances, nor one sigh, was lost on her. They might have been said to fall on the shield of Minerva which some philosophers assert protected sometimes the breast of Sappho. Eugénie bowed coldly to the Count, and availed herself of the first moment when the conversation became earnest to escape to her study, whence very soon two cheerful and noisy voices, being heard in connection with occasional notes of the piano, assured Monte Cristo that Mademoiselle Danglars preferred to his society and to that of Monsieur Cavalcanti the company of Mademoiselle Louise d'Armilly, her singing-teacher. It was then, especially while conversing with Madame Danglars, and apparently absorbed by the charm of the conversation, that the Count noticed M. Andrea Cavalcanti's solicitude, his manner of listening to the music at the door he dared not pass, and of manifesting his admiration. The banker soon returned. His first look was certainly directed towards Monte Cristo, but the second was for Andrea. As for his wife, he bowed to her, as some husbands do to their wives, but in a way that bachelors will never comprehend, until a very extensive code is published on conjugal life. "'Have not the ladies invited you to join them at the piano?' said Danglars to Andrea. "'Alas, no, sir,' replied Andrea with a sigh, still more remarkable than the former ones. Nonglar immediately advanced towards the door and opened it. The two young ladies were seen seated on the same chair at the piano, accompanying themselves each with one hand, a fancy to which they had accustomed themselves, and performed admirably. Mademoiselle d'Armilly, whom they then perceived through the open doorway, formed with Eugénie one of the tableaux vivants of which the Germans are so fond. She was somewhat beautiful and exquisitely formed, a little fairy-like figure with large curls falling on her neck, which was rather too long, as Perugino sometimes makes his virgins, and her eyes dull from fatigue. She was said to have a weak chest, and like Antonia in the Cremona violin, she would die one day while singing. 
Monte Cristo cast one rapid and curious glance round this sanctum. It was the first time he had ever seen Mademoiselle d'Armilly, of whom he had heard much. Well, said the banker to his daughter, are we then all to be excluded? He then led the young man into the study, and either by chance or manoeuvre, the door was partially closed after Andrea, so that from the place where they sat, neither the Count nor the Baroness could see anything. But as the banker had accompanied Andrea, Madame d'Anglars appeared to take no notice of it. The Count soon heard Andrea's voice, singing a Corsican song accompanied by the piano. While the Count smiled at hearing this song, which made him lose sight of Andrea, in the recollection of Benedetto, Madame d'Anglars was boasting to Monte Cristo of her husband's strength of mind, who that very morning had lost three or four hundred thousand francs by a failure at Milan. The praise was well deserved, for had not the Count heard it from the Baroness, or by one of these means by which he knew everything, the Baron's countenance would not have led him to suspect it. Hem, thought Monte Cristo, he begins to conceal his losses a month since he boasted of them. And then aloud, "'Oh, madame, Monsieur Danglars is so skilful. He will soon regain at the bourse what he loses elsewhere.' "'I see that you participate in a prevalent error,' said madame Danglars. "'What is it?' said Monte Cristo. "'That Monsieur Danglars speculates, whereas he never does. "'Truly, madame, I recollect Monsieur de Bray told me, a propos, what is become of him. I have seen nothing of him the last three or four days. Nor I, said Madame Danglars. But you began a sentence, sir, and did not finish. Which? Monsieur de Bray had told you? Ah, oh, yes, he told me it was you who sacrificed to the demon of speculation. I was once very fond of it but I do not indulge now. Then you are wrong, madame. Fortune is precarious, and if I were a woman and fate had made me a banker's wife, whatever might be my confidence in my husband's good fortune, still in speculation you know there is great risk. Well, I would secure for myself a fortune independent of him, even if I acquired it by placing my interests in hands unknown to him. Madame d'Anglars blushed, in spite of all her efforts. "'Stay,' said Monte Cristo, as though he had not observed her confusion. "'I have heard of a lucky hit that was made yesterday on the Neapolitan bonds.' "'I have none, nor have I ever possessed any. But really, we have talked long enough of money, Count. We are like two stockbrokers. Have you heard how fate is persecuting the poor Villefort's? "'What has happened?' said the Count, simulating total ignorance. "'You know the Marquis of saint Méran died a few days after he had set out on his journey to Paris, and the Marchioness a few days after her arrival.' "'Yes,' said Monte Cristo. "'I have heard that. But as Claudius said to Hamlet, "'It is a law of nature their fathers died before them, "'and they mourned their loss. "'They will die before their children,' who will in their turn grieve for them. But that is not all. Not all? No, they were going to marry their daughter to Monsieur Franz d'Epinay. Is it broken off? Yesterday morning, it appears, Franz declined the honour. Indeed. And is the reason known? No. How extraordinary! And how does Monsieur de Villefort bear it? As usual, like a philosopher. Danglars returned at this moment alone. Well, said the Baroness, do you leave Monsieur Calvaganti with your daughter? And Mademoiselle d'Armilly, said the banker. Do you consider her no one? Then turning to Monte Cristo, he said, Prince Cavalcanti is a charming young man, is he not? But is he really a prince? I will not answer for it said Monte Cristo. His father was introduced to me as a marquis, so he ought to be a count, but I do not think he has much claim to that title. Why, said the banker, if he is a prince, he is wrong not to maintain his rank. 
I do not like anyone to deny his origin. Oh, you are a thorough democrat, said Monte Cristo, smiling. But do you see to what you are exposing yourself? said the baroness. If perchance Monsieur de Morcerf came, he would find Monsieur Cavalcanti in that room where he, the betrothed of Eugenie, has never been admitted. You may well say perchance, replied the banker, for he comes so seldom. It would seem only chance that brings him. But should he come and find that young man with your daughter, he might be displeased. He? You are mistaken. Monsieur Albert would not do us the honour to be jealous. He does not like Eugenie sufficiently. Besides, I care not for his displeasure. Still, situated as we are. Yes, do you know how we are situated? At his mother's ball he danced one with Eugenie, and Monsieur Cavalcanti three times, and he took no notice of it. The valet announced the Vicomte Albert de Morcerf. The baroness rose hastily, and was going to the study when Danglars stopped her. "'Let her alone,' said he. She looked at him in amazement. Monte Cristo appeared to be unconscious of what passed. Albert entered, looking very handsome and in high spirits. He bowed politely to the baroness, familiarly to Danglars, and affectionately to Monte Cristo. Then turning to the baroness, "'May I ask how Mademoiselle Danglars is?' said he. "'She is quite well,' replied Danglars quickly. "'She is at the piano with Monsieur Cavalcanti.' Albert retained his calm and indifferent manner. He might feel perhaps annoyed, but he knew Monte Cristo's eye was on him. "'Monsieur Cavalcanti has a fine tenor voice,' said he. "'And Mademoiselle Eugenie a splendid soprano,' And then she plays the piano like a Tolberg. The concert must be a delightful one. They suit each other remarkably well, said Danglars. Albert appeared not to notice this remark, which was, however, so rude that Madame Danglars blushed. I, too, said the young man, am a musician, at least, my masters used to tell me so. But it is strange that my voice never would suit any other, and the soprano less than any. Danglars smiled, and seemed to say, "'It is of no consequence.' Then, hoping doubtless to effect his purpose, he said, "'The prince and my daughter were universally admired yesterday. You were not of the party, Monsieur de Morcerf.' "'What prince?' asked Albert. "'Prince Cavalcanti,' said Danglars, who persisted in giving the young man that title. "'Pardon me,' said Albert. I was not aware that he was a prince. And Prince Cavalcanti sang with Mademoiselle Eugenie yesterday. It must have been charming. Indeed, I regret not having heard them. But I was unable to accept your invitation, having promised to accompany my mother to a German concert given by the Baroness of Chateau Renaud. This was followed by rather an awkward silence. May I also be allowed, said Morcerf, to pay my respects to Mademoiselle Danglars. "'Wait a moment,' said the banker, stopping the young man. "'Do you hear that delightful cavatina? Ta-ta-ta, ti-ta-ta, ta-ta. It is charming. Let them finish. One moment. Bravi, bravi, brava!' The banker was enthusiastic in his applause. "'Indeed,' said Albert. "'It is exquisite.' It is impossible to understand the music of his country better than Prince Cavalcanti does. You said prince, did you not? But he can easily become one, if he is not already. It is no uncommon thing in Italy. But to return to the charming musicians, you should give us a treat, Danglars, without telling them there is a stranger. Ask them to sing one more song. It is so delightful to hear music in the distance when the musicians are unrestrained by observation. Danglars was quite annoyed by the young man's indifference. He took Monte Cristo aside. "'What do you think of our lover?' said he. "'He appears cool. But then your word is given.' "'Yes, doubtless. I have promised to give my daughter to a man who loves her. 
but not to one who does not. See him there, cold as marble and proud like his father. If he were rich, if he had cavalcanti's his fortune, that might be pardoned. Ma foi! I haven't consulted my daughter, but if she has good taste. Oh, said Monte Cristo, my fondness may blind me, but I assure you I consider Morcerf a charming young man, who will render your daughter happy and will sooner or later attain a certain amount of distinction, and his father's position is good. Hm, said Danglars, why do you doubt? The past that obscurity of the past. But that does not affect the sun. Very true. Now I beg of you, don't go off your head. It's a month now that you have been thinking of this marriage, and you must see that it throws some responsibility on me, for it was at my house you met this young Cavalcanti, whom I do not really know at all. But I do. Have you made inquiry? Is there any need of that? Does not his appearance speak for him? And he is very rich. I am not so sure of that. And yet you said he had money. Fifty thousand livres. A mere trifle. He is well educated. Hm, said Monte Cristo in his turn. He is a musician. So are all the Italians. Come, Count. You do not do that young man justice. Well, I acknowledge it annoys me, knowing your connection with the Morcerf family, to see him throw himself in the way. Danglars burst out laughing. Ah, what a Puritan you are, said he. That happens every day. But you cannot break it off in this way. The Morcerfs are depending on this union. Indeed. Positively. Then let them explain themselves. You should give the father a hint. You are so intimate with the family. I? Where the devil did you find out that? At their ball? It was apparent enough. Why, did not the countess, the proud Mercedes, the disdainful Catalan, who will scarcely open her lips to her oldest acquaintances, take your arm, lead you into the garden, into the private walks, and remain there for half an hour. Ah, Baron, Baron, said Albert, you are not listening. What barbarism in a megalomaniac like you? Oh, don't worry about me, Sir Mocker, said Danglars. Then turning to the Count, he said, But will you undertake to speak to the father? Willingly, if you wish it. But let it be done explicitly and positively. If he demands my daughter, let him fix the day, declare his conditions, in short, let us either understand each other or quarrel. You understand? No more delay. Yes, sir, I will give my attention to the subject. I do not say that I await with pleasure his decision, but I do await it. A banker must, you know, be a slave to his promise." and Danglars sighed as M. Cavalcanti had done half an hour before. "'Bravi! Bravo! Brava!' cried Morcerf, parodying the banker, as the selection came to an end. Danglars began to look suspiciously at Morcerf, when someone came and whispered a few words to him. "'I shall soon return,' said the banker to Monte Cristo. "'Wait for me. I shall perhaps have something to say to you.' and he went out. The baroness took advantage of her husband's absence to push open the door of her daughter's study, and Monsieur Andrea, who was sitting before the piano with Mademoiselle Eugénie, started up like a jack-in-a-box. Albert bowed with a smile to Mademoiselle Danglars, who did not appear in the least disturbed, and returned his bow with her usual coolness. Cavalcanti was evidently embarrassed. He bowed to Morcerf, who replied with the most impertinent look impossible. Then Albert launched out in praise of Mademoiselle Danglars' voice, and on his regret, after what he had just heard, that he had been unable to be present the previous evening. Cavalcanti, being left alone, turned to Monte Cristo. "'Come,' said Madame Danglars, "'leave music and compliments. 
and let us go and take tea. Come, Louise, said Mademoiselle Danglars to her friend. They passed into the next drawing-room where tea was prepared. Just as they were beginning, in the English fashion, to leave the spoons in their cups, the door again opened, and Danglars entered, visibly agitated. Monte Cristo observed it particularly, and by a look asked the banker for an explanation. "'I have just received my courier from Greece,' said Danglars. "'Ah, yes,' said the Count, "'and that was the reason of your running away from us.' "'Yes.' "'How is King Otto getting on?' asked Albert, in the most sprightly tone. Danglars cast a suspicious look towards him without answering, and Monte Cristo turned away to conceal the expression of pity which passed over his features, but which had gone in a moment. "'We shall go together, shall we not?' said Albert to the Count. "'If you like,' replied the latter. Albert could not understand the banker's look, and turned to Monte Cristo, who understood it perfectly. "'Did you see?' said he. "'How he looked at me?' "'Yes,' said the Count. "'But did you think there was anything particular in his look?' "'Indeed I did. And what does he mean by his news from Greece?' "'How can I tell you?' "'Because I imagine you have correspondence in that country.' Monte Cristo smiled significantly. Stop, said Albert. Here he comes. I shall compliment Mademoiselle Danglars on her cameo while the father talks to you. If you compliment her at all, let it be on her voice at least, said Monte Cristo. No, every one would do that. My dear Viscount, you are dreadfully impertinent. Albert advanced towards Eugenie, smiling. Meanwhile, Danglars, stooping to Monte Cristo's ear, "'Your advice was excellent,' said he. "'There is a whole history connected with the name Fernand and Yanina.' "'Indeed,' said Monte Cristo. "'Yes, I will tell you all. But take away the young man. I cannot endure his presence.' "'He is going with me. Shall I send the father to you?' "'Immediately.' "'Very well.' The Count made a sign to Albert, and they bowed to the ladies and took their leave, Albert perfectly indifferent to Mademoiselle Danglars' contempt, Monte Cristo reiterating his advice to Madame Danglars on the prudence a banker's wife should exercise in providing for the future. Monsieur Cavalcanti remained master of the field. End of chapter 76 Chapter 77 Haiti Scarcely had the Count's horses cleared the angle of the boulevard than Albert, turning towards the Count, burst into a loud fit of laughter. Much too loud, in fact, not to give the idea of its being rather forced and unnatural. Well, said he, I will ask you the same question which Charles IX put to Catherine de Medicis after the massacre of Saint Bartholomew. How have I played my little part? To what do you allude? asked Monte Cristo. To the installation of my rival at Monsieur Danglars. What rival? Ma foi! What rival? Why, your protege, Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti. Ah, no joking, Viscount. If you please, I do not patronize Monsieur Andrea, at least not as concerns Monsieur Danglars. "'And you would be to blame for not assisting him, "'if the young man really needed your help in that quarter. "'But happily for me, he can dispense with it.' "'What? Do you think he is paying his addresses?' "'I am certain of it. "'His languishing looks and modulated tones "'when addressing Mademoiselle Danglars "'fully proclaim his intentions. "'He aspires to the hand of the proud Eugenie.' "'What does that signify?' so long as they favour your suit. But it is not the case, my dear Count. On the contrary, I am repulsed on all sides. What? It is so indeed. Mademoiselle Eugenie scarcely answers me, and Mademoiselle Darmilly, her confidant, does not speak to me at all. 
"'But the father has the greatest regard possible for you,' said Monte Cristo. "'He? Oh, no. He has plunged a thousand daggers into my heart. Tragedy weapons, uh, I own, which instead of wounding, sheathe their points in their own handles, but daggers which he nevertheless believed to be real and deadly. "'Jealousy indicates affection.' true but i am not jealous he is of whom of debray no of you of me i will engage to say that before a week is past the door will be closed against me you are mistaken my dear viscount prove it to me do you wish me to do so yes well, I am charged with the commission of endeavouring to induce the Comte de Morcerf to make some definite arrangement with the Baron. By whom are you charged? By the Baron himself. Oh, said Albert, with all the cajolery of which he was capable, you surely will not do that, my dear Count. Certainly I shall, Albert, as I have promised to do it. Well, said Albert, with a sigh, it seems you are determined to marry me. I am determined to try and be on good terms with everybody at all events, said Monte Cristo. But a propos of Debray, how is it that I have not seen him lately at the Baron's house? There has been a misunderstanding. What, with the Baroness? No, with the Baron. Has he perceived anything? Ah, that is a good joke. "'Do you think he suspects?' said Monte Cristo, with charming artlessness. "'Where have you come from, my dear Count?' said Albert. "'From Congo, if you will. "'It must be farther off than even that. "'But what do I know of your Parisian husbands?' "'Oh, my dear Count, husbands are pretty much the same everywhere. "'An individual husband of any country is a pretty fair specimen of the whole race.' But then, what can have led to the quarrel between Danglars and Debray? They seem to understand each other so well, said Monte Cristo with renewed energy. Ah, now you are trying to penetrate into the mysteries of Isis, in which I am not initiated. When Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti has become one of the family, you can ask him that question. The carriage stopped. Here we are, said Monte Cristo. "'It is only half-past ten o'clock. Come in.' "'Certainly I will. My carriage shall take you back.' "'No, thank you. I gave orders for my coupe to follow me.' "'There it is, then,' said Monte Cristo, as he stepped out of the carriage. They both went into the house. The drawing-room was lighted up. They went in there. "'You will make tea for us, Baptistine,' said the Count. Baptistine left the room without waiting to answer, and in two seconds reappeared, bringing on a waiter all that his master had ordered, ready prepared, and appearing to have sprung from the ground, like the repasts which we read of in fairy tales. "'Really, my dear Count,' said Morcerf, "'what I admire in you is not so much your riches, for perhaps there are people even wealthier than yourself nor is it only your wit, for Beaumarchais might have possessed as much, but it is your manner of being served, without any questions, in a moment, in a second. It is as if they guessed what you wanted, by your manner of ringing, and made a point of keeping everything you can possibly desire in constant readiness. What you say is perhaps true. They know my habits. For instance, you shall see— how do you wish to occupy yourself during tea-time? Ma foi, I should like to smoke. Monte Cristo took the gong and struck it once. In about the space of a second a private door opened, and Ali appeared bringing two chibouks filled with excellent latakia. It is quite wonderful, said Albert. Oh, no, it is as simple as possible, replied Monte Cristo. Ali knows I generally smoke while I am taking my tea or coffee. He has heard that I ordered tea. And he also knows that I brought you home with me. 
When I summoned him he naturally guessed the reason of my doing so, and as he comes from a country where hospitality is especially manifested through the medium of smoking, he naturally concludes that we shall smoke in company, and therefore brings two chibouks instead of one. And now the mystery is solved. Certainly you give a most commonplace air to your explanation. But is it not the less true that you— Ah, but what do I hear? And Morcerf inclined his head towards the door, through which sounds seemed to issue resembling those of a guitar. Ma foi, my dear Viscount, you are fated to hear music this evening. You have only escaped from Mademoiselle Danglars' piano to be attacked by Hades Guzla. Hades, what an adorable name! Ah, there! Then really women who bear the name of Hades anywhere but in Byron's poems? Certainly there are. Hades is a very uncommon name in France, but is common enough in Albania and Epirus. It is as if you said, for example, chastity, modesty, innocence. It is a kind of baptismal name, as you Parisians call it. Oh, that is charming, said Albert. How I should like to hear my countrymen called Mademoiselle Goodness, Mademoiselle Silence, Mademoiselle Christian Charity. Only think, then, if Mademoiselle Donglard, instead of being called Claire Marie Eugenie, had been named Mademoiselle Chastity Modesty Innocence Donglard. What a fine effect that would have produced on the announcement of her marriage. Hush, said the Count, do not joke in so loud a tone. Hady may hear you, perhaps. And you think she would be angry? No, certainly not, said the Count, with a haughty expression. She is very amiable, then, is she not? said Albert. It is not to be called amiability. It is her duty. A slave does not dictate to a master. Come, you are joking yourself now. Are there any more slaves to be had who bear this beautiful name? Undoubtedly. Really, Count, you do nothing, and have nothing like other people. The slave of the Count of Monte Cristo. Why, it is a rank of itself in France, and from the way in which you lavish money, it is a place that must be worth a hundred thousand francs a year. A hundred thousand francs? The poor girl originally possessed much more than that. She was born to treasures in comparison with which those recorded in the Thousand and One Nights would seem but poverty. She must be a princess, then. You are right, and she is one of the greatest in her country, too. I thought so. But how did it happen that such a great princess became a slave? How was it? that Dionysius the tyrant became a schoolmaster. The fortune of war, my dear Viscount, the caprice of fortune, that is the way in which these things are to be accounted for. And is her name a secret? As regards the generality of mankind it is, but not for you, my dear Viscount, who are one of my most intimate friends, and on whose silence I feel I may rely. If I consider it necessary to enjoin it, may I not do so? Certainly, on my word of honour. You know the history of the Pasha of Yanina, do you not? Of Ali Tepelini? Oh, yes. It was in his service that my father made his fortune. True, I had forgotten that. Well, what is Edi to Ali Tepelini? Merely his daughter. What? The daughter of Ali Pasha? Of Ali Pasha and the beautiful Vasiliki. And your slave? Ma foi, yes. But how did she become so? Why, simply from the circumstance of my having bought her one day as I was passing through the market at Constantinople. Wonderful! Really, my dear Count, you seem to throw a sort of magic influence over all in which you are concerned. When I listen to you, existence no longer seems reality, but a waking dream. 
Now I am perhaps going to make an imprudent and thoughtless request, but say on. But uh, since you go out with Hedy, and sometimes even take her to the opera, well, I think I may venture to ask you this favour. You may venture to ask me anything. Well then, my dear Count, present me to your princess. I will do so, but on two conditions. I accept them at once. The first is that you will never tell anyone that I have granted the interview. Very well, said Albert, extending his hand. I swear I will not. The second is that you will not tell her that your father ever served hers. I give you my oath that I will not. Enough, Viscount. You will remember these two vows, will you not? But I know you to be a man of honour. The Count again struck the gong. Ali reappeared. Tell Hady, said he, that I will take coffee with her, and give her to understand that I desire permission to present one of my friends to her. Ali bowed and left the room. Now, understand me, said the Count. No direct questions, my dear Morcerf. If you wish to know anything, tell me, and I will ask her. Agreed. Ali reappeared for the third time, and drew back the tapestried hanging which concealed the door to signify to his master and Albert that they were at liberty to pass on. Let us go in, said Monte Cristo. Albert passed his hand through his hair and curled his moustache. Then, having satisfied himself as to his personal appearance, followed the Count into the room, the latter having previously resumed his hat and gloves. Ali was stationed as a kind of advanced guard, and the door was kept by the three French attendants commanded by Mirtho. Hady was awaiting her visitors in the first room of her apartments, which was the drawing-room. Her large eyes were dilated with surprise and expectation for it was the first time that any man except Monte Cristo had been accorded an entrance into her presence. She was sitting on a sofa, placed in an angle of the room, with her legs crossed under her in the eastern fashion, and seemed to have made for herself, as it were, a kind of nest in the rich Indian silks which enveloped her. Near her was the instrument on which she was just been playing. It was elegantly fashioned, and worthy of its mistress. On perceiving Monte Cristo, she arose and welcomed him with a smile peculiar to herself, expressive at once of the most implicit obedience, and also of the deepest love. Monte Cristo advanced towards her and extended his hand, which she as usual raised to her lips. Albert had proceeded no farther than the door where he remained rooted to the spot, being completely fascinated by the sight of such surpassing beauty, beheld as it was for the first time, and of which an inhabitant of more northern climes could form no adequate idea. "'Whom do you bring?' asked the young girl in Romaic of Monte Cristo. "'Is it a friend, a brother, or a simple acquaintance, or an enemy?' "'A friend,' said Monte Cristo in the same language. "'What is his name?' Count Albert, it is the same man whom I rescued from the hands of the banditti at Rome. In no other language would you like me to converse with him? Monte Cristo turned to Albert. Do you know modern Greek? asked he. Alas, no, said Albert. Nor even ancient Greek, my dear Count. Never had Homer or Plato a more unworthy scholar than myself. Then, said Hedy, proving by her remark that she had quite understood Monte Cristo's question and Albert's answer. "'Then I will speak either in French or Italian, if my lord so wills it.' Monte Cristo reflected one instant. "'You will speak in Italian,' said he, then turning towards Albert. "'It is a pity you do not understand either ancient or modern Greek.' both of which Hedy speaks so fluently. The poor child will be obliged to talk to you in Italian, which will give you but a very false idea of her powers of conversation. 
The Count made a sign to Hady to address his visitor. Sir, she said to Morcerf, you are most welcome as the friend of my lord and master. This was said in excellent Tuscan, and with that soft Roman accent which makes the language of Dante as sonorous as that of Homer. Then, turning to Ali, she directed him to bring coffee and pipes, and when he had left the room to execute the orders of his young mistress, she beckoned Albert to approach nearer to her. Monte Cristo and Morcerf drew their seats towards a small table, on which were arranged music, drawings, and vases of flowers. Ali then entered bringing coffee and chibouks. As to Monsieur Baptistin, this portion of the building was interdicted to him. Albert refused the pipe which the Nubian offered him. "'Oh, take it! Take it!' said the Count. "'Hedi is almost as civilized as a Parisian. The smell of an Havana is disagreeable to her, but the tobacco of the East is a most delicious perfume, you know.' Ali left the room. The cups of coffee were all prepared, with the addition of sugar which had been brought for Albert. Monte Cristo and Hedi took the beverage in the original Arabian manner, that is to say, without sugar. Hedi took the porcelain cup in her little slender fingers, and conveyed it to her mouth with all the innocent artlessness of a child when eating or drinking something which it likes. At this moment two women entered bringing salvers filled with ices and sherbet, which they placed on two small tables appropriated to that purpose. "'My dear host, and you, signora,' said Albert, in Italian, "'excuse my apparent stupidity. I am quite bewildered, and it is natural that it should be so. Here I am in the heart of Paris, but a moment ago I heard the rumbling of the omnibuses and the tinkling of the bells of the lemonade cellars, and now I feel as if I were suddenly transported to the East, not such as I have seen it, but such as my dreams have painted it. Oh, signora, if I could but speak Greek, your conversation added to the fairy scene which surrounds me would furnish an evening of such delight as it would be impossible for me ever to forget. I speak a sufficient Italian to enable me to converse with you, sir, said Hedy quietly, and if you like what is Eastern, I will do my best to secure the gratification of your tastes while you are here. On what subject shall I converse with her? said Albert in a low tone to Monte Cristo. "'Just what you please. You may speak of her country, and of her youthful reminiscences. Or, if you like it better, you can talk of Rome, Naples, or Florence.' "'Oh,' said Albert, "'it is of no use to be in the company of a Greek if one converses just in the same style as with a Parisian. Let me speak to her of the East.' "'Do so, then. For all of themes which you could choose, that will be the most agreeable to her taste.' Albert turned towards Hedy. "'At what age did you leave Greece, Signora?' asked he. "'I left it when I was but five years old,' replied Hedy. "'And have you any recollection of your country?' "'When I shut my eyes and think, I seem to see it all again. The mind can see as well as the body. The body forgets sometimes, but the mind never forgets.' "'And how far back into the past do your recollections extend?' "'I could scarcely walk when my mother, who was called Vasiliki, which means royal,' said the young girl, tossing her head proudly, "'took me by the hand, and after putting in our purse all the money we possessed, we went out, both covered with veils, to solicit alms for the prisoners, saying, "'He who giveth to the poor lendeth to the Lord.' Then, when our purse was full, we returned to the palace, and without saying a word to my father, we went into the convent, where it was divided amongst the prisoners. "'And how old were you at that time?' "'I was three years old,' said Hedy. "'Then you remember everything that went on about you from the time when you were three years old?' said Albert. "'Everything.' 
"'Count,' said Albert in a low tone to Monte Cristo, "'do allow the signora to tell me something of her history. "'You prohibited my mentioning my father's name to her, "'but perhaps she will allude to him of her own accord in the course of the recital. "'And you have no idea how delighted I should be to hear our name pronounced by such beautiful lips.' Monte Cristo turned to Haiti, and with an expression of countenance which commanded her to pay the most implicit attention to his words, he said in Greek, "'Tell us the fate of your father, but neither the name of the traitor nor the treason.' Haiti sighed deeply, and a shade of sadness clouded her beautiful brow. "'What are you saying to her?' said Morcerf in an undertone. "'I again reminded her that you were a friend.' and that she need not conceal anything from you. Then, said Albert, this pious pilgrimage on behalf of the prisoners was your first remembrance? What is the next? Oh, then I remember, as if it were yesterday, sitting under the shade of some sycamore trees, on the borders of a lake, in the waters of which the trembling foliage was reflected as in a mirror. Under the oldest and thickest of these trees, Reclining on cushions, sat my father. My mother was at his feet, and I, childlike, amused myself by playing with his long white beard, which descended to his girdle, or with the diamond hilt of the scimitar attached to his girdle. Then from time to time there came to him an Albanian, who said something to which I paid no attention, but which he always answered in the same tone of voice. "'Either kill or pardon.' "'It is very strange,' said Albert, "'to hear such words proceed from the mouth of anyone but an actress on the stage, "'and one needs constantly to be saying to oneself, "'This is no fiction. "'It is all reality in order to believe it. "'And how does France appear in your eyes, "'accustomed as they have been to gaze on such enchanted scenes?' "'I think it is a fine country,' said Hedy. "'But I see France as it really is, "'because I look on it with the eyes of a woman, "'whereas my own country, "'which I can only judge of from the impression produced "'on my childish mind, "'always seems enveloped in a vague atmosphere "'which is luminous, or otherwise according "'as my remembrance of it are sad or joyous.' "'So young,' said Albert, forgetting at the moment the Count's command, that he should ask no questions of the slave herself. "'Is it possible that you can have known what suffering is except by name?' Haidee turned her eyes towards Monte Cristo, who, making at the same time some imperceptible sign, murmured, "'Go on.' "'Nothing is ever so firmly impressed on the mind as of the memory of early childhood.' and with the exception of the two scenes I have just described to you, all my earliest reminiscences are fraught with deepest sadness. "'Speak, speak, signora,' said Albert. "'I am listening with the same intense delight and interest to all you say.' Haidee answered this remark with a melancholy smile. "'You wish me, then, to relate the history of my past sorrows,' said she. "'I beg you to do so,' replied Albert. "'Well, I was but four years old, "'when one night I was suddenly awakened by my mother. "'We were in the palace of Janina. "'She snatched me from the cushions on which I was sleeping, "'and on opening my eyes I saw hers filled with tears. "'She took me away without speaking. "'When I saw her weeping I began to cry too. "'Hush, child!' said she. At other times, in spite of maternal endearments or threats, I had with a child's caprice been accustomed to indulge my feelings of sorrow or anger by crying as much as I felt inclined. But on this occasion there was an intonation of such extreme terror in my mother's voice when she enjoined me to silence that I ceased crying as soon as her command was given." she bore me rapidly away. I saw then that we were descending a large staircase. 
Around us were all my mother's servants, carrying trunks, bags, ornaments, jewels, purses of gold, with which they were hurrying away in the greatest distraction. Behind the women came a guard of twenty men, armed with long guns and pistols, and dressed in the costume which the Greeks have assumed since they have again become a nation. You may imagine there was something startling and ominous said Haidy, shaking her head and turning pale at the mere remembrance of the scene. In this long life of slaves and women, only half aroused from sleep, or at least so they appeared to me, who was myself scarcely awake, here and there on the walls of the staircase were reflected gigantic shadows which trembled in the flickering light of the pine torches till they seemed to reach to the vaulted roof above. Quick, said a voice at the end of the gallery. This voice made every one bow before it, resembling in its effect the wind passing over a field of wheat by its superior strength, forcing every ear to yield obeisance. As for me, it made me tremble. This voice was that of my father. He came last, clothed in his splendid robes and holding in his hand the carbine which your emperor presented him. He was leaning on the shoulder of his favourite Selim, and he drove us all before him as a shepherd would his straggling flock. "'My father,' said Hady, raising her head, "'was that illustrious man known in Europe under the name of Ali Tepelini, Pasha of Yanina, and before whom Turkey trembled.' Albert, without knowing why, started on hearing these words pronounced with such a haughty and dignified accent. It appeared to him as if there was something supernaturally gloomy and terrible in the expression which gleamed from the brilliant eyes of Haiti at this moment. She appeared like a pythoness, evoking a spectre, as she recalled to his mind the remembrance of the fearful death of this man, to the news of which all Europe had listened with horror. Soon, said Haiti. We halted on our march, and found ourselves on the borders of a lake. My mother pressed me to her throbbing heart, and at the distance of a few paces I saw my father, who was glancing anxiously around. Four marble steps led down to the water's edge, and below them was a boat floating on the tide. From where we stood I could see in the middle of the lake a large blank mass, it was the kiosk to which we were going. This kiosk appeared to me to be at a considerable distance, perhaps on account of the darkness of the night, which prevented any object from being more than partially discerned. We stepped into the boat. I remember well that the oars made no noise whatever in striking the water, and when I leaned over to ascertain the cause, I saw that they were muffled with the sashes of our palicaras. Besides the rowers, the boat contained only the women, my father, my mother, Selim, and myself. The Palicaris had remained on the shore of the lake, ready to cover our retreat. They were kneeling on the lowest of the marble steps, and in that manner intended making a rampart of the three others. In case of pursuit, our bark flew before the wind. "'Why does the boat go so fast?' asked I of my mother. "'Silence, child! Hush! We are flying!' I did not understand. Why should my father fly? He! The all-powerful! He! Before whom others were accustomed to fly! He who had taken for his device! They hate me, then they fear me! It was indeed a flight which my father was trying to effect— I have been told since that the garrison of the castle of Yanina, fatigued with long service. Here Haidi cast a significant glance at Monte Cristo, whose eyes had been riveted on her countenance during the whole course of her narrative. The young girl then continued, speaking slowly, like a person who is either inventing or suppressing some feature of the history which he is relating. "'You were saying, Signora,' said Albert, who was paying the most implicit attention to the recital. 
that the garrison of Yanina, fatigued with long service, had treated with the Serasker, Korshid, who had been sent by the Sultan to gain possession of the person of my father. It was then that Ali Tepelini, after having sent to the Sultan a French officer in whom he reposed great confidence, resolved to retire to the asylum which he had long before prepared for himself, and which he called Catafijon, or the Refuge. "'And this officer,' said Albert, "'do you remember his name, Signora?' Monte Cristo exchanged a rapid glance with the young girl, which was quite unperceived by Albert. "'No,' said she, "'I do not remember it just at this moment. But if it should occur to me presently, I will tell you.' Albert was on the point of pronouncing his father's name, when Monte Cristo gently held up his finger in token of reproach. The young man recollected his promise, and was silent. It was towards this kiosk that they were rowing, a ground floor ornamented with arabesques, bathing its terraces in the water, and another floor, looking on the lake, was all which was visible to the eye. But beneath the ground floor, stretching out into the island, was a large subterranean cavern, to which my mother, myself, and the women were conducted. In this place, were together sixty thousand pouches and two hundred barrels. The pouches contained twenty-five million of money in gold, and the barrels were filled with thirty thousand pounds of gunpowder. Near the barrels stood Selim, my father's favourite, whom I mentioned to you just now. He stood watch day and night, with a lance provided with a lighted slow match in his hand, and he had orders to blow up everything, kiosk, guards, women, gold, and Ali Tepelini himself, at the first signal given by my father. I remember well that the slaves, convinced of the precarious tenure on which they held their lives, passed whole days and nights in praying, crying, and groaning. As for me, I can never forget the pale complexion and black eyes of the young soldier, and whenever the angel of death summons me to another world, I am quite sure I shall recognize Selim. I cannot tell you how long we remained in this state. At that period I did not even know what time meant. Sometimes, but very rarely, my father summoned me and my mother to the terrace of the palace. These were hours of recreation for me, as I never saw anything in the dismal cavern but the gloomy countenances of the slaves and Selim's fiery lance. My father was endeavouring to pierce with his eager looks the remotest verge of the horizon, examining attentively every black speck which appeared on the lake, while my mother, reclining by his side, rested her head on his shoulder, and I played at his feet admiring everything I saw with that unsophisticated innocence of childhood which throws a charm round objects insignificant in themselves, but which in its eyes are invested with the greatest importance. The heights of Pindus towered above us. The castle of Yanina rose while and angular from the blue waters of the lake and the immense masses of black vegetation which, viewed in the distance, gave the idea of lichens clinging to the rocks, who were in reality gigantic fir-trees and myrtles. One morning my father sent for us. My mother had been crying all the night, and was very wretched. We found the pasha calm, but paler than usual. "'Take courage, Vasiliki,' said he. "'Today arrives the firman of the master.' and my fate will be decided. If my pardon be complete, we shall return triumphant to Yanina. If the news be inauspicious, we must fly this night. But supposing our enemy should not allow for us to do so, said my mother. Oh, make yourself easy on that head, said Ali, smiling. Selim and his flaming lance will settle that matter, 
They would be glad to see me dead, but they would not like themselves to die with me. My mother only answered by sighs to consolations which she knew did not come from my father's heart. She prepared the iced water which he was in the habit of constantly drinking, for since his sojourn at the kiosk he had been parched by the most violent fever, after which she anointed his white beard with perfumed oil and lighted his chibouk, which he sometimes smoked for hours together, quietly watching the wreaths of vapour that ascended in spiral clouds and gradually melted away in the surrounding atmosphere. Presently he made such a sudden movement that I was paralysed with fear. Then, without taking his eyes from the object which had first attracted his attention, he asked for his telescope. My mother gave it to him, and as she did so, looked whiter than the marble against which she leaned. I saw my father's hand tremble. "'A boat! Two! Three! murmured my father. Four! He then arose, seizing his arms and priming his pistols. Vasiliki, said he to my mother, trembling perceptibly, the instant approaches which will decide everything. In the space of half an hour we shall know the emperor's answer. Go into the cavern with Haiti. I will not quit you, said Vasiliki. If you die, my lord, I will die with you. Go to Selim, cried my father. Adieu, my lord, murmured my mother, determining quietly to await the approach of death. Take away, Vasiliki, said my father to his palicaris. As for me, I had been forgotten in the general confusion. I ran toward Ali Tepelini. He saw me hold out my arms to him, and he stooped down and pressed my forehead with his lips. Oh, how distinctly I remember that kiss! It was the last he ever gave me, and I feel as if it were still warm on my forehead. On descending, we saw through the lattice work several boats which were gradually becoming more distinct to our view. At first they appeared like black specks, and now they looked like birds skimming the surface of the waves. During this time, in the kiosk at my father's feet were seated twenty palicares, concealed from view by an angle of the wall, and watching with eager eyes the arrival of the boats. They were armed with their long guns inlaid with mother-of-pearl and silver, and cartridges in great numbers were lying scattered on the floor. My father looked at his watch, and paced up and down with a countenance expressive of the greatest anguish. This was the scene which presented itself to my view as I quitted my father after that last kiss. My mother and I traversed the gloomy passage leading to the cavern. Selim was still at his post and smiled sadly on us as we entered. We fetched our cushions from the other end of the cavern and sat down by Selim. In great dangers the devoted ones cling to each other, and young as I was, I quite understood that some imminent danger was hanging over our heads. Albert had often heard, not from his father, for he never spoke on the subject, but from strangers, the description of the last moments of the vizier of Yanina. He had read different accounts of his death, but the story seemed to acquire fresh meaning from the voice and expression of the young girl, and her sympathetic accent, and the melancholy expression of her countenance, at once charmed and horrified him. As to Haiti, these terrible reminiscences seemed to have overpowered her for a moment, for she ceased speaking, her head leaning on her hand like a beautiful flower bowing beneath the violence of the storm, and her eyes gazing on vacancy indicated that she was mentally contemplating the green summit of the Pindus and the blue waters of the lake of Yanina, which, like a magic mirror, seemed to reflect the sombre picture which she sketched. Monte Cristo looked at her with an indescribable expression of interest and pity. "'Go on,' said the Count in the Romaic language. 
Hady looked up abruptly, as if the sonorous tones of Monte Cristo's voice had awakened her from a dream, and she resumed her narrative. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon, and although the day was brilliant out of doors, we were enveloped in the gloomy darkness of the cavern. One single solitary light was burning there, and it appeared like a star set in a heaven of blackness. It was Selim's flaming lance. My mother was a Christian, and she prayed. Selim repeated from time to time the sacred words, God is great. However, my mother had still some hope. As she was coming down, she thought she recognized the French officer who had been sent to Constantinople, and in whom my father placed so much confidence, for he knew that all the soldiers of the French emperor were naturally noble and generous. She advanced some steps towards the staircase and listened. "'They are approaching,' said she. "'Perhaps they bring us peace and liberty.' "'What do you hear, Vasiliki?' said Selim, in a voice at once so gentle and yet so proud. "'If they do not bring us peace, we will give them war. If they do not bring life, we will give them death.' and he renewed the flame of his lance, with a gesture which made one think of Dionysus of Crete. But I, being only a little child, was terrified by this undaunted courage, which appeared to me both ferocious and senseless, and I recoiled with horror from the idea of the frightful death amidst fire and flames which probably awaited us. My mother experienced the same sensations, for I felt her tremble. "'Mama, mamma," said I, are you really to be killed? And at the sound of my voice, the slaves redoubled their cries and prayers and lamentations. My child, said Vasiliki, may God preserve you from ever wishing for that death which today you so much dread. Then, whispering to Selim, she asked what were her master's orders. If he sent me his poniard, it will signify that the emperor's intentions are not favorable and I am to set fire to the powder. If, on the contrary, he sent me his ring, it will be a sign that the emperor pardons him, and I am to extinguish the match and leave the magazine untouched. My friend, said my mother, when your master's orders arrive, if it is the poniard which he sends, instead of dispatching us by that horrible death which we both so much dread, he will mercifully kill us with this same poniard, will you not? Yes, Vasiliki, replied Selim tranquilly. Suddenly we heard loud cries, and listening discerned that they were cries of joy. The name of the French officer, who had been sent to Constantinople, resounded on all sides amongst our palicaris. It was evident that he brought the answer of the emperor, and that it was favorable. And do you not remember the Frenchman's name? said Morcerf, quite ready to aid the memory of the narrator. Monte Cristo made a sign to him to be silent. "'I do not recollect it,' said Hady. The noise increased. Steps were heard approaching nearer and nearer. They were descending the steps leading to the cavern. Selim made ready his lance. Soon a figure appeared in the grey twilight at the entrance of the cave, formed by the reflection of the few rays of daylight which had found their way into this gloomy retreat. "'Who are you?' cried Selim. "'But whoever you may be, I charge you not to advance another step.' "'Long live the Emperor,' said the figure. "'He grants a full pardon to the vizier Ali, and not only gives him his life, but restores to him his fortune and his possessions.' My mother uttered a cry of joy, and clasped me to her bosom. "'Stop,' said Selim, seeing that she was about to go out. "'You see, I have not yet received the ring.' "'True,' said my mother. And she fell on her knees, at the same time holding me up towards heaven, as if she desired, while praying to God in my behalf, to raise me actually to his presence. And for the second time, Hady stopped, overcome by such violent emotion that the perspiration stood upon her pale brow, and her stifled voice seemed hardly able to find utterance 
so parched and dry were her throat and lips. Monte Cristo poured a little iced water into a glass, and presented it to her, saying with a mildness in which was also a shade of command, Courage! Haiti dried her eyes and continued. By this time our eyes, habituated to the darkness, had recognized the messenger of the Pasha. It was a friend. Selim had also recognized him, but the brave young man only acknowledged one duty, which was to obey. "'In whose name do you come?' said he to him. "'I come in the name of our master, Ali Tepelini. "'If you come from Ali himself,' said Selim, "'you know what you are charged to remit to me.' "'Yes,' said the messenger, "'and I bring you his ring.' At these words he raised his hand above his head to show the token, but it was too far off, and there was no light enough to enable Selim, where he was standing, to distinguish and recognize the object presented to his view. "'I do not see what you have in your hand,' said Selim. "'Approach, then,' said the messenger, "'or I will come nearer to you if you prefer it.' "'I will agree to neither one nor the other.' replied the young soldier. Place the object which I desire to see in the ray of light which shines there, and retire while I examine it. Be it so, said the envoy, and he retired after having first deposited the token agreed on in the place pointed out to him by Selim. Oh, how our hearts palpitated, for it did indeed seem to be a ring which was placed there. But was it my father's ring? That was the question. Selim, still holding in his hand the lighted match, walked towards the opening in the cavern, and, aided by the faint light which streamed in through the mouth of the cave, picked up the token. "'It is well,' said he, kissing it. "'It is my master's ring.' And throwing the match on the ground, he trampled on it and extinguished it. The messenger uttered a cry of joy and clapped his hands. At this signal, four soldiers of the Seraska Korshid suddenly appeared, and Selim fell, pierced by five blows. Each man had stabbed him separately, and intoxicated by their crime, though still pale with fear, they sought all over the cavern to discover if there was any fear of fire, after which they amused themselves by rolling on the backs of gold. At this moment my mother seized me in her arms, and, hurrying noiselessly along the numerous turnings and windings known only to ourselves, she arrived at a private staircase of the kiosk, where was a scene of frightful tumult and confusion. The lower rooms were entirely filled with Korshid's troops, that is to say, with our enemies. Just as my mother was on the point of pushing open a small door, we heard the voice of the Pasha sounding in a loud and threatening tone. My mother applied her eye to the crack between the boards. I luckily found a small opening which afforded me a view of the apartment and what was passing within. "'What do you want?' said my father to some people who were holding a paper inscribed with characters of gold. "'What we want,' replied one, "'is to communicate to you the will of His Highness. Do you see this ferman?' "'I do,' said my father. "'Well, read it. He demands your head.' My father answered with a loud laugh, which was more frightful than even threats would have been, and he had not ceased when two reports of a pistol were heard. He had fired them himself, and had killed two men. The palicares, who were prostrated at my father's feet, now sprang up and fired, and the room was filled with fire and smoke. At the same instant the firing began on the other side, and the balls penetrated the boards all around us. Oh, how noble did the Grand Vizier, my father, look at that moment! In the midst of the flying bullets, his scimitar in his hand, and his face blackened with the powder of his enemies. And how he terrified them, even then, and made them fly before him! "'Selim! Selim!' cried he. "'Guardian of the fire! Do your duty!' "'Selim is dead,' replied a voice which seemed to come from the depths of the earth, 
and you are lost, Ali. At the same moment an explosion was heard, and the flooring of the room in which my father was sitting was suddenly torn up and shivered to atoms. The troops were firing from underneath. Three or four palicaris fell with their bodies literally ploughed with wounds. My father howled aloud, plunged his fingers into the holes which the balls had made, and tore up one of the planks entire. But immediately, through this opening, twenty more shots were fired, and the flame, rushing up like fire from the crater of a volcano, soon reached the tapestry, which it quickly devoured. In the midst of all this frightful tumult and these terrific cries, two reports, fearfully distinct, followed by two shrieks more heart-rending than all, froze me with terror. These two shots had mortally wounded my father, and it was he who had given utterance to these frightful cries. However, he remained standing, clinging to a window. My mother tried to force the door, that she might go and die with him, but it was fastened on the inside. All around him were lying the palicaris, writhing in convulsive agonies, while two or three, who were only slightly wounded, were trying to escape by springing from the windows. At this crisis the whole flooring suddenly gave way. My father fell on one knee, and at the same moment twenty hands were thrust forth, armed with sabres, pistols, and poniards. Twenty blows were instantaneously directed against one man, and my father disappeared in a whirlwind of fire and smoke, kindled by these demons, and which seemed like hell itself, opening beneath his feet. I felt myself fall to the ground. My mother had fainted. Hades' arms fell by her side, and she uttered a deep groan. At the same time, looking towards the Count, as if to ask if he was satisfied with her obedience to his commands, Monte Cristo arose and approached her, took her hand, and said to her in Romaic, "'Calm yourself, my dear child, and take courage in remembering that there is a God who will punish traitors.' "'It is a frightful story, Count,' said Albert, terrified at the paleness of Hades' countenance. "'And I reproach myself now for having been so cruel and thoughtless in my request.' "'Oh, it is nothing,' said Monte Cristo. Then, patting the young girl on the head, he continued, "'Hady is very courageous, and she sometimes even finds consolation in the recital of her misfortunes.' "'Because, my lord,' said Hady eagerly, "'my miseries recall to me the remembrance of your goodness.' Albert looked at her with curiosity, for she had not yet related what he most desired to know, how she had become the slave of the Count. Hady saw at a glance the same expression pervading the countenance of her two auditors. She exclaimed, "'When my mother recovered her senses, we were before the Serasker. "'Kill,' said she, "'but spare the honour of the widow of Ali.' "'It is not to me whom you must address yourself,' said Korshid. "'To whom, then?' "'To your new master.' "'Who and where is he?' "'He is here.' And Korshid pointed out one who had more than any contributed to the death of my father, said Hady in a tone of chastened anger. "'Then,' said Albert, "'you became the property of this man?' "'No,' replied Hady. "'He did not dare to keep us. So we were sold to some slave merchants who were going to Constantinople. We traversed Greece.' and arrived half dead at the imperial gates. They were surrounded by a crowd of people who opened a way for us to pass, when suddenly my mother, having looked closely at an object which was attracting their attention, uttered a piercing cry and fell to the ground, pointing as she did so to a head which was placed over the gates, and beneath which were inscribed these words, This is the head of Ali Tepelini, Pasha of Yanina. I cried bitterly, and tried to raise my mother from the earth, but she was dead. I was taken to the slave market, and was purchased by a rich Armenian. He caused me to be instructed, gave me masters, and when I was thirteen years of age, 
he sold me to the Sultan Mahmud. Of whom I bought her, said Monte Cristo. As I told you, Albert, with the emerald which formed a match to the one I had made into a box for the purpose of holding my hashish pills. Oh, you are good, you are great, my lord, said Haley, kissing the Count's hand, and I am very fortunate in belonging to such a master. Albert remained quite bewildered with all that he had seen and heard. Come, finish your cup of coffee, said Monte Cristo. The history is ended. End of chapter 77 Chapter 78 We Hear From Yanina If Valentine could have seen the trembling step and agitated countenance of France when he quitted the chamber of Monsieur Noirtier, even she would have been constrained to pity him. Villefort had only just given utterance to a few incoherent sentences, and then retired to his study, where he received, about two hours afterwards, the following letter. After all the disclosures which were made this morning, M. Noirtier de Villefort must see the utter impossibility of any alliance being formed between his family and that of M. Franz d'Epinay. M. d'Epinay must say that he is shocked and astonished that M. de Villefort, who appeared to be aware of all the circumstances detailed this morning, should not have anticipated him in his announcement. No one who had seen the magistrate at this moment, so thoroughly unnerved by the recent inauspicious combination of circumstances, would have supposed for an instant that he had anticipated the annoyance, although it certainly never had occurred to him that his father would carry candour, or rather rudeness, so far as to relate such a history. And in justice to Villefort, it must be understood that M. Noirtier, who never cared for the opinion of his son on any subject, had always omitted to explain the affair to Villefort, so that he had all his life entertained the belief that General de Quesnel, or the Baron d'Epinay, as he was alternately styled, according as the speaker wished to identify him by his own family name, or by the title which had been conferred on him, fell the victim of assassination, and not that he was killed fairly in a duel. This harsh letter, coming as it did from a man generally so polite and respectful, struck a mortal blow at the pride of Villefort. Hardly had he read the letter, when his wife entered. The sudden departure of France, after being summoned by M. Noirtier, had so much astonished everyone that the position of Madame de Villefort, left alone with the notary and the witnesses, became every moment more embarrassing. Determined to bear it no longer, she arose and left the room, saying she would go and make some inquiries into the cause of his sudden disappearance. M. de Villefort's communications on the subject were very limited and concise. He told her, in fact, that an explanation had taken place between M. Noirtier, M. d'Epinay, and himself and that the marriage of Valentine and France would consequently be broken off. This was an awkward and unpleasant thing to have to report to those who were awaiting her return in the chamber of her father-in-law. She therefore contented herself with saying that Monsieur Noirtier, having at the commencement of the discussion been attacked by a sort of apoplectic fit, the affair would necessarily be deferred for some days longer. This news false as it was following so singularly in the train of the two similar misfortunes which had so recently occurred, evidently astonished the auditors, and they retired without a word. During this time Valentine, at once terrified and happy, after having embraced and thanked the feeble old man for thus breaking with a single blow the chain which she had been accustomed to consider as irrefragable, asked leave to retire to her own room, in order to recover her composure. Noirtier looked the permission which she solicited, but instead of going to her own room, Valentine, having once gained her liberty, entered the gallery, and, opening a small door at the end of it, found herself at once in the garden. In the midst of all the strange events which had crowded one on the other, an indefinable sentiment of dread had taken possession of Valentine's mind. She expected every moment that she should see Morel appear pale and trembling, 
to forbid the signing of the contract, like the Laird of Ravenswood in The Bride of Lammermoor. It was high time for her to make her appearance at the gate, for Maximilian had long awaited her coming. He had half guessed what was going on when he saw France quit the cemetery with Monsieur de Villefort. He followed Monsieur d'Epinay, saw him enter, afterwards go out and then re-enter with Albert and Chateau Renaud. He had no longer any doubts as to the nature of the conference. He therefore quickly went to the gate in the clover patch, prepared to hear the result of the proceedings, and very certain that Valentine would hasten to him the first moment she should be set at liberty. He was not mistaken. Peering through the crevices of the wooden partition, he soon discovered the young girl, who cast aside all her usual precautions and walked at once to the barrier. The first glance which Maximilian directed towards her entirely reassured him, and the first words she spoke made his heart bound with delight. "'We are saved,' said Valentine. "'Saved?' repeated Morel, not being able to conceive such intense happiness. "'By whom?' "'By my grandfather. Oh, Morel, pray love him for all his goodness to us.' Morel swore to love him with all his soul, and at that moment he could safely promise to do so, for he felt as though it were not enough to love him merely as a friend or even as a father. "'But tell me, Valentine, how has it all been affected? What strange means has he used to compass this blessed end?' Valentine was on the point of relating all that had passed, but she suddenly remembered that in doing so she must reveal a terrible secret which concerned others as well as her grandfather, and she said, "'At some future time I will tell you all about it.' "'But when will that be?' "'When I am your wife.' The conversation had now turned upon a topic so pleasing to Morel that he was ready to accede to anything that Valentine thought fit to propose and he likewise felt that a piece of intelligence such as he just heard ought to be more than sufficient to content him for one day. However, he would not leave without the promise of seeing Valentine again the next night. Valentine promised all that Morel required of her, and certainly it was less difficult now for her to believe that she should marry Maximilian than it was an hour ago to assure herself that she should not marry France. During the time occupied by the interview we have just detailed, Madame de Villefort had gone to visit Monsieur Noirtier. The old man looked at her with that stern and forbidding expression with which he was accustomed to receive her. "'Sir,' said she, "'it is superfluous for me to tell you that Valentine's marriage is broken off, since it was here that the affair was concluded.' Noirtier's countenance remained immovable. But one thing I can tell you, of which I do not think you are aware, that is, that I have always been opposed to this marriage, and that the contract was entered into entirely without my consent or approbation. Noirtier regarded his daughter-in-law with the look of a man desiring an explanation. Now that this marriage, which I know you so much disliked, is done away with, I come to you on an errand which neither Monsieur de Villefort nor Valentine could consistently undertake. Noirtier's eyes demanded the nature of her mission. I come to entreat you, sir, continued Madame de Villefort, as the only one who has the right of doing so, inasmuch as I am the only one who will receive no personal benefit from the transaction. I come to entreat you to restore, not your love, for that she has always possessed, but to restore your fortune to your granddaughter. There was a doubtful expression in Noirtier's eyes. He was evidently trying to discover the motive of this proceeding, and he could not succeed in doing so. "'May I hope, sir,' said Madame de Villefort, "'that your intentions accord with my request?' Noirtier made a sign that they did. "'In that case, sir,' rejoined Madame de Villefort. I will leave you overwhelmed with gratitude and happiness at your prompt acquiescence to my wishes. She then bowed to M. Noirtier and retired. The next day M. Noirtier sent for the notary. The first will was torn up and a second made, in which he left the whole of his fortune to Valentine, 
on condition that she should never be separated from him. It was then generally reported that Mademoiselle de Villefort, the heiress of the Marquis and Marchioness of saint Meran, had regained the good graces of her grandfather, and that she would ultimately be in possession of an income of three hundred thousand livres. While all the proceedings relative to the dissolution of the marriage contract were being carried on at the house of M. de Villefort, Monte Cristo had paid his visit to the Count of Morcerf, who, in order to lose no time in responding to M. Danglars' wishes, and at the same time to pay all due deference to his position in society, donned his uniform of lieutenant-general, which he ornamented with all his crosses, and thus attired, ordered his finest horses, and drove to the Rue de la Chausse d'Antin. Danglars was balancing his monthly accounts, and it was perhaps not the most favourable moment for finding him in his best humour. At the first sight of his old friend, Danglars assumed his majestic air, and settled himself in his easy-chair. Morcerf, usually so stiff and formal, accosted the banker in an affable and smiling manner, and, feeling sure that the overture he was about to make would be well received, he did not consider it necessary to adopt any manoeuvres in order to gain his end, but went at once straight to the point. "'Well, Baron,' said he, "'here I am at last. Some time has elapsed since our plans were formed, and they are not yet executed.' Morcerf paused at these words, quietly waiting till the cloud should have dispersed which had gathered on the brow of Danglars, and which he attributed to his silence. But on the contrary to his great surprise, it grew darker and darker. "'To what do you allude, monsieur?' said Danglars, as if he were trying in vain to guess at the possible meaning of the general's words. "'Ah,' said Morcerf, "'I see you are a stickler for forms, my dear sir, and you would remind me that the ceremonial rites should not be omitted. Ma foi, I beg your pardon, but as I have but one son, and it is the first time I have ever thought of marrying him, I am still serving my apprenticeship, you know. Come, I will reform. And Morcerf, with a forced smile, arose, and making a low bow to Monsieur Danglars, said, Baron, I have the honour of asking you view the hand of Mademoiselle Eugénie Danglars for my son, the Vicomte Albert de Morcerf. But Danglars, instead of receiving this address in the favourable manner which Morcerf had expected, knit his brow and without inviting the Count, who was still standing to take a seat, he said, "'Monsieur, it will be necessary to reflect before I give you an answer.' "'To reflect?' said Morcerf, more and more astonished. "'Have you not had enough time for reflection during the eight years which have elapsed since this marriage was first discussed between us?' "'Count,' said the banker, "'things are constantly occurring in the world to induce us to lay aside our most established opinions, or at all events to cause us to remodel them according to the change of circumstances which may have placed affairs in a totally different light to that in which we at first viewed them. "'I do not understand you, Baron,' said Morcerf. "'What I mean to say is this, sir, that during the last fortnight unforeseen circumstances have occurred.' "'Excuse me,' said Morcerf, "'but is it a play we are acting?' "'A play?' "'Yes, for it is like one. Pray let us come more to the point, and endeavour thoroughly to understand each other.' "'That is quite my desire.' "'You have seen Monsieur de Monte Cristo, have you not?' "'I see him very often,' said Danglars, drawing himself up. "'He is a particular friend of mine.' "'Well, in one of your late conversations with him, "'you said that I appeared to be forgetful and irresolute "'concerning this marriage, did you not?' "'I did say so. "'Well, here I am, proving at once that I am really neither the one nor the other, "'by entreating you to keep your promise on that score.' "'Danglars did not answer. "'Have you so soon changed your mind?' added Morcerf. "'Or have you only provoked my request?' that you may have the pleasure of seeing me humbled. Danglars, seeing that if he continued the conversation in the same tone in which he had begun it, the whole thing might turn out to his own disadvantage, turned to Morcerf and said, "'Count, you must doubtless be surprised at my reserve, 
and I assure you it cost me much to act in such a manner towards you. But believe me when I say that imperative necessity has imposed the painful task upon me. These are also many empty words, my dear sir, said Morcerf. They might satisfy a new acquaintance, but the Comte de Morcerf does not rank in that list, and when a man like him comes to another, recalls to him his plighted word, and this man fails to redeem the pledge, he has at least a right to exact from him a good reason for doing so. Danglars was a coward, but did not wish to appear so. He was piqued at the tone which Morcerf had just assumed. "'I am not without a good reason for my conduct,' replied the banker. "'What do you mean to say?' I mean to say that I have good reason, but that it is difficult to explain. You must be aware, at all events, that it is impossible for me to understand motives before they are explained to me. But one thing at least is clear, which is, that you decline allying yourself with my family. No, sir, said Danglars, I merely suspend my decision, that is all. And do you really flatter yourself that I shall yield to all your caprice and quietly and humbly await the time of again being received into your good graces? Then, Count, if you will not wait, we must look upon these projects as if they had never been entertained. The Count bit his lips till the blood almost started. To prevent the ebullition of anger which his proud and irritable temper scarcely allowed him to restrain, Understanding, however, that in the present state of things the laugh would decidedly be against him, he turned from the door towards which he had been directing his steps, and again confronted the banker. A cloud settled on his brow, evincing decided anxiety and uneasiness, instead of the expression of offended pride which had lately reigned there. "'My dear Donglars, said Morcerf, "'we have been acquainted for many years.' and consequently we ought to make some allowance for each other's failings. You owe me an explanation, and really it is but fair that I should know what circumstance has occurred to deprive my son of your favour. It is from no personal ill-feeling towards the Viscount, that is all I can say, sir, replied Danglars, who resumed his insolent manner as soon as he perceived that Morcerf was a little softened and calmed down. "'And towards whom do you bear this personal ill-feeling, then?' said Morcerf, turning pale with anger. The expression of the Count's face had not remained unperceived by the banker. He fixed on him a look of greater assurance than before, and said, "'You may perhaps be better satisfied that I should not go farther into particulars.' A tremor of suppressed rage shook the whole frame of the Count, and making a violent effort over himself, he said, "'I have a right to insist on your giving me an explanation. Is it Madame de Morcerf who has displeased you? Is it my fortune which you find insufficient? Is it because my opinions differ from yours?' "'Nothing of the kind, sir,' replied Danglars. "'If such had been the case, I only should have been to blame, inasmuch as I was aware of all these things when I made the engagement. No.' Do not seek any longer to discover the reason. I really am quite ashamed to have been the cause of your undergoing such severe self-examination. Let us drop the subject and adopt the middle course of delay, which implies neither a rupture nor an engagement. Ma foi, there is no hurry. My daughter is only seventeen years old, and your son twenty-one. While we wait, time will be progressing, events will succeed each other. Things which in the evening look dark and obscure appear but too clearly in the light of morning, and sometimes the utterance of one word, or the lapse of a single day, will reveal the most cruel calumnies. "'Calumnies, did you say, sir?' cried Morcerf, turning livid with rage. "'Does any one dare to slander me?' "'Monsieur, I told you that I considered it best to avoid all explanation.' "'Then, sir, I am patiently to submit to your refusal?' "'Yes, sir. Although I assure you the refusal is as painful for me to give as it is for you to receive, 
for I had reckoned on the honour of your alliance, and the breaking off of a marriage contract always injures the lady more than the gentleman. Enough, sir, said Morcerf. We will speak no more on the subject. And clutching his gloves in anger, he left the apartment. Danglars observed that during the whole conversation Morcerf had never once dared to ask if it was on his own account that Danglars recalled his word. That evening he had a long conference with several friends, and M. Cavalcanti, who had remained in the drawing-room with the ladies, was the last to leave the banker's house. The next morning, as soon as he awoke, Danglars asked for the newspapers. They were brought to him. He laid aside three or four, and at last fixed on the impartial, the paper of which Beauchamp was the chief editor. He hastily tore off the cover, opened the journal with nervous precipitation, passed contemptuously over the Paris jottings, and arriving at the miscellaneous intelligence, stopped with a malicious smile at a paragraph headed, We hear from Yanina. Very good, observed Danglars, after having read the paragraph. Here is a little article on Colonel Fernand, which, if I am not mistaken, would render the explanation which the Comte de Morcerf required of me perfectly unnecessary. At the same moment, that is, at nine o'clock in the morning, Albert de Morcerf, dressed in a black coat, buttoned up to his chin, might have been seen walking with a quick and agitated step in the direction of Monte Cristo's house in the Champs d'Elysees. When he presented himself at the gate, the porter informed him that the Count had gone out about half an hour previously. Did he take the Baptistin with him? No, my lord. Call him, then. I wish to speak to him. The concierge went to seek the valet de chambre, and returned with him in an instant. My good friend, said Albert, I beg pardon for my intrusion, but I was anxious to know from your own mouth if your master was really out or not. He is really out, sir, replied Baptistin. Out even to me? I know how happy my master always is to receive the vicomte, said Baptistin, and I should therefore never think of including him in any general order. You are right, and now I wish to see him on an affair of great importance. Do you think it will be long before he comes in? No, I think not, for he ordered his breakfast at ten o'clock. Well, I will go and take a turn in the Champs d'Elysees, and at ten o'clock I will return here. Meanwhile, if the Count should come in, will you beg him not to go out again without seeing me? You may depend on my doing so, sir, said a Baptistin. Albert left the cab in which he had come at the Count's door, intending to take a turn on foot. As he was passing the Allée des Veuves, he thought he saw the Count's horses standing at Gosset's shooting-gallery. He approached, and soon recognized the coachman. "'Is the Count shooting in the gallery?' said Morcerf. "'Yes, sir,' replied the coachman. While he was speaking, Albert had heard the report of two or three pistol-shots. He entered, and on his way met the waiter. "'Excuse me, my lord,' said the lad. "'But will you have the kindness to wait a moment?' "'Wait for Philippe?' asked Albert, who, being a constant visitor there, did not understand this opposition to his entrance. "'Because the person who is now in the gallery prefers being alone, and never practices in the presence of any one. "'Not even before you, Philippe? "'Then who loads his pistol?' "'His servant.' A Nubian? A Negro. It is he, then. Do you know this gentleman? Yes, and I am come to look for him. He is a friend of mine. Oh, that is quite another thing. Then I will go immediately and inform him of your arrival. And Philippe, urged by his own curiosity, entered the gallery. A second afterwards Monte Cristo appeared on the threshold. "'I ask your pardon, my dear Count,' said Albert, "'for following you here. "'And I must first tell you that it was not the fault of your servants that I did so. "'I alone am to blame for the indiscretion. "'I went to your house, and they told me you were out, "'but that they expected you home at ten o'clock to breakfast. "'I was walking about in order to pass away the time till ten o'clock, 
when I caught sight of your carriage and horses. What you have just said induces me to hope that you intend breakfasting with me. No, thank you. I am thinking of other things besides breakfast just now. Perhaps we may take that meal at a later hour, and in worse company. What on earth are you talking about? I am to fight to-day. For what? I am going to fight. Yes, I understand that. But what is the quarrel? People fight for all sorts of reasons, you know. I fight in the cause of honour. Ah, that is something serious. So serious that I come to beg you to render me a service. What is it? To be my second. That is a serious matter, and we will not discuss it here. Let us speak of nothing till we get home. Ali, bring me some water. The Count turned up his sleeves and passed into the little vestibule where the gentlemen were accustomed to wash their hands after shooting. "'Come in, my lord,' said Philippe, in a low tone, "'and I will show you something droll.' Morcerf entered, and in place of the usual target he saw some playing cards fixed against the wall. At a distance Albert thought it was a complete suit, for he counted from the ace to the ten. "'Aha!' said Albert. "'I see you are preparing for a game of cards.' "'No,' said the Count. "'I was making a suit.' "'How?' said Albert. "'Those are really aces and twos which you see, but my shots have turned them into threes, fives, sevens, eights, nines, and tens.' Albert approached. In fact, the bullets had actually pierced the cards in the exact places which the painted signs would otherwise have occupied, the lines and distances being as regularly kept as if they had been ruled with pencil. Diable, said Morcerf. What would you have, my dear Viscount? said Monte Cristo, wiping his hands on the towel which Ali had brought him. I must occupy my leisure moments in some way or other. But come, I am waiting for you. Both men entered Monte Cristo's carriage, which in the course of a few minutes deposited them safely at number thirty. Monte Cristo took Albert into his study, and pointing to a seat, placed another for himself. Now let us talk the matter over quietly, said the Count. You see, I am perfectly composed, said Albert. With whom are you going to fight? With Beauchamp. One of your friends. Of course. It is always with friends that one fights. I suppose you have some cause of quarrel. I have. What has he done to you? There appeared in his journal last night. But wait, read for yourself. And Albert handed over the paper to the Count, who read as follows. A correspondent at Janina informs us of a fact of which until now we had remained in ignorance. The castle which formed the protection of the town was given up to the Turks by a French officer named Fernand, in whom the Grand Vizier, Ali Tepelini, had reposed the greatest confidence. Well, said Monte Cristo, what do you see in that to annoy you? What do I see in it? Yes, what does it signify to you if the castle of Janina was given up by a French officer. It signifies to my father, the Count of Morcerf, whose Christian name is Fernand. Did your father serve under Ali Pasha? Yes, that is to say, he fought for the independence of the Greeks, and hence arises the calumny. Oh, my dear Viscount, do talk reason. I do not desire to do otherwise. Now just tell me, who the devil should know in France that the officer Fernand and the Count of Morcerf are one and the same person? And who cares now about Janina, which was taken as long ago as the year 1822 or 1823? That just shows the meanness of this slander. They have allowed all this time to elapse, and then all of a sudden rake up events which have been forgotten to furnish materials for scandal, in order to tarnish the luster of our high position. I inherit my father's name, and I do not choose that the shadow of disgrace should darken it. I am going to Beauchamp, in whose journal this paragraph appears, 
and I shall insist on his retracting the assertion before two witnesses. Beauchamp will never retract. Then he must fight. No, he will not, for he will tell you what is very true, that perhaps there were fifty officers in the Greek army bearing the same name. We will fight nevertheless. I will efface that blot on my father's character. My father, who was such a brave soldier, whose career was so brilliant. Oh, well, he will add, we are warranted in believing that this Fernand is not the illustrious Count of Morcerf, who also bears the same Christian name. I am determined not to be content with anything short of an entire retraction. And you intend to make him do it in the presence of two witnesses, do you? Yes. You do wrong. Which means, I suppose, that you refuse the service which I ask of you. You know my theory regarding duels. I told you my opinion on that subject, if you remember when we were at Rome. Nevertheless, my dear Count, I found you this morning engaged in an occupation but little consistent with the notions you profess to entertain. Because, my dear fellow, you understand one must never be eccentric. If one's lot is cast among fools, it is necessary to study folly. I shall perhaps find myself one day called out by some hare-brained scamp who has no more real cause of quarrel with me than you have with Beauchamp. He may take me to task for some foolish trifle or other. He will bring his witnesses, or will insult me in some public place, and I am expected to kill him for all that. You admit that you would fight, then? Well, if so, why do you object to my doing so? I do not say that you ought not to fight. I only say that a duel is a serious thing, and ought not to be undertaken without due reflection. Did he reflect before he insulted my father? If he spoke hastily, and owns that he did so, you ought to be satisfied. Ah, my dear Count, you are far too indulgent. And you are far too exacting. Supposing, for instance, and do not be angry at what I am going to say. Well? Supposing the assertion to be really true. A son ought not to submit to such a stain on his father's honour. Ma foi, we live in times when there is much to which we must submit. That is precisely the fault of the age. And do you undertake to reform it? Yes, as far as I am personally concerned. Well, you are indeed exacting, my dear fellow. Yes, I own it. Are you quite impervious to good advice? Not when it comes from a friend. And do you account me that title? Certainly I do. Well, then, before you going to Beauchamp with your witnesses, seek further information on the subject. From whom? From Haiti. Why, what can be the use of mixing a woman up in the affair? What can she do in it? She can declare to you, for example, that your father had no hand whatever in the defeat and death of the vizier, or if by chance he had indeed the misfortune to— I have told you, my dear Count, that I would not for one moment admit of such a proposition. You reject this means of information, then? I do, most decidedly. Then let me offer one more word of advice. Do so, then, but let it be the last. You do not wish to hear it, perhaps. On the contrary, I request it. Do not take any witnesses with you when you go to Beauchamp. Visit him alone. That would be contrary to old custom. Your case is not an ordinary one. And what is your reason for advising me to go alone? Because then the affair will rest between you and Beauchamp. Explain yourself. I will do so. If Beauchamp be disposed to retract, you ought at least to give him the opportunity of doing it of his own free will. The satisfaction to you will be the same. If, on the contrary, he refuses to do so, it will then be quite time enough to admit two strangers into your secret. 
They will not be strangers. They will be friends. Ah, but the friends of today are the enemies of tomorrow. Beauchamp, for instance. So you recommend her? I recommend you to be prudent. Then you advise me to go alone to Beauchamp? I do, and I will tell you why. When you wish to obtain some concession from a man's self-love, you must avoid even the appearance of wishing to wound it. I believe you are right. I am glad of it. Then I will go alone. Go. But you would do better still by not going at all. That is impossible. Do so, then. It will be a wiser plan than the first which you proposed. But if, in spite of all my precautions, I am at last obliged to fight, will you not be my second? My dear Viscount, said Monte Cristo gravely, you must have seen before today that at all times and in all places I have been at your disposal. But the service which you have just demanded of me is one which is out of my power to render you. Why? Perhaps you may know at some future period, and in the meantime I request you to excuse my declining to put you in possession of my reasons. Well, I will have France and Chateau Renaud. They will be the very men for it. Do so, then. But if I do fight, you will surely not object to giving me a lesson or two in shooting and fencing. That, too, is impossible. What a singular being you are! You will not interfere in anything. You are right. That is the principle on which I wish to act. We will say no more about it, then. Good-bye, Count. Morcerf took his hat and left the room. He found his carriage at the door, and doing his utmost to restrain his anger, he went at once to find Beauchamp, who was in his office. It was a gloomy, dusty-looking apartment, such as journalists' offices have always been from time immemorial. The servant announced Monsieur Albert de Morcerf. Beauchamp repeated the name to himself, as though he could scarcely believe that he had heard aright, and then gave orders for him to be admitted. Albert entered. Beauchamp uttered an exclamation of surprise on seeing his friend leap over and trample underfoot all the newspapers which were strewed about the room. "'This way, this way, my dear Adair, said he, holding out his hand to the young man. "'Are you out of your senses? Or do you come peaceably to take breakfast with me?' "'Try and find a seat. There is one by that geranium, which is the only thing in the room to remind me that there are other leaves in the world besides leaves of paper.' "'Beauchamp,' said Albert, "'it is of your journal that I come to speak.' "'Indeed. What do you wish to say about it?' "'I desire that a statement contained in it should be rectified.' "'To what do you refer? But pray sit down.' "'Thank you.' said Albert, with a cold and formal bow. "'Will you now have the kindness to explain the nature of the statement which has displeased you?' "'An announcement has been made, which implicates the honour of a member of my family.' "'What is it?' said Beauchamp, much surprised. "'Surely you must be mistaken.' "'The story sent you from Yanina.' "'Yanina?' "'Yes.' Really, you appear to be totally ignorant of the cause which brings me here. Such is really the case, I assure you. Upon my honour. Baptiste, give me yesterday's paper, cried Beauchamp. Here, I have brought mine with me, replied Albert. Beauchamp took the paper and read the article to which Albert pointed in an undertone. You see, it is a serious annoyance, said Morcerf, when Beauchamp had finished the perusal of the paragraph. "'Is the officer referred to a relation of yours, then?' demanded the journalist. "'Yes,' said Albert, blushing. "'Well, what do you wish me to do for you?' said Beauchamp mildly. "'My dear Beauchamp, I wish you to contradict this statement.' Beauchamp looked at Albert with a benevolent expression. "'Come,' said he, "'this matter will want a good deal of talking over. "'A retraction is always a serious thing, you know.' "'Sit down, and I will read it again.' 
Albert resumed his seat, and Beauchamp read with more attention than at first the lines denounced by his friend. "'Well,' said Albert, in a determined tone, "'you see that your paper has insulted a member of my family, and I insist on a retraction being made.' "'You insist?' "'Yes, I insist.' "'Permit me to remind you that you are not in the chamber, my dear Vicomte. "'Nor do I wish to be there,' replied the young man, rising. "'I repeat that I am determined to have the announcement of yesterday contradicted. "'You have known me long enough,' continued Albert, biting his lips convulsively, "'for he saw that Beauchamp's anger was beginning to rise. "'You have been my friend.' and therefore sufficiently intimate with me to be aware that I am likely to maintain my resolution on this point. I have been your friend, Morcerf. Your present manner of speaking would almost lead me to forget that I ever bore that title. But wait a moment. Do not let us get angry, or at least not yet. You are irritated and vexed. Tell me how this Fernand is related to you. He is merely my father, said Albert. Monsieur Fernand Mondego, Count of Morcerf, an old soldier who has fought in twenty battles, and whose honourable scars they would denounce as badges of disgrace. Is it your father? said Beauchamp. That is quite another thing. Then I can well understand your indignation, my dear Albert. I will look at it again. And he read the paragraph for the third time, laying a stress on each word as he proceeded. "'But the paper nowhere identifies this Fernand with your father.' "'No, but the connection will be seen by others, "'and therefore I will have the article contradicted.' "'At the words, I will, "'Beauchamp steadily raised his eyes to Albert's countenance, "'and then, as gradually lowering them, "'he remained thoughtful for a few moments. "'You will retract this assertion, will you not, Beauchamp?' "'said Albert, with increased, though stifled anger.' "'Yes,' replied Beauchamp. "'Immediately,' said Albert. "'When I am convinced that the statement is false.' "'What?' "'The thing is worth looking into, "'and I would take pains to investigate the matter thoroughly.' "'But what is there to investigate, sir?' said Albert, "'enraged beyond measure at Beauchamp's last remark. "'If you do not believe that it is my father, say so immediately.' and if on the contrary you believe it to be him, state your reasons for doing so. Beauchamp looked at Albert with the smile which was so peculiar to him, and which in its numerous modifications served to express every varied emotion of his mind. Sir, replied he, if you came to me with the idea of demanding satisfaction, you should have gone at once to the point, and not have entertained me with the idle conversation to which I have been patiently listening for the last half-hour. Am I to put this construction on your visit? Yes, if you will not consent to retract that infamous calumny. Wait a moment. No threats, if you please, Monsieur Fernand Mondego, Vicomte de Morcerf. I never allow them from my enemies, and therefore shall not put up with them from my friends. You insist on my contradicting the article relating to General Fernand, an article with which, I assure you, on my word of honour, I had nothing whatever to do. Yes, I insist on it, said Albert, whose mind was beginning to get bewildered with the excitement of his feelings. And if I refuse to retract, you wish to fight, do you? said Beauchamp, in a calm tone. Yes, replied Albert, raising his voice. Well said Beauchamp. Here is my answer, my dear sir. The article was not inserted by me. I was not even aware of it. But you have, by the step you have taken, called my attention to the paragraph in question, and it will remain until it shall be either contradicted or confirmed by someone who has a right to do so. Sir, said Albert, rising, I will do myself the honour of sending my seconds to you, and you will be kind enough to arrange with them the place of meeting and the weapons. Certainly, my dear sir. And this evening, if you please, or to-morrow at the latest we will meet. No, no, I will be on the ground at the proper time. But in my opinion, 
and I have a right to dictate the preliminaries, as it is I who have received the provocation. In my opinion, the time ought not to be yet. I know you to be well skilled in the management of the sword, while I am only moderately so. I know, too, that you are a good marksman. There we are about equal. I know that a duel between us two would be a serious affair, because you are brave and I am brave also. I do not, therefore, wish either to kill you or to be killed myself without a cause. Now I am going to put a question to you, and one very much to the purpose, too. Do you insist on this retraction so far as to kill me if I do not make it, although I have repeated more than once, and affirmed on my honour, that I was ignorant of the thing with which you charge me, and although I still declare that it is impossible for any one but you to recognise the Count of Morcerf under the name of Fernand? I maintain my original resolution. Very well, my dear sir. Then I consent to cut throats with you. But I require three weeks' preparation. At the end of that time I shall come and say to you, The assertion is false, and I retract it. Or the assertion is true, when I shall immediately draw the sword from its sheath, or the pistols from the case, whichever you please. Three weeks? cried Albert. They will pass as slowly as three centuries, when I am all the time suffering dishonour. Had you continued to remain on amicable terms with me, I should have said, Patience, my friend. But you have constituted yourself my enemy. Therefore I say, What does that signify to me, sir? Well, let it be three weeks then, said Morcerf. But remember, at the expiration of that time, no delay or subterfuge will justify you in... Monsieur Albert de Morcerf said Beauchamp, rising in his turn. I cannot throw you out of window for three weeks, that is to say, for twenty-four days to come, nor have you any right to split my skull open till that time has elapsed. Today is the twenty-ninth of August. The twenty-first of September will, therefore, be the conclusion of the term agreed on. Until that time arrives, and it is the advice of a gentleman which I am about to give you, Till then we will refrain from growling and barking like two dogs chained within sight of each other. When he had concluded his speech, Beauchamp bowed coldly to Albert, turned his back upon him, and went to the press-room. Albert vented his anger on a pile of newspapers, which he sent flying all over the office by switching them violently with his stick, after which ebullition he departed not, however, without walking several times to the door of the press-room, as if he had half a mind to enter. While Albert was lashing the front of his carriage in the same manner that he had the newspapers which were the innocent agents of his discomfiture, as he was crossing the barrier he perceived Morel, who was walking with a quick step and a bright eye. He was passing the Chinese baths, and appeared to have come from the direction of the Porte Saint-Martin and to be going towards the Madeleine. "'Ah!' said Morcerf. "'There goes a happy man.' And it so happened Albert was not mistaken in his opinion. End of chapter 78 Chapter 79 The Lemonade Morel was, in fact, very happy. Miss Noirtier had just sent for him, and he was in such haste to know the reason of his doing so, that he had not stopped to take a cab, placing infinitely more dependence on his own two legs than on the four legs of a cab-horse. He had therefore set off at a furious rate from the Rue Melee, and was hastening with rapid strides in the direction of the Faubourg Saint-Honoré. Morel advanced with a firm, manly tread, and poor Barrois followed him as he best might. Morel was only thirty-one. Barrois was sixty years of age. Morel was deeply in love, and Barrois was dying with heat and exertion. These two men, thus opposed in age and interests, resemble two parts of a triangle, presenting the extremes of separation, yet nevertheless possessing their point of union. This point of union was Noirtier, and it was he who had just sent for Morel, with the request that the latter would lose no time in coming to him. 
a command which Morel obeyed to the letter, to the great discomfiture of Barrois. On arriving at the house, Morel was not even out of breath, for love lends wings to our desires, but Barrois, who had long forgotten what it was to love, was sorely fatigued by the expedition he had been constrained to use. The old servant introduced Morel by a private entrance, closed the door of the study, and soon the rustling of a dress announced the arrival of Valentine. She looked marvellously beautiful in her deep mourning dress, and Morel experienced such intense delight in gazing upon her that he felt as if he could almost have dispensed with the conversation of her grandfather. But the easy chair of the old man was heard rolling along the floor, and he soon made his appearance in the room. Noirtier acknowledged by a look of extreme kindness and benevolence the thanks which Morel lavished on him for his timely intervention on behalf of Valentine and himself, an intervention which had saved them from despair. Morel then cast on the invalid an interrogative look as to new favour which he designed to bestow on him. Valentine was sitting at a little distance from them, timidly awaiting the moment when she should be obliged to speak. Noirtier fixed his eyes on her. "'Am I to say what you told me?' asked Valentine. Noirtier made a sign that she was to do so. "'Monsieur Morel,' said Valentine to the young man, who was regarding her with the most intense interest. "'My grandfather, Monsieur Noirtier, had a thousand things to say, which he told me three days ago, and now he has sent for you, that I may repeat them to you. I will repeat them, then, and since he has chosen me as his interpreter, I will be faithful to the trust, and will not alter a word of his intentions. "'Oh, I am listening with the greatest impatience,' replied the young man. "'Speak, I beg of you.' Valentine cast down her eyes. This was a good omen for Morel, for he knew that nothing but happiness could have the power of thus overcoming Valentine. "'My grandfather intends leaving this house,' said she, "'and Barrois is looking out suitable apartments for him in another.' "'But you, Mademoiselle de Villefort, you who are necessary to Monsieur Noirtier's happiness—' "'I?' interrupted Valentine. "'I shall not leave my grandfather. That is an understood thing between us. My apartments will be close to his.' Now, M. de Villefort must either give his consent to this plan, or his refusal. In the first case, I shall leave directly, and in the second, I shall wait till I am of age, which will be in about ten months. Then I shall be free. I shall have an independent fortune, and—' "'And what?' demanded Morel. "'And with my grandfather's consent, I shall fulfil the promise which I have made you.' Valentine pronounced these last few words in such a low tone that nothing but Morel's intense interest in what she was saying could have enabled him to hear them. "'Have I not explained your wishes, Grandpapa?' said Valentine, addressing Noitier. "'Yes,' looked the old man. "'Once under my grandfather's roof, Monsieur Morel can visit me in the presence of my good and worthy protector.' if we still feel that the union we contemplated will be likely to ensure our future comfort and happiness in that case i shall expect m morel to come and claim me at my own hands but alas i have heard it said that hearts inflamed by obstacles to their desire grew cold in time of security i trust we shall never find it so in our experience Oh cried Morel, almost tempted to throw himself on his knees before Noirtier and Valentine, and to adore them as two superior beings. What have I ever done in my life to merit such unbounded happiness? Until that time, continued the young girl in a calm and self-possessed tone of voice, we will conform to circumstance, and be guided by the wishes of our friends, so long as those wishes do not tend finally to separate us. In a word, and I repeat it because it expresses all I wish to convey, we will wait. And I swear to make all the sacrifices which this word imposes, sir, said Morel, not only with resignation, but with cheerfulness. Therefore, 
continued Valentine, looking playfully at Maximilien. No more inconsiderate actions, no more rash projects, for you surely would not wish to compromise one who from this day regards herself as destined honourably and happily to bear your name. Morel looked obedience to her commands. Noirtier regarded the lovers with a look of ineffable tenderness, while Barrois, who had remained in the room in the character of a man privileged to know everything that passed, smiled on the youthful couple, as he wiped the perspiration from his bald forehead. "'How hot you look, my good Barrois,' said Valentine. "'Ah, oh, I have been running very fast, mademoiselle. But I must do Monsieur Morel the justice to say that he ran still faster.' Noirtier directed their attention to a waiter, on which was placed a decanter containing lemonade and a glass. The decanter was nearly full, with the exception of a little which had been already drunk by Monsieur Noirtier. "'Come, Barois," said the young girl, "'take some of this lemonade. I see you are coveting a good draught of it.' "'The fact is, mademoiselle,' said Barois, "'I am dying with thirst, and since you are so kind as to offer it to me, I cannot say I should at all object to drinking your health in a glass of it.' "'Take some, then, and come back immediately.' Barrois took away the waiter, and hardly was he outside the door, which in his haste he forgot to shut, than they saw him throw back his head and empty to the very dregs the glass which Valentine had filled. Valentine and Morel were exchanging their adieu in the presence of Noirtier when a ring was heard at the doorbell. It was the signal of a visit. Valentine looked at her watch. "'It is past noon,' said she, "'and to-day is Saturday. "'I dare say it is the doctor, Grandpapa.' Noirtier looked his conviction that she was right in her supposition. "'You will come in here, and Monsieur Morel had better go. "'Do you not think so, Grandpapa?' "'Yes,' signed the old man. "'Barois!' cried Valentine. "'Barois!' "'I am coming, mademoiselle,' replied he. "'Barois will open the door for you,' said Valentine, addressing Morel. "'And now remember one thing, monsieur, officer, "'that my grandfather commands you not to take any rash or ill-advised step "'which would be likely to compromise our happiness.' "'I promised him to wait,' replied Morel. "'And I will wait.' "'At this moment Barois entered. "'Who rang?' asked Valentine. "'Dr. D'Avrigny,' said Barois, staggering as if he would fall. "'What is the matter, Barois?' said Valentine. The old man did not answer, but looked at his master with wild, staring eyes, while with his cramped hand he grasped a piece of furniture to enable him to stand upright. "'He is going to fall,' cried Morel. The rigours which had attacked Barois gradually increased. The features of the face became quite altered, and the convulsive movement of the muscles appeared to indicate the approach of a most serious nervous disorder. Noirtier, seeing Barrois in this pitiable condition, showed by his looks all the various emotions of sorrow and sympathy which can animate the heart of a man. Barrois made some steps towards his master. "'Ah, sir,' said he, "'tell me, what is the matter with me? I am suffering. I cannot see.' A thousand fiery darts are piercing my brain. Oh, don't touch me. Pray don't. By this time his haggard eyes had the appearance of being ready to start from their sockets. His head fell back, and the lower extremities of the body began to stiffen. Valentine uttered a cry of horror. Morel took her in his arms as if to defend her from some unknown danger. Monsieur Daverny, Monsieur Daverny, cried she in a stifled voice. Help! Help! Barrois turned round and with a great effort stumbled a few steps, then fell at the feet of Noirtier, and resting his hand on the knee of the invalid, exclaimed, My master! My good master! At this moment, Monsieur de Villefort, attracted by the noise, appeared on the threshold. Morel relaxed his hold of Valentine, and retreating to a distant corner of the room, remained half hidden behind a curtain. 
pale as if he had been gazing on a serpent, he fixed his terrified eyes on the agonized sufferer. Noirtier, burning with impatience and terror, was in despair at his utter inability to help his old domestic, whom he regarded more in the light of a friend than a servant. One might be the fearful swelling of the veins of his forehead, and the contraction of the muscles around the eye traced the terrible conflict which was going on between the living, energetic mind and the inanimate and helpless body. Barois, his features convulsed, his eyes suffused with blood, and his head thrown back, was lying at full length, beating the floor with his hands, while his legs had become so stiff that they looked as if they would break rather than bend. A slight appearance of foam was visible around the mouth, and he breathed painfully and with extreme difficulty. Villefort seemed stupefied with astonishment, and remained gazing intently on the scene before him without uttering a word. He had not seen Morel. After a moment of dumb contemplation, during which his face became pale and his hair seemed to stand on end, he sprang toward the door, crying out, "'Doctor! Doctor! Come instantly! Pray come!' "'Madame! Madame!' cried Valentine, calling her stepmother, and running upstairs to meet her. "'Come, quick, quick, and bring your bottle of smelling salts with you.' "'What is the matter?' said Madame de Villefort, in a harsh and constrained tone. "'Oh, come, come!' "'But where is the doctor?' exclaimed Villefort. "'Where is he?' Madame de Villefort now deliberately descended the staircase. In one hand she held her handkerchief, with which she appeared to be wiping her face, and in the other a bottle of English smelling salts. Her first look on entering the room was at Noirtier, whose face, independent of the emotion which such a scene could not fail of producing, proclaimed him to be in possession of his usual health. Her second glance was at the dying man. She turned pale, and her eye passed quickly from the servant and rested on the master. "'In the name of heaven, madame,' said Villefort, "'where is the doctor? He was with you just now. You see this a fit of apoplexy, and he might be saved if he could be but bled.' "'Has he eaten anything lately?' asked madame de Villefort, eluding her husband's question. "'Madame,' replied Valentine, "'he has not even breakfasted. He has been running very fast on an errand with which my grandfather charged him, and when he returned took nothing but a glass of lemonade.' "'Ah!' said Madame de Villefort. "'Why did he not take wine? Lemonade was a very bad thing for him.' "'Grandpapa's bottle of lemonade was standing just by his side. Poor Barois was very thirsty, and was thankful to drink anything he could find.' Madame de Villefort started. Noirtier looked at her with a glance of the most profound scrutiny. "'He was such a short neck,' said she. "'Madame,' said Villefort, "'I ask where is Monsieur d'Avigny? In God's name, answer me!' "'He is with Edward, who is not quite well,' replied Madame de Villefort, no longer being able to avoid answering. Villefort rushed upstairs to fetch him. "'Take this,' said Madame de Villefort, giving her smelling bottle to Valentine. "'They will no doubt bleed him. Therefore I will retire, for I cannot endure the sight of blood.' And she followed her husband upstairs. Morel now emerged from his hiding-place, where he had remained quite unperceived, so great had been the general confusion. "'Go away as quick as you can, Maximilian.' said Valentine, and stay till I send for you. Go. Morel looked towards Noirtier for permission to retire. The old man, who had preserved all his usual coolness, made a sign to him to do so. The young man pressed Valentine's hand to his lips, then left the house by a back staircase. At the same moment that he quitted the room, Villefort and the doctor entered by an opposite door. Barois, was now showing signs of returning consciousness. The crisis seemed past. A low moaning was heard, and he raised himself on one knee. D'Avrigny and Villefort laid him on a couch. "'What do you prescribe, doctor?' demanded Villefort. 
"'Give me some water and ether. "'You have some in the house, have you not?' "'Yes.' "'Send for some oil of turpentine and tartar emetic.' Vifor immediately dispatched a messenger. "'And now let every one retire.' "'Must I go too?' asked Valentine timidly. "'Yes, mademoiselle. "'You especially.' replied the doctor abruptly. Valentine looked at Monsieur d'Avrigny with astonishment, kissed her grandfather on the forehead, and left the room. The doctor closed the door after her with a gloomy air. "'Look, look, doctor,' said Villefort. "'He is quite coming round again. I really do not think, after all, it is anything of consequence.' Monsieur d'Avrigny answered by a melancholy smile. "'How do you feel, Barois?' asked he. "'A little better, sir.' "'Will you drink some of this ether and water?' "'I will try, but don't touch me.' "'Why not?' "'Because I feel that if you were only to touch me with the tip of your finger, the fit would return.' "'Drink.' Barois took the glass, and raising it to his purple lips, took about half of the liquid offered him. "'Where do you suffer?' asked the doctor. "'Everywhere.' I feel cramps over my whole body. Do you find any dazzling sensation before the eyes? Yes. Any noise in the ears? Frightful. When did you first feel that? Just now. Suddenly? Yes, like a clap of thunder. Did you feel nothing of it yesterday or the day before? Nothing. No drowsiness? None. What have you eaten today? I have eaten nothing. I only drank a glass of my master's lemonade, that's all. And Barois turned towards Nortier, who, immovably fixed in his armchair, was contemplating this terrible scene without allowing a word or a movement to escape him. Where is this lemonade? asked the doctor eagerly. Downstairs, in the decanter. Whereabouts downstairs? "'In the kitchen.' "'Shall I go and fetch it, doctor?' inquired Villefort. "'No. Stay here and try to make Barois drink the rest of this glass of ether and water. I will go myself and fetch the lemonade.' D'Avrigny bounded towards the door, flew down the back staircase, and almost knocked down Madame de Villefort in his haste, who was herself going down to the kitchen. She cried out, but d'Avrigny paid no attention to her. Possessed with but one idea, he cleared the last four steps with a bound, and rushed into the kitchen, where he saw the decanter about three parts empty still standing on the waiter, where it had been left. He darted upon it as an eagle would seize upon its prey, panting with loss of breath. He returned to the room he had just left. Madame de Villefort was slowly ascending the steps which led to her room. "'Is this the decanter you spoke of?' asked d'Avrigny. "'Yes, doctor.' "'Is this the same lemonade of which you partook?' "'I believe so.' "'What did it taste like?' "'It had a bitter taste.' The doctor poured some drops of the lemonade into the palm of his hand, put his lips to it, and after having rinsed his mouth as a man does when he is tasting wine, he spat the liquor into the fireplace. "'It is no doubt the same,' said he. "'Did you drink some too, Monsieur Noirtier?' "'Yes.' "'And did you also discover a bitter taste?' "'Yes.' "'Oh, doctor,' cried Barois, "'the fit is coming on again. "'Oh, do something for me!' The doctor flew to his patient. "'That emetic, Villefort, see if it is coming.' Villefort sprang into the passage, exclaiming, "'The emetic! The emetic! Is it come yet?' No one answered. The most profound terror reigned throughout the house. "'If I had anything by means of which I could inflate the lungs,' said d'Avrigny, looking around him, "'perhaps I might prevent suffocation. But there is nothing which would do, nothing.' "'Oh, sir!' cried Barois. "'Are you going to let me die without help? "'Oh, I am dying! "'Oh, save me!' "'A pen, a pen,' said the doctor. "'There was one lying on the table. "'He endeavoured to introduce it into the mouth of the patient, 
who in the midst of his convulsions was making vain attempts to vomit, but the jaws were so clinched that the pen could not pass them. This second attack was much more violent than the first, and he had slipped from the couch to the ground where he was writhing in agony. The doctor left him in his paroxysm, knowing that he could do nothing to alleviate it, and going up to Noirtier, said abruptly, "'How do you find yourself? Well?' "'Yes. Have you any weight on the chest, or does your stomach feel light and comfortable? Eh? "'Yes.' "'Then you feel pretty much as you generally do, after you have had the dose which I am accustomed to give you every Sunday?' "'Yes. Did Barois make your lemonade?' "'Yes.' "'Was it you who asked him to drink some of it?' "'No.' "'Was it Monsieur de Villefort?' "'No.' "'Madame?' "'No.' "'It was your granddaughter, then, was it not?' "'Yes.' A groan from Barois, accompanied by a yawn which seemed to crack the very jawbones, attracted the attention of Monsieur d'Avrigny. He left Monsieur Noirtier and returned to the sick man. "'Barois,' said the doctor, can you speak? Barois muttered a few unintelligible words. Try and make an effort to do so, my good man, said d'Avrigny. Barois reopened his bloodshot eyes. Who made the lemonade? I did. Did you bring it to your master directly? It was made. No. You left it somewhere, then, in the meantime? Yes, I left it in the pantry, because... I was called away. Who brought it into the room, then? Mademoiselle Valentine. D'Avrigny struck his forehead with his hand. Gracious heaven! exclaimed he. Doctor! Doctor! cried Barois, who felt another fit coming. Will they never bring that emetic? asked the doctor. Here is a glass with one already prepared, said Villefort, entering the room. Who prepared it? "'The chemist who came here with me.' "'Drink it,' said the doctor to Barois. "'Impossible, doctor. It is too late. My throat is closing up. I am choking. Oh, my heart! Oh, my head! Oh, what agony! Shall I suffer like this long?' "'No, no, friend,' replied the doctor. "'You will soon cease to suffer.' "'Oh!' "'I understand you,' said the unhappy man. "'My God, have mercy upon me!' And uttering a fearful cry, Barois fell back as if he had been struck by lightning. D'Avrigny put his hand to his heart and placed a glass before his lips. "'Well?' said Villefort. "'Go to the kitchen and get me some syrup of violets.' Villefort went immediately. "'Do not be alarmed, Monsieur Noirtier.' said d'Avrigny. I am going to take my patient into the next room to bleed him. This sort of attack is very frightful to witness. And taking Barois under the arms, he dragged him into an adjoining room, but almost immediately he returned to fetch the lemonade. Noirtier closed his right eye. You want Valentine, do you not? I will tell them to send her to you. Villefort returned, and d'Avrigny met him in the passage. "'Well, how is he now?' asked he. "'Come in here,' said d'Avrigny, and he took him into the chamber where the sick man lay. "'Is he still in a fit?' said the procureur. "'He is dead.' Villefort drew back a few steps, and, clasping his hands, exclaimed with real amazement and sympathy, "'Dead? And so soon, too?' "'Yes, it is very soon.' said the doctor, looking at the corpse before him. But that ought not to astonish you. Monsieur and Madame de saint Méran died as soon. People die very suddenly in your house, Monsieur de Villefort. What? cried the magistrate with an accent of horror and consternation. Are you still harping on this terrible idea? Still, sir, and I shall always do so, replied d'Avrigny for it has never for one instant ceased to retain possession of my mind, and that you may be quite sure I am not mistaken this time. Listen well to what I am going to say, Monsieur de Villefort. The magistrate trembled convulsively. 
there is a poison which destroys life almost without leaving any perceptible traces. I know it well. I have studied it in all its forms and in the effects which it produces. I recognize the presence of this poison in the case of Paul Barrois as well as in that of Madame de saint Méran. There is a way of detecting its presence. It restores the blue color of litmus paper reddened by an acid, and it turns syrup of violets green. We have no litmus paper, but see, here, they come with the syrup of violets. The doctor was right. Steps were heard in the passage. Monsieur d'Avrigny opened the door, and took from the hands of the chambermaid a cup which contained two or three spoonfuls of the syrup. He then carefully closed the door. Look, said he to the procureur, whose heart beat so loudly that it might almost be heard. Here is in this cup some syrup of violets, and this decanter contains the remainder of the lemonade of which Monsieur Noitier and Barrois partook. If the lemonade be pure and inoffensive, the syrup will retain its color. If, on the contrary, the lemonade be drugged with the poison, the syrup will become green. Look closely. The doctor then slowly poured some drops of the lemonade from the decanter into the cup, and in an instant a light cloudy sediment began to form at the bottom of the cup. This sediment first took a blue shade, then from the color of sapphire it passed to that of opal, and from opal to emerald. Arrived at this last hue, it changed no more. The result of the experiment left no doubt whatever on the mind. "'The unfortunate Barrois has been poisoned,' said d'Avrigny, "'and I will maintain this assertion before God and man.' Villefort said nothing, but he clasped his hands, opened his haggard eyes, and, overcome with his emotion, sank into a chair." End of chapter 79 Chapter 80 The Accusation Monsieur d'Avrigny soon restored the magistrate to consciousness, who had looked like a second corpse in that chamber of death. "'Oh, death is in my house!' cried Villefort. "'Say, rather, crime,' replied the doctor. "'Monsieur d'Avrigny,' cried Villefort, I cannot tell you all I feel at this moment. Terror, grief, madness. Yes, said Monsieur d'Avrigny with an imposing calmness. But I think it is now time to act. I think it is time to stop this torrent of mortality. I can no longer bear to be in possession of these secrets without the hope of seeing the victims and society generally revenged. Villefort cast a gloomy look around him. In my house! murmured he, in my house. Come, magistrate, said Monsieur d'Avrigny, show yourself a man. As an interpreter of the law, do honour to your profession by sacrificing your selfish interest to it. You make me shudder, doctor. Do you talk of a sacrifice? I do. Do you then suspect any one? I suspect no one. Death raps at your door, it enters, it goes, not blindfolded, but circumspectly from room to room. Well, I follow its course, I track its passage, I adopt the wisdom of the ancients, and feel my way for my friendship for your family, and my respect for you as a twofold bandage over my eyes. Well, oh, speak, speak, doctor, I shall have courage. Well, sir, you have in your establishment or in your family, perhaps one of the frightful monstrosities of which each century produces only one. Locusta and Agrippina, living at the same time, were an exception, and proved the determination of Providence to effect the entire ruin of the Roman Empire, sullied by so many crimes. Brunhilde and Fredegonde were the results of the painful struggle of civilization in its infancy when man was learning to control mind, were it even by an emissary from the realms of darkness. All these women have been, or were, beautiful. The same flower of innocence had flourished, or was still flourishing on their brow. 
that is seen on the brow of the culprit in your house. Villefort shrieked, clasped his hands, and looked at the doctor with a supplicating air. But the latter went on without pity. Seek whom the crime will profit, says an axiom of jurisprudence. Doctor, cried Villefort, alas, doctor, how often has man's justice been deceived by those fatal words? I know not why, but I feel that this crime— You acknowledge, then, the existence of the crime? Yes, I see too plainly that it does exist, but it seems that it is intended to affect me personally. I fear an attack myself, after all these disasters. Oh, man, murmured Davrigny, the most selfish of all animals— the most personal of all creatures, who believes the earth turns, the sun shines, and death strikes for him alone. An ant cursing God from the top of a blade of grass, and have those who have lost their lives lost nothing? Monsieur de saint Méran, Madame de saint Méran, Monsieur Noirtier? How? Monsieur Noirtier? Yes. Think you it was the poor servant's life was coveted? No, no, like Shakespeare's Polonius, he died for another. It was Noirtier the lemonade was intended for. It is Noirtier, logically speaking, who drank it. The other drank it only by accident. And although Barrois is dead, it was Noirtier whose death was wished for. But why did it not kill my father? I told you one evening in the garden after Madame de saint Méran's death— because his system is accustomed to that very poison, and the dose was trifling to him, which would be fatal to another, because no one knows, not even the assassin, that for the last twelve months I have given Monsieur Noirtier Broussine for his paralytic affection, while the assassin is not ignorant, for he has proved that Broussine is a violent poison. Oh, have pity, have pity! murmured Villefort, wringing his hands. "'Follow the culprit's steps. He first kills Monsieur de saint Méran. "'Oh, doctor! I would swear to it. What I heard of his symptoms agrees too well with what I have seen in the other cases.' Villefort ceased to contend. He only groaned. "'He first kills Monsieur de saint Méran, repeated the doctor. "'Then Madame de saint Méran, a double fortune to inherit.' Villefort wiped the perspiration from his forehead. "'Listen attentively.' Uh, "'Alas!' stammered Villefort. I, "'I do not lose a single word.' "'Monsieur Noirtier,' resumed Monsieur d'Avrigny in the same pitiless tone, "'Monsieur Noirtier had once made a will against you, against your family, in favour of the poor, in fact. Monsieur Noirtier is spared because nothing is expected from him.' But he has no sooner destroyed his first will and made a second, than, for fear he should make a third, he is struck down. The will was made the day before yesterday, I believe. You see, there has been no time lost. Oh, merci, Monsieur d'Avrigny. No mercy, sir. The physician has a sacred mission on earth, and to fulfil it he begins at the source of life and goes down to the mysterious darkness of the tomb. When crime has been committed, and God, doubtless in anger, turns away his face, it is for the physician to bring the culprit to justice. "'Have mercy on my child, sir,' murmured Villefort. "'You see it is yourself who have first named her. You, her father.' "'Have pity on Valentine. Listen, it is impossible. I would as willingly accuse myself.' Valentine, whose heart is pure as a diamond or a lily. No pity, procureur. The crime is fragrant. Mademoiselle herself packed all the medicines which were sent to Monsieur de saint Méran, and Monsieur de saint Méran is dead. Mademoiselle de Villefort prepared all the cooling draughts which Madame de saint Méran took, and Madame de saint Méran is dead. Mademoiselle de Villefort took from the hands of Barrois who was sent out, the lemonade which Monsieur Noirtier had every morning, and he has escaped by a miracle. Mademoiselle de Villefort is the culprit. She is the poisoner. 
to you as the king's attorney, I denounce Mademoiselle de Villefort. Do your duty. Doctor, I resist no longer. I can no longer defend myself. I believe you, but for pity's sake, spare my life, my honor. Monsieur de Villefort, replied the doctor with increased vehemence, there are occasions when I dispense with all foolish human circumspection. If your daughter had committed only one crime, and I saw her meditating another, I would say, warn her, punish her, let her pass the remainder of her life in a convent, weeping and praying. If she had committed two crimes, I would say, here, Monsieur de Villefort, is a poison that the prisoner is not acquainted with, one that has no known antidote. Quick as thought, rapid as lightning, mortal as the thunderbolt, give her that poison, recommending her soul to God, and save your honour and your life, for it is yours she aims at. And I can picture her approaching your pillow, with her hypocritical smiles and her sweet exhortations. Woe to you, Monsieur de Villefort, if you do not strike first. That is what I would say, had she only killed two persons. But she has seen three deaths has contemplated three murdered persons, has knelt by three corpses. To the scaffold with the poisoner, to the scaffold. Do you talk of your honour? Do what I tell you, and immortality awaits you. Villefort fell on his knees. Listen, said he, I have not the strength of mind you have, or rather that which you would not have if instead of my daughter Valentine, your daughter Madeleine were concerned. The doctor turned pale. Doctor, every son of woman is born to suffer and to die. I am content to suffer and to await death. Beware, said M. d'Avrigny. It may come slowly. You will see it approach after having struck your father, your wife, perhaps your son. Villefort, suffocating, pressed the doctor's arm. Listen, cried he, pity me, help me. No, my daughter is not guilty. If you drag us both before a tribunal, I will still say, No, my daughter is not guilty. There is no crime in my house. I will not acknowledge a crime in my house. For when crime enters a dwelling, it is like death. It does not come alone. Listen. What does it signify to you if I am murdered? Are you my friend? Are you a man? Have you a heart? No, you are a physician. Well, I tell you, I will not drag my daughter before a tribunal and give her up to the executioner. Would drive me like a madman to dig my heart out with my fingernails. And if you were mistaken, doctor, if you were not my daughter, if I should come one day, pale as a spectre, and say to you, Assassin! You have killed my child. Hold, if that should happen, although I am a Christian, Monsieur d'Avrigny, I should kill myself. Well, said the doctor, after a moment's silence, I will wait. Villefort looked at him as if he had doubted his words. Only, continued Monsieur d'Avrigny, with a slow and solemn tone, if anyone falls ill in your house, if you feel yourself attacked, do not send for me, for I will come no more. I will consent to share this dreadful secret with you, but I will not allow shame and remorse to grow and increase in my conscience, as crime and misery will in your house. Then you abandon me, doctor? Yes, for I can follow you no farther, and I only stop at the foot of the scaffold. Some further discovery will be made, which will bring this dreadful tragedy to a close. Adieu. I entreat you, doctor. All the horrors that disturb my thoughts make your house odious and fatal. Adieu, sir. One word, one single word more, doctor. You go, leaving me in all the horror of my situation, after increasing it by what you have revealed to me. But what will be reported of the sudden death of the poor old servant? True, said Monsieur d'Avrigny. We will return. The doctor went out first, followed by Monsieur de Villefort. 
The terrified servants were on the stairs and in the passage where the doctor would pass. Sir, said Davrigny to Villefort, so loud that all might hear, poor Barrois has led too sedentary a life of late. Accustomed formerly to ride on horseback or in the carriage to the four corners of Europe, the monotonous walk around that armchair has killed him. His blood has thickened. He was stout, had a short, thick neck. He was attacked with apoplexy, and I was called in too late. By the way, added he in a low tone, take care to throw away that cup of syrup of violets in the ashes. The doctor, without shaking hands with Villefort, without adding a word to what he had said, went out, amid the tears and lamentations of the whole household. The same evening all Villefort's servants, who had assembled in the kitchen and had a long consultation, came to tell Madame de Villefort that they wished to leave. No entreaty, no proposition of increased wages could induce them to remain. To every argument they replied, "'We must go, for death is in this house.' They all left, in spite of prayers and entreaties, testifying their regret at leaving so good a master and mistress, and especially Mademoiselle Valentine, so good, so kind, and so gentle. Villefort looked at Valentine as they said this. She was in tears, and, strange as it was, in spite of the emotions he felt at the sight of these tears, he looked also at Madame de Villefort and it appeared to him as if a slight, gloomy smile had passed over her thin lips, like a meteor seen passing inauspiciously between two clouds in a stormy sky. End of chapter 80